This just happened yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, because it was just so bizarre and unbelievable. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. So last night at maybe 2300, I was walking around my block. My town is relatively safe, so I didn't feel in danger. Plus, it was a pretty night. I had been walking for around five minutes when a pale woman with blonde hair and a white dress caught my eye from across the street. She was about my height and looked to be around my age, too. I didn't actually pay attention to her after I first noticed her. While I circled the block again, she was on the same street, a couple of feet in front of me. She was standing on the curb, staring at the cars passing by. It was a main road, so even that late, people were still driving on it. I said hello to her and she turned her gaze toward me. I couldn't see her face super well, but from what I think I saw, she had no pupils, no color in her eyes. She just stared at me. After a while, I asked if she was okay. She didn't respond and simply pointed at the road. I was really confused and I didn't understand. Right then, a red car started coming down the road. She stepped into the road and the car slammed into her. It was a bloody mess. The driver immediately stopped and jumped out. It was a man in his mid-twenties. We both spoke about it, freaking out. He called the police and I went around the car to see the state of the girl. But once I circled around the car, she was gone. Not as in dead, gone, as in she wasn't there at all. The blood on the road was gone too, but not gone from his car. After the police arrived, they concluded that it was some kind of big hoax. A hoax by some kid who didn't know what they were talking about and some guy who just went along with it. The blood on the truck was brought into investigation, only to be found as paint. Nothing else was put up about it. I'm still not sure if what happened was real. It felt so real, but I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't know what it was. Was it some kind of waking dream? I remember it like it was a real event. I feel like I can't leave the house now. I don't understand anything, and I kind of feel like I'm going crazy. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? So, maybe a week ago, at my friend's suggestion, I asked my spirit guides for guidance. If you believe in that sort of thing, or any of this, great. If not, bear with me. An owl landed on top of the flagpole in my yard that night. I spend a lot of time in my car smoking cigarettes and listening to music, so that's why I was out there. So after that, I subconsciously started directing my prayers to the top of the flagpole. Keep in mind, there's no flag on it. It's just a knob of some sort in an odd shape, like a bird, almost. I don't think this knob is anything in and of itself, but here's the thing. One night, while I was looking at it, I realized that it was shifting. The dark silhouette of the thing looked like it was subtly changing and moving almost the way that a flame behaves, but it's dark because it's just a silhouette at night. I realized that this shifting shadow type energy is something that I've seen before, and that scared me. I was worried because it looks like shadow people, the way their silhouettes shift. But for some reason, I decided to talk to it. Now, I know I might sound crazy at this point, but there's more. I talked to it a lot, and it usually can't really respond, but it did tell me its name is Tether. That's one of the only things I was able to understand. I know, kind of a creepy name, and that seemed like a red flag to me too. But the owl landed there, so I figured it must have been the same thing, 
or they were connected somehow. I've been sharing my problems with Tether and asking him to help me. I made it clear that he's not allowed inside the house, and that in return for being chill with me, I would dedicate tobacco burnings to him. Some Native American tribes used to burn tobacco to spirits for reference, and I'm half Native American. Anyway, everything was fine, but I noticed the other night that the gate was wide open, which was a little creepy. And then tonight, the passenger seat of my car was fully reclined. I told Tether not to move things anymore because it makes me uncomfortable. I've talked to one of my friends about this because she sees things too. She said that shadows aren't always bad. It might just be the only way we can perceive it. She called it a gnome or a fairy. That's why I've been treating it like an acquaintance. But I can't help but wonder if it's something else. I don't want to be alarmist and jump to the worst case scenario. But does anybody know what this might be? I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that, and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock, and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east there were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, Nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl, 
who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced, and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out, I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, 
was when we were in elementary school and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, and some she tells us about, and others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the son was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no streetlights whatsoever. 
So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends because I thought I was the only one who had heard it, but their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first streetlight. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. Maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan, and I don't think the name has a translation, but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody, because I remember it like it happened yesterday. When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend, and at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep. I left the light on all night and I pushed my mattress far to one side so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to how it's going to be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary. My older sisters and I planned her memorial. I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in, and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say, you know I like my girls a little bit older quietly at first. We all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing, 
on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside, shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. She doesn't. We googled the song lyrics and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, You are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. I've always had an open mind when it comes to spirits, ghosts, specters, whatever you want to call them. I'd never personally experienced anything until the night that I'm about to describe. A little background. I was about 23 years old and I had been in the US Air Force for about five years. I had moved from Texas, where I was raised, to Alaska. I had been deployed a couple of times and had been halfway around the world at least twice. While traveling, I had seen the dance clubs in the Philippines and seen the party scene in the areas just off base in South Korea. I was married to my first wife, and we had since moved to a base called K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to be exact, about three and a half hours northeast of Green Bay, Wisconsin. For some reason or another, the first wife and I had several of our friends come over and we were having some kind of movie or game night. In our base house living room, we had two TVs running. One had a movie, another had a game system, and we were all just playing some games and having fun. We were one seat short for the number of folks we had over. And we would take turns standing as somebody would get up for some reason or another. Move your meat, lose your seat rule was in full effect. I was sitting in the middle seat of our couch, and a friend, Fox, was standing near some windows behind me to the right. I thought I heard somebody whisper my name from the kitchen area that was behind me to the left. I craned my neck over to see if there was someone in there that I wasn't aware of, but nope. I figured I was just imagining things, and I got up to check the kitchen and head to the bathroom. The bathroom was right near there. When I came out, Fox had taken my seat, so I started standing where he had been. From where I was, I could see our whole living room and kitchen area, just watching the movie and people gaming. Then I heard it again. Somebody whispered my name, but louder. Fox craned his head around to look into the kitchen, just as I spun my head over to look in there. Fox, did you hear that too? Yeah, he said. Someone said your name. From where I was, I could see everybody that was in my house at once, 
and nobody was in the kitchen. Foggs could see everybody except me. I trotted into the kitchen and turned on the light, and that's when I saw a shape outside of the kitchen window on the little porch where the door was. The best way to describe what I saw next is this shape was something that looked like The Undertaker from WWE. Big, broad-brimmed hat and all dark colors. The shape turned and stepped down the steps and turned out of the little bit of light that was coming from my window. I was a young buck and I was thinking, ain't no way someone's going to peek into my windows, so I beat feet to the door and out into the night. But there was no one. When I came out of the door, I had a clear view for about 75 to 100 feet in all directions, and there was nothing moving out there. Most of my neighbors had dogs, and none of them were barking. It was silent. No barking dogs, no insects, no engines, nothing. A couple of my friends had joined me outside, and none of us saw or heard anything. Now, I've been six feet tall since I was 18 years old and I went back in and had my ex-wife hold her finger where the shoulder of the shape was. I went outside, and the shoulder of this thing was around four inches higher than my shoulder, so this thing was at least 6'4". No one in the house other than Fox heard my name called, and nobody saw the shape except me. The fact that Fox did hear my name is the only reason I don't think I imagined it. That was the night that I became a true believer in the supernatural. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you, I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m and this occurred while driving home from my boyfriend's house at the time, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10.45 at night. I was full of energy at this age, and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with the warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through the back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its cops. They could be jerks. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat, so I could really speed and that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I would take a right turn, which was more than 90 degrees almost back the way I had come from. Then, in exactly a half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel and it would have been a waste as I would have just had to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where this all went down. A house had recently been built there, two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected. We built our family house and it took us a year to finish it. I'll start at the beginning because I believe that this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great, and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning, sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf. A real wolf. A solid white real wolf. 
I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and I've even met a quarter wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and just blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it. And I notice that it's not minding me at all. It's sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick toward me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to behave like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric, like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Native American stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I had gotten to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two, I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolf buddy, hoping to see him again around that area. So I drove extra slowly with my window down and my radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the... the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity, my reality, and the possibility of eldritch terrors as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight, with its hunched posture yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulk to them and looked equipped for running, with the back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it also looked emaciated. It looked tall, maybe seven feet or more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. I knew it was going to happen. I knew that it was going to look at me. It was going to see me and there was nothing I could do to avoid it. Panic and a terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world the world that I had always known, and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up, or I would be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I knew it, in the core of my being. I had a manual crank window. Why, you might ask? because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But at that moment, I realized that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning toward me, 
and I had to let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I just knew I had to get that window up first. I was cranking it as hard as I could. I started to cry as I finally got the window closed. And then I put my gas pedal to the floor, gravel road be damned. I thought to myself, I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make any direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I had already seen too much. My tires had found grip and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed, I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see the darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick that I had learned before to tap my brake softly enough that the light came on, but not so hard that I actually slowed down. It's a way to see behind you in the dark. Red lit up the dust that was billowing my way, but amidst the swirling chaos, I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest, a tall, thin shadow. I had had enough and decided that I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 109 miles per hour, which is fast as I can go before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a ride onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, nobody was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time. So I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain it. He was dismissive and thought that I was pulling a joke on him. And when he realized I wasn't, he thought that I was crazy or seeing things. There are many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I absolutely refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have had to leave my boyfriend's house a little early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days that we went to a park to walk around, he decided that on the way back, he wanted to drive by that house where I'd seen the thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded. So as we got closer, and I realized I couldn't stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night. At one point he stopped the car and said, you have to see this. I said, no and resisted him pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this, look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted, no, no, let's get out of here. I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, he said. No furniture, no power wiring, 
no interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnt houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered, as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten. It makes my skin crawl and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it. A thing that's nothing like any creature known to humans. But I saw it. But still, the other part of me says it can't exist. If you've heard of something that matches this description, let me know. I'd love to find some answers. This all happened near Moulton, Alabama. So if you live in the area and you know what this thing might be, I'd love to hear about it. My mom and stepdad were on their way back home from Texas to South Carolina. My stepdad's mother had passed away. They made it to Texas in time to say their goodbyes, though. My stepdad, a pastor, conducted the funeral. It was a long trip, emotionally draining, but my folks were glad that they were able to see her before she passed. They stopped at a Hampton Inn and Suites in Walden or Walton, Alabama. I can't remember which. It was room 325. My parents had been bickering in their exhaustion, and they were more than ready to call it a night. My mom, who is visually impaired, laid down in bed and then felt a kiss on her left cheek. She figured it was my stepdad and smiled. My stepdad turned off the light, snuggled into bed, and starts to feel pressure on his legs. This sensation went on for several minutes before he sat up and turned the light on. Initially, he thought some kind of critter might have been in the bed. He's sitting up watching and waiting for the pressure to begin again, but it never does. I think it could have been his mom, but who knows. My parents are in their 70s and pretty religious. They rarely ever talked about ghosts or anything paranormal, so hearing this story from them was really surprising. What ended up being even creepier is that my stepdad had not kissed my mom on her cheek that night. They still don't know what did. In 2017, one of my good friends lived in Portland, Oregon. He was offered a job in Long Island, New York, and took it. He asked me to fly out so I could road trip with him across the country so he wouldn't be alone. Of course, I agreed and flew out from JFK to PDX. We have many stories from this road trip, but none stranger than what happened to us in Ohio. After a few days on the road, we had entered Ohio. I wish I remember exactly where this took place, but I honestly don't recall. All I know is that it was past Zanesville, heading east, where we had stayed the night before. My buddy was driving as I was reaching toward the ground, trying to grab my phone that I had dropped. He suddenly said, this old lady next to us keeps pointing at me. I think she wants me to pull over. I, always paranoid, said, F that dude, keep driving. But he pulled over. A black Escalade with plates from Alaska pulled in front of us. Out hopped a woman, no younger than 60, and said, I'm glad I got to you boys when I did. Your tires are smoking. It's important to note that we were towing his Camry with the U-Haul we were in. Side note, what happened in Zanesville was that we got stuck in the parking lot, couldn't back up, so we had to rehitch his car. We realized later he had left the emergency brakes on. Anyway, 
After she said this, we looked at each other, completely puzzled, and immediately at the tires. They were absolutely smoking, looking like they had bullet holes in them. This is where it gets strange. Not even a few seconds after we kneeled down to inspect the tires, she was gone. No goodbye, no sound of a car pulling off, just gone. The whole interaction from her getting out of the car to her vanishing couldn't have been more than 15 seconds in duration. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that she had literally vanished. My friend looked at me pale as a ghost, confirming exactly what I was thinking. I don't know for sure what would have happened if we hadn't stopped. I don't know if the car would have caught fire or anything else. But I do know that, real or not, to us she was an angel. I've tried to look into stories like this, but haven't had any luck finding anything. What do you think? I've had several experiences all around the same location within months of each other. The first one happened when I had just adopted my puppy. He was 11 weeks old and loved everyone. He would run up to anyone and everyone, tail wagging, the friendliest thing. One day, we were out on a walk in a large open cow field behind where I lived at the time. It was dusk, and there wasn't really anybody else around, except for this hiker in the distance walking toward us. My dog saw him and stopped in his tracks, got down low to the ground, and just started growling. The hiker was still too far away for me to even make out his face, but my puppy was freaking out. As he got closer, I started to become seriously unnerved. He was pacing toward us like a robot. That's the only way I can describe it. Or like the way military people walk. He was pale white and had these dead eyes that seemed not to see us at all. There was no acknowledgement of us whatsoever. He just did this robo speed walk straight in our direction. The dog was going crazy, growling, whining. I had never heard him make those sounds before. When the hiker walked past me, I just felt this sense of dread hit me in the gut. It felt like evil. It was the single most terrifying encounter I've ever had. As he passed us, his eyes didn't move. It was as if he didn't even see us, even though the dog was growling at him. He just power walked past us and continued on. It was strange too, the direction he was going in, because all there was that way was just a giant hill and it was getting dark. Anyway, as soon as he was past us, the dog and I just broke into a run as if we were both running for our lives. We ran all the way home. The next encounter happened in the same field. Again, I was walking the dog a couple of months after the first encounter. Again, I'm just reiterating the point that he is the friendliest dog ever, especially as a pup. All he wanted was to run up to every stranger for pets. So anyway, we're in this field and there's a load of hikers with backpacks, all stopped and checking their maps. Puppy is checking them out, tail wagging, when he zeroes in on this one hiker lady who's standing still, just observing a tree. He dropped to the ground, started growling and whining just like last time. And like last time, she didn't acknowledge us. She just stared at this tree with her dead eyes, and again, she was super pale. When I caught a glimpse of her face properly, I felt the same sense of dread that I did the last time. She looked fairly normal, except that she had almost no nose. I know this sounds kind of insane, but she had slits, like somebody who's done too much coke and had their nose fall off, or like Voldemort. I don't think the dog could have been growling at her appearance though because her back was turned to us when the growling began. The third one freaked me out the most. A friend and I were just leaving my house to walk the dog again when we realized that we'd forgotten something inside. Where I live, there's no car access and it's considered the safest area ever. So the dog is usually free to roam outside saying hello to people on the path and so on. We left him outside for a second while we went back in, and when I came out, there was a man in a business suit standing completely still, staring at my dog, and my dog was staring back at him. Not growling this time, just very still. 
It was so weird. He wasn't looking at the dog like he was afraid of it, more like he'd never seen one before. It was a look of curiosity, as though he was genuinely intrigued by my dog. Also, the fact that he was wearing a suit was freaking weird, because I lived on a boat on the river. It's muddy and there are cows and dogs and stuff all over. It was just such a strange outfit to see somebody in that location wearing. Almost as if somebody was trying to play human and got it a bit wrong. Anyway, so this stare-off went on for a good minute or so, while my friend and I just kind of observed from the doorway. Then he walked on, past a gate, and into the field where the other two encounters occurred. We followed behind him because we happened to be going in the same direction. We followed him through the gate, into the field, and watched him veer off to follow a path to our left, toward the hill that the first hiker was marching toward. We continued on straight with the dog, heading for the pub on the other side of the field. You can tell I'm from England, right? When I realized that I had forgotten my purse. I turned around to go back, but now the suit guy was back at the gate that we'd all just come through. He was just standing there, staring at the gate, occasionally lifting the latch on it, as though he was inspecting it. It was super weird and creepy. I mean, what was he doing? He was just walking away and then turned around and came back to what, check the gate mechanism? I decided not to go back for my purse because honestly, I didn't want to have to walk past him again. The fourth experience happened in the same field another couple of months after that, on a dog walk, yet again. My boyfriend was with me, but he told me to go ahead into the field while he finished getting ready and that he would meet me there. So the pup and I went out into the field and immediately spotted a hiker, robo power walking toward us, as if he'd just come down from that hill. It wasn't the same guy as before, but it was the same kind of unsettling energy. I felt it in my gut. It was just unease and wrong. And he was walking the exact same way. I pretended to chase my dog in the opposite direction and waited for him to pass through the gate before I got back onto the path. I watched him walk through it and disappear past the gate and down the path. Puppy and I carried on walking, when about two minutes later, I felt like I needed to turn around. So I did. And there he was again, power walking toward us with those dead eyes. I literally felt my blood run cold. I've never been so terrified. He was going so fast and with such intensity that the dog and I just started running out of instinct. I fumbled for my phone and tried to call my boyfriend, who didn't answer, and I veered off the path, cutting through the long grass and circling back to the gate in a giant arc. Creepy alien dude continues power walking up the path he'd just come down, as if he's going back up the hill. Sweating and out of breath, I spotted my boyfriend finally walking up to join us. I ran up to him babbling about the weirdo hiker with the bad energy. He says, where? And as I turn to point him out, we both realize that he's now power walking backwards with his eyes locked on us, still heading back up the hill, but backwards so that he could face us. We were both seriously freaked out. These all happened in the summer. Come autumn, I was living alone on the boat with the dog while my boyfriend was away for work. One night at around midnight, the dog and I were walking home from a pub quiz. It's always super dark on these country paths, and my phone had died, so I had no light. I was literally crashing into hedges and trees, trying to basically feel my way home by moonlight. And the moon and stars were super, super bright that night. Anyway, to get to my boat, I have to cross over the river on a bridge. As I'm walking over this bridge, I was looking up at the stars, since they were the only source of light. I ended up observing what I thought was a plane because it was moving steadily in my direction over that hill in that field where everything happened. As I'm watching it, it seemed to suddenly look at me. I don't really know how to describe that. It's as if it suddenly realized that it was being observed, and I felt us connect. And it shot off to the left super fast and just blinked out of existence. Obviously, in my mind, that's a UFO, and it's hovering over the hill where all the creepy alien crap kept happening. So now, I was terrified. I ran all the way home, crashing into bushes like a crazy person because I couldn't see. 
I locked the door and hid under the covers like a kid. A month or so after that, Pup woke me up at like 4 a.m. because he had to pee. Half asleep, I went to open the door for him to let him outside. I want to just paint a picture so you understand how weird this is. I live on a boat on the river. Where my boat was moored was the middle of the countryside. There are no lights on at night. Not much light pollution at all. No street lights. It's pitch dark apart from the lights of the stars and the moon. So when I stuck my head out of the boat to call the dog back, I found myself blinded by a white light. So of course I was very confused. I looked up at the sky and I couldn't even open my eyes fully because it was so bright. It was like this giant white mass really low in the sky. So low and bright that I couldn't see anything else if I looked up. The dog came running back in and I slammed the door shut, locked it, and went back to sleep. It was almost like a you-didn't-see-anything moment. I didn't even think anything of it at the time. But looking back, it makes no sense. I even went back to the spot recently to make sure that there were no other lights that I might have missed, like a new lamp post or something. But there's nothing. Anyway, I don't know what all of these encounters mean, but I moved back onto land and away from that hill and field, and they stopped happening. I actually walked up to the top of that hill one morning to check it out, and it's just a really pretty picnic spot. No alien headquarters that I could find. If anyone has any ideas, let me know. I have never really told anyone about this memory. It has stayed with me since it happened, somewhere close to a decade ago. I was probably nine. It was a completely normal day, and then I went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, despite normally being a very heavy sleeper. I don't know why, but I immediately decided moving even an inch would be a terrible idea. So. I stay still and shut my eyes. I don't know why I'm doing any of this, I just do. But then I feel something. You know how you can feel what's happening around you, even if you're not looking, as long as you're paying close enough attention? Imagine that feeling, but amplify it by about 400%. I could feel two presences in my room, not near my door, no but right next to my window on the opposite side of the room. I kept my eyes shut tight, but it wouldn't have mattered because it was as dark as dark could be anyway. After remaining near my window for however long, I began to feel like they, whoever they were, knew that I was awake. Then they started moving over to me. I can see their exact path that they took through my room in my mind, based only on what I felt. Almost comparable to how you might imagine Tof could see an avatar. Adrenaline-fueled heightened senses, I suppose. They both stand right in front of my bed. I'm laying on my side, facing toward them. The one closer to my head bends down and gets near my face. I don't hear anything. I can only feel them. They stay like this for another short while, while I'm internally panicking beyond belief, concentrating on keeping my mind in check so that I can stay alive. At that moment, I prayed to God that they would go away. And then, peace. They were gone. I have no idea what happened after that. I don't even remember waking up, despite this memory of the encounter and the peace that followed praying, all of which was extremely vivid. I had ruled it off as demons, as that falls in line with my beliefs, but after reading a few encounters, I don't know what to think. I wouldn't believe in aliens if not for this experience. Well, this one and the next ones. That same year, within about five months of this, I was taking out the trash, and once I got to the end of my driveway and dropped off the cans, 
We had a long driveway. I looked up to search for the two dippers, like I always do. I didn't expect to see five shapes in the air. One, which took up maybe a twelfth of the circumference of the sky, was composed of four bright lights, assembling what was perhaps a trapezoid-esque shape. It was emitting what appeared to be similar to a headlight on a car, except huge, of course. It was stationary, and revealed no stars behind it. To the right, there were two big, bright stationary lights. Seemed more like individual ships, much larger than stars. Between them was a moving assembly of three red lights forming a perfect triangle. Heading up, I guess almost looked like it was following the fifth entity, which I think was just one of our satellites. It was small, fast, and zipping on by. I would have thought the triangle could have been an airplane, of course, but it looked way too big for how it was moving, and how far away it appeared to be. I have seen this triangular ship two other times as well. Once I was even with other people, though it was too fast for anyone else to see it. We were in a moving car, and it went out of view. I have no explanation for these events, only the vivid memories and assurance that I did not dream them. On top of these experiences, I also noticed another similarity between myself and people who claim to have been abducted. A strange fascination, almost obsession, with aliens when they were younger, which suddenly stopped, at least for a while. I've also felt that odd sensation that many others have expressed when certain things are shown or brought up. You begin shaking, quivering, tearing up. You don't know why, but you know you have to get away from what triggered it. Which, in my case, 100% every time, is anything related to aliens being shown or discussed in media. It doesn't happen every time aliens are brought up. But when it happens, that's why. Am I blowing this all out of proportion? Does anybody know what's going on? Please let me know, because I feel kooky. I work a pretty easy-going office job, and I consistently listen to podcasts while I do my work. That being said, I've always had an interest in the paranormal and the unexplained, so that's typically what I listen to. I was listening to an interview by Astonishing Legends with Terry Lovelace about the things he encountered, and what he experienced from a camping trip in Devil's Den back in the 70s. To sum it up, he touched on what happened to him and a couple of things stood out to me. It reminded me of something that happened to me as a kid, that I always chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, it has me second guessing myself. I must have been in about the third or fourth grade. At the time, we lived kind of on the edge of a bunch of farmland and woods. Our backyard opened up to our neighbors who owned acres upon acres of land and to the left of that was just endless farmland and forest. We lived a few miles away from a really popular dairy farm, but we were also a mile or two out from the main road that leads into town. I guess the point I'm getting at here is that we were kind of secluded, but not totally isolated. The Midwest is like that at times, I guess. My room at the time was in the basement, and the stairs that led down to it was right in front of our back door. I slept with my bed right in front of my bedroom door as well. It was summer break, and after I finally decided that I was tired, I went to lay down in bed. My memories go in and out at this point, and there are still missing spots in between, because I think as soon as I laid down, I just blacked out. I remember I had just woke up, right after passing out, and I'm not sure how much time had passed between these two points in time. I immediately looked at the foot of my bed, and the door to my room is wide open. There's this blinding light outside my room. I remember seeing this figure right in the doorway to my room. 
I couldn't make out any distinct features because of the light coming from behind it, so it was backlit. All I got was a silhouette, an outline, and the shape of how it looked. It must have been not that much shorter than me, and I was a kid at the time, maybe around four feet. It had a huge bulbous head and a tiny body. In retrospect, it was shaped like a gray, but I don't know if that's too cliche to say. I just remember this utmost primal sense of fear, and I couldn't move. I've never experienced that level of horror before, and I haven't felt that feeling since. I was laying on my back in my bed, and all I could do was stare at it. I was trying to scream, but nothing could come out. I couldn't get up to run or anything. I was completely paralyzed to that spot. I blacked out again and came to again, and it was closer, right at the end of my bed. At that point, I tried screaming again, but still, nothing would come out. At that point, I blacked out again. I came to that morning, on the opposite side of my room, flopped across this little couch I had. It's hard to explain it, too, because there's nothing in between these points of time. It's just a blank spot. I tried to explain all of this to my mom, but she chalked it up as sleepwalking and a nightmare because I had stayed up too late. Something to that effect. For a while, I was completely horrified to watch any form of alien movie, or even just anything in TV that resembled that shape. I would have a full-blown panic attack and start to hyperventilate. I've gotten past that. It doesn't really get to me anymore. However, to this day, I cannot sleep with my bed in front of my door, or with my door open. I don't even like sleeping near the door. I need to be as far away from it as possible. Even during the day, if I'm doing something in a room, the door has to be closed. Having it open just sends this massive feeling of discomfort and anxiety through me, and I can't do it. I've experienced weird things throughout my life, but this particular instance, I eventually just chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, I'm not so sure. Can anyone offer any insight? Or at least tell me I'm crazy, or not? Trying to explain it or even think about it just makes me feel like I'm losing my mind. Last night, I had a really weird experience, but at least somehow it has a positive ending. It was like 2.20 a.m. To be honest, nothing felt wrong until I opened my eyes. I was half asleep, but I could clearly see the typical gray alien head behind a chair that's close to my bed. Well, nearly all of its face. I couldn't move at all. In fact, I tried so hard to move that my right leg started to shake because of my effort. It looked kind of ghostly. It wasn't fully defined, and it was whitish, but the face was basically an alien. I couldn't see the body. The head, which was huge, by the way, was at my bed's height, so it was probably crawling or something? I don't know. The moment I opened my eyes, I wanted to do something, battle it, get rid of it, something. I used all of my strength to move. I could see this thing because I often sleep with my lamp on. If I turn it off, I start to imagine them all around me. I don't know why. Without that lamp, I never would have seen a thing. I simply could not move. My body would not respond. So I started to pray, saying, Jesus Christ protects me. Jesus Christ sets me free. Don't let it take me. All of a sudden, it vanished, and I could move. After that, I stood awake for a while, but I didn't get out of my bed. I was too exhausted from trying to fight this thing. I just kept thinking about it and looking at the same spot while I was spooked out. I'm not even a Christian, nor do I practice any religion, but I do know that Jesus' name freed me from this thing. You could probably consider me an atheist, but 
what happened happened. So I am open to the fact that spiritual things exist. From what I have read from a few reports on the internet, several people have been set free from abductions, alien encounters, and so on, praying to God. I really don't know what to think about that, but it happened to me too. Before this encounter, the last two days, there have been two full power cuts throughout the neighborhood, one each day. A short one during the first day around 11 a.m., and a fairly long one the other day at like 2 a.m. Has anybody else experienced anything like this? All I know is I hope to never experience it again. From Singapore. I was lying on the living room sofa in the dark, on my own, just flipping through Reddit on my phone. It was connected to the charger and the plug was right below the sofa, as I had the extension all the way. Then something got caught on the charger cable and the phone got pulled out of my hand and onto the floor. I couldn't see what was behind my phone while reading due to the light from it and the darkness in the background. At first I thought it might have just been my cat walking past, but she was asleep on my feet. The light that now illuminated the floor showed nothing. I thought I must have just gotten caught on something, so I brushed it off. Not ten seconds later, as I settled back onto the sofa, my phone got yanked right out of my hand again, and this time it flew a little farther away, as far as the USB cable could go. That area was now illuminated, but it too showed nothing. Nothing that could have caused the phone to be pulled that far anyway. Just an empty floor with nobody and nothing around. From the small country of Bangladesh, and whenever I go to visit, my cousins and family members like telling us stories about all the paranormal things that they've encountered or heard about. They don't have any physical evidence, but they've all claimed to have had experiences with the paranormal. One of the stories I've commonly heard about are old trees, usually willows, sometimes banana trees, around lakes or rivers. It's believed that when a young maiden dies near the tree, their soul resides there. The deaths are usually drowning, unaliving someone else, or unaliving oneself. It is only during dawn when she said that the souls start to bother people. She said that hauntings behave like sirens do. To men who pass by a haunted tree during the dawn hours, they appear as very beautiful women. To women, they appear as a sad, lost little girl. When someone approaches them, they stay in their form. But whenever the person is at arm's length, they become demonic and angry and try to harm the person. Some people even claim to be possessed by those souls and get exorcisms performed. A lot of my family members are skeptical about the stories and don't believe them. But if they're outside around dawn, I'll watch them go out of their way to go all the way around an old tree near a lake or a river. So, I don't know how much they really don't believe in. I've never seen or experienced this, but I've had several people tell me the same story, independent of one another. So, I thought it would be interesting to share. The most commonly known ghostly figure of Southeast Asia is the Pontiana. A Pontiana is basically a woman who has died during childbirth and haunts pregnant women to rip the child out of the womb. Another favorite prey is men. The Pontiana is able to disguise herself as a beautiful woman 
and will use this disguise to lure men to their deaths by digging into their stomachs with its sharp nails. I don't have any stories on those, but allow me to share a story that my cousins encountered in the mid-1990s. Malaysia is multicultural, so it's not unusual to see whole neighborhoods with a colorful array of different cultures and religious beliefs. During a particular month of every year, Taoists burn hell money for their departed loved ones, in line with their practice of ancestor worship. The belief is simply that loved ones linger even after death, and by sending large amounts of hell money to be used in the afterlife, the departed can affect your fortunes. As such, getting in the way of burnt hell money is extremely taboo, even for non-believers. It's akin to taking the Bible out and peeing all over it. It may not mean anything to you, but it's highly disrespectful. People tend to adhere not just out of common decency, but also out of a strong belief that you will be haunted and your fortunes will suffer if you interfere. Burning hell money may be your religious right, but there's also etiquette to follow. Responsible worshippers usually burn the money in burners, but sometimes people want to save a few bucks, so they'll burn the money right in the middle of the sidewalk. I have lost count of the number of times that I've had to take a detour because somebody decided to use up the entire sidewalk for this event. My cousins at the time were Muslim and very young, they were not aware of the customs and cultures of their neighbors who were Taoists. It was at that time of the year again where people were burning hell money. My aunt led her kids outside to play and shortly after was horrified to find her two daughters kicking and playing amongst a pile of burnt hell money. Things went downhill from there. My aunt started feeling that the air in the house was just not quite right and she would often find my cousins just sitting in the room, in the darkness, staring at the ceiling. When asked what they were looking at, the eldest cousin would simply reply, somebody's floating up there. It gradually got worse. One night, she was awoken to find the eldest girl screaming and yelling at something to keep away from her sister, but nothing was there, at least, nothing that anyone else could see. Later on, the skin on their legs darkened as if it was bruised. They kept telling my aunt that their legs hurt all the time. It wasn't until my aunt visited a local medium, the encounter stopped. I wasn't there, so I can't vouch for anything, but my aunt is the sweetest lady I've ever known. And she's never lied to me before, at least not on that level. So, I believe something happened. All this talk of hell money and the like might sound a little outrageous, but being born in Singapore, stories like these used to scare me as I was exposed to these customs and practices on a daily basis. Even now as a full-on atheist, I'm still very wary of stepping even accidentally on any offering that's meant for the dead. I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant had used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there just to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, and one that is a long string that you pull which is right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. After living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn off the light, so I go and do that. About two weeks on, I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. 
I can see the window to the room from outside, and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, ugh, I've been robbed. I barge into my home, quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find someone, but there's no one there. Ah, oh, they must still be up there, I thought. So I fly up the stairs, and the door is shut, but the light is still on. I swing the door open, and nothing. I will say that I'm very skeptical about stories when I hear feeling of dread or felt I was being watched, but I had both of those. I had this horrific feeling that I really wasn't alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I try my best to shrug it off, I turn the light off and I shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic. Day or night, the light is on at least twice a week, but now it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the attic window, so I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is very tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there, and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could be because he's just out of sorts, but given the situation, and the fact that he never hisses at anything ever, it really freaks me out. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to the paranormal. If anybody can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. Before I start my unexplained encounter, I would like to say that I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average-sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window, and one on the back. So on January 24th, I had suddenly been awoken, at about 4.30 in the morning. I checked my phone. I usually wake up about 7 or 8 a.m. so I can get to work on time. At first I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep was, and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at about 4.30. He responded by saying he had heard something at exactly 4.34 in the morning. At this point, we were a little bit freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch into the attic. Like I said before, there was really no way anybody could fit up there because it's just too small. We decided to look at the camera footage, but there were no signs of any motion or anything out of the ordinary, other than just leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that somebody had come from one of the sides of the house and climbed onto the roof for some reason. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side. But I also knew that it wasn't the other side, due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely wake up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck, believing that it's something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard a noise but it's only been a few days as I'm writing the story. And before anybody says anything, it is not an animal. We know what those sound like. These are footsteps. But like I said, it's pretty much impossible that somebody with footsteps, physical anyway, could be walking around up there. Anyway, if you have any ideas as to what it might be, let me know.
I've had many paranormal experiences growing up, all very different. On this night, I saw something that I never thought I could see with my own eyes. I slept over at a friend's house one night, and that night, as I was laying on the floor next to her bed, my head was by her feet, facing the stairs leading down to the second floor. I closed my eyes. I could feel somebody staring at me. Their presence was dark, and something told me to open my eyes. There he stood, at the top of the attic stairs. I couldn't see his face or his body, just the outline of him. A completely dark shadow of a man. He stood over us, staring a hole through my soul, and I, completely unaware of how unreal he was, couldn't move or blink. I could only stare back. It wasn't until what seemed like minutes had passed that I was finally able to close my eyes again, and somehow I fell asleep. The next morning, I had asked my friend if her siblings had one of their guy friends over, being that one of her sister's rooms was next to hers in the attic. She said no, that nobody but us had been in the attic that night. I was confused. I told her about the man I had seen, and she turned pale white. She goes on to say how she felt like somebody was holding her down. She couldn't move or breathe. Later on that day, her older sister, who we evidently told the story to, had told us about the man who had lived and died in that house years before their mother bought it. A man in his early 30s had committed a murder of his children, three daughters, and then himself. Since then, he has haunted the house and would bother the females in the house. All she knew about that man was just that, what he had done. Nobody knows why he would do all those things. But what I saw was very real, and I'll never forget it. This happened about a year ago in Tucson, Arizona. It was my first time visiting Arizona, and I had no idea how many allegedly haunted places were in the small downtown area of Tucson. It was really exciting for me, as someone who was basically born obsessed with the paranormal and with mysteries in general. I was there with two other females, a friend that I traveled there with and an acquaintance who lived there and was hosting us. It was our first night there, and the woman we were staying with took us out to see the city and have a few drinks. We visited a couple supposedly haunted bars and did a quick round of karaoke before we started walking home. By this time, our host was clearly pretty drunk, but my friend and I were very chill and clear-headed. The house we were staying at was located on the same street, and just a couple of blocks away from the oldest bar in Tucson. It was about 1.30 in the morning. We were talking and laughing, just enjoying the night. The streets weren't empty, but there also weren't many people out. When we turned the corner onto her street, the bar was about two blocks ahead of us and was brightly lit, but the area we were currently in was fairly dark. I was kind of looking down when my friend said, Um, you guys? Don't freak out, but there's a guy in a cape walking toward us right now. I looked up and my stomach flipped. There was a man in a thick black hooded cloak heading in our direction. I instantly felt uncomfortable because he was moving with a slow, steady, heavy gait, and he was walking down the very middle of the street, which seemed really odd. As soon as we noticed him, he began moving from the center of the road and veering off toward his left, as if he was intending to come up onto the sidewalk and face us. My heart instantly began racing and I pulled my friend closer to me. We kept walking but slowed down just a little, anticipating his move onto the sidewalk. There were cars lined up along the sidewalk, parked at a diagonal, and the man stepped between two cars in order to reach the sidewalk but he didn't emerge. As we came closer to where he should have been, I was afraid he was going to jump out from between the cars, but he wasn't there at all. He wasn't in any of the cars either. This would have been enough to totally freak me out, 
But at that moment, I looked up, and there he was, now nearly twenty feet ahead of us, walking down the very middle of the street again, but this time walking away from us and toward the bar. At this point, I knew something very weird was going on, and I became absolutely fixated on him, like I wanted to study every little nuance of his movement, just trying to process what was even going on. I could see his black boots sticking out from the bottom hem of the cloak. It went all the way down to his ankles. I watched how the fabric swayed heavily with his lumbered steps. He looked huge and powerful. He looked just as solid and as real as me or my friends or anyone else. As he drew closer to the bar, he began again veering off toward the sidewalk and the entrance to the bar. The bar was on the same side of the street as us, and we were about one block away by this time. He stepped up onto the sidewalk and headed directly for the entrance. At this point, two women walked out of the bar and walked right past him. I mean, should have brushed up against him or ran into him, but never even acknowledged his presence. They then stood outside just a foot or two away from him, talking and flipping their hair, never even glancing back once. They definitely did not see him. At this same instant, I noticed that he had stopped at the entrance to the bar. There's a really big, super bright sign just about the entrance that glows the name of the bar, so he was perfectly illuminated now. With him standing there, I had a clear perspective of his height. He was taller than the top of the door. The tip of his hood was only a few inches below the bottom of the lit up sign. He had his head slightly down, and I noticed that his feet seemed to be stuck mid-step. It was the strangest thing. It was almost like looking at a computer glitch. One foot was in front of the other, slightly raised up with the heel touching the ground, but he was just rocking back and forth like he was stuck in the motion of taking the step. Then our drunk friend, who had noticed none of this, said something, and I glanced in her direction. When I looked back at him a millisecond later, he was gone. We even went into the bar and he was nowhere there, and there's nowhere he could have gone. They had CCTV cameras with the videos being displayed right there above the bar, but I was too shy to ask if they could check for footage. This experience has absolutely haunted me ever since. His presence didn't necessarily feel scary, although I was afraid right at first when I thought he was some creepy dude wandering the streets in a cape, but when I realized he wasn't human, I felt calm and almost comforted by his energy. I couldn't stop talking about it afterward and wondering what it was we saw. We passed by that bar several more times over the rest of our stay, and each time there was a person just standing there leaning up against a pole outside the bar, who either followed us for a block or tried to talk to us, and it just seemed odd. My friend strangely began kind of seeming to detach herself from me as the days progressed. We were roommates at the time, and when we got home from the trip, she dropped me off at our apartment and went straight to her boyfriend's house. I didn't see or hear from her for almost a week. It really felt like she was trying to avoid me. I started spiraling into a deep depression. Within four months, our friendship had completely deteriorated in the worst way. We ended up moving out of the apartment that summer, and were no longer friends at all. Although there are clear circumstances that led to this and I take responsibility for my role in the friendship breakup, I always wonder if that encounter in Arizona influenced any of it to happen, because when I look back it really seemed like there was some kind of turning point in the way she felt toward me after that. Just to be clear, ever since we stopped being friends, my life has been richer and more joyous and more fulfilling than ever. All these things in my life practically rearranged themselves when she and I began fighting, and now I'm genuinely happier, and I feel more loved and supported than I ever have. Whether or not that cloaked entity had anything to do with it, I'm very grateful to have had that experience. It's the most potent, paranormal, and mysterious experience I've had to date. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever seen anything like this before, or had their lives dramatically changed after encountering the other side.
My father had training in Phoenix this week, so we left Las Vegas on Sunday and passed through Jerome for dinner. We didn't stay but we planned to pass through the town before, so we watched Ghost Adventures and did a tad bit of research on the hotel. The Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona is apparently haunted, and we thought that was kind of cool. We got to Jerome around 6 p.m. and went to the hotel to eat dinner at the Asylum restaurant inside. When we first got there, I had to use the restroom. Entering the male's bathroom closet to the restaurant, I walked into an empty bathroom with the three urinals out of order and just one stall near the very end. I supposed that they left the bathrooms the same from when it was a hospital since it looked like one of the blue and whitish old hospital rooms. Being in that bathroom gave me a very eerie feeling. Not hearing a sound made me constantly on alert for the unexplained footsteps or disembodied voices or breaths. I didn't notice anything except how much I was shaking. But when I finally exited the restroom, the unsettling feeling that I felt within carried throughout the rest of the building. We then just sat down for dinner about an hour or two and nothing weird happened during that. Then when we were finished with dinner at around 8 p.m., my dad wanted to get going because we needed to get to the hotel in Phoenix for his training that week. But I was desperate to at least check out the hotel part of the building and see room 23, supposedly the room with the most activity in the hotel. So before we left, we took a visit to the floor above the restaurant, and my father got a picture of me in front of the door to that room. After that, I decided to just pull out my phone and take some live pictures. I only took three, the first two being down the hallway from room 23, which had no weird anomalies in them and the final picture being just a quick one of the stairs closest to room 23 that led to the floor above. After that, we finally exited the building and went back to our ride to Phoenix. I didn't look at the photos directly after taking them, and only remembered to give them a look after I couldn't get any service a little while after exiting Jerome. That's when I saw the first two photos, and despite being a little disappointed that I didn't receive anything, finally came to the last photo I took real quick before I left, and I noticed what looked like an orb moving down the stairs. There have been stories of the spirit of a little girl roaming the property, and the orb moving in a hop-like pattern down the stairs seemed, in my opinion, to be a pretty childish gesture, as I commonly hopped down the stairs when I was younger. A few days after we visited Jerome, while we were sleeping at a hotel in Phoenix, I had just fallen asleep before I dramatically awoke after dreaming or visualizing the image of electricity slowly moving through a solenoid before reaching a core, which then caused me to wake up. It had the similar feeling of when you wake up from that feeling of falling, but this felt a little different. I'm not sure if it's related to my time at the Jerome Grand Hotel due to the fact that I haven't experienced anything else, but I thought I would share it anyway just in case. This happened on a family trip to Texas. We rented an RV to travel across the state with. We live in Florida. We left on a Tuesday. We were off to Texas to visit my cousin and her kids, so the family decided since we're here, why not go to Arizona to see the Grand Canyon, Mystery Mountain, OK Corral, and the Painted Desert. The interesting part of the story happened when heading into Mystery Mountain. We had to travel around this dark, deserted track around the mountain with no guardrail. And if you opened your door, you were looking down a cliff. So we traveled, and my father had rented an SUV to make his trip. He calls it white-knuckling when you drive some dangerous roads. We didn't see any other lights than the ones from our headlights, and finally we get all the way to the bottom. All of the men get out of the car to use the bathroom. Like I said, no lights on the way up or behind us. No one leading up to the track we had taken. Then we see something strange. A motorcycle passes us, with a female and a male on it. It was not going that fast. The thing that was odd 
other than the fact that we didn't see their lights, is that the bike went about 30 feet and then disappeared. We saw all of it and then, poof, nothing. To this day, none of us can explain what happened. This story is, unfortunately, true. I grew up in the Sierra Nevadas. I wasn't big on camping, but I spent a good chunk of my childhood weekends hiking with family and friends. The summer that I was 16, about 10 years ago now, my cousin Cindy had come back from her first year of college, and her boyfriend Jake was visiting. Jake wanted to go on a hike with lake views, and Cindy and I knew just the one. It was one of our favorites. The three of us set off on this hike. The trail isn't the easiest to find, but is really popular with locals because of the view and general lack of tourists. We saw a couple of other hikers, some with dogs. It's an in and out trail that takes about two to three hours to the top and then two to three hours back down. There are some smaller trails that branch off. We make it to the top in good time and enjoy our lunches overlooking the lake. After about an hour, we hear a scream in the distance, specifically a mountain lion scream. If you've never heard a mountain lion scream, it's really unnerving. It sounds a bit like a very loud, terrified woman screaming. This is not good because when a mountain lion screams, it's usually part of a mating ritual. That means that there are multiple lions and close. The bears in the Sierras are softies, but the mountain lions will attack you. They'll attack your pets. They've even been known to attack bikers. Jake was really freaked out. Cindy and I were wary, but it wasn't the first time we'd heard mountain lions, and we'd both seen them before. There was also an incident where, as kids, we laid out some expensive steak in the backyard in hopes of luring a mountain lion to take pictures of it. It did not work, and my mother was very unhappy about the stakes. Cindy and I tell Jake that we need to pack it up and get back down the mountain. About 40 minutes into the hike back, Jake realized that he forgot his phone at the lookout in his rush to leave. Of course. We decided that Cindy and Jake would hike back up to retrieve his phone, and I would stay there, on the trail to warn any other potential hikers that there are lions in the area. This is obviously not ideal for any of us, but it seemed like the best choice at the time. I found a nice rock to sit on by the trail and was going through the pictures we took. Cindy and Jake had been gone for around 50 minutes when I heard the scream again. It's hard to tell, but I think it's closer than before. I start to freak out because being alone is no good if there is a lion nearby. About 20 minutes after that, I hear the scream again, and now there is zero doubt that it is closer. Logically, I know that lions don't scream when hunting. They're quiet. If a lion was hunting me, I wouldn't know it, but that knowledge didn't make me less scared. A couple of minutes after that, I hear it again, extremely close by. I'm looking around and trying to find the best place for me to stand, back covered in case of the worst. Suddenly, I see something out of the corner of my eye. Standing still 20 feet down the trail, a couple of feet off of it, is a man. He's completely naked, he's filthy, he's skinny, and he's just standing there, looking at me. If you don't know where you're going, it's easy to get lost in the woods around there. And it doesn't take long, being alone, lacking food and water in the wilderness, to make people a little disoriented, a little crazy. My immediate response is that this man is probably a lost hiker, and judging by how dirty he was, he'd been lost a long time. He needed help. I started walking towards him, asking if he's okay. I suddenly get this feeling of wrongness. I don't know how else to describe it but the hair stood up on my neck. 
I stopped in my tracks, maybe 15 feet away now, and had the overwhelming urge to run. It seemed wrong. He looked wrong in a way that I can't quite articulate. Instead of wanting to help him, now I'm afraid of him. But I ask again if he's okay. He looks at me, then opens his mouth wide and screams. Not a normal scream. He screamed so loudly. And worse, it sounded just like a mountain lion. It occurred to me that we were probably hearing him the whole time. It was the single most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. I started screaming too. I mean, why was he just standing there screaming? Do I run? Do I get the bear mace? Suddenly, he closed his mouth, turned around, and ran into the woods very quickly. He disappeared into the trees, but the feeling of wrongness was still with me. I considered bolting down the trail, but decided to wait for Cindy and Jake, who, luckily, arrived within 10 or 15 minutes. I told them what happened, and we decided to call it into the rangers when we got into service. I've always been left with the unsettling question. Did I see a mentally ill or lost hiker who really needed my help? Or did I see something else? Something not human, mimicking the call of a mountain lion and stalking us. I've been sitting with this story for many years now. It's not as exciting and creepy as some of the stories I've heard, but it is eerie, and I'm wondering what might have happened. My aunt has owned a large piece of land, over a hundred acres, in northwest Connecticut for many years now. Her property is located in a state park that is mostly uninhabited and only frequented by backpackers. Her land is well off any main roads, and we have to drive through a lot of forest to reach her house. She bought the land and remodeled the old house that was already built on it so that it was more livable and going up to visit her has always been my favorite thing to do. I have been going yearly since I was a baby, and have spent countless hours exploring the woods, creeks, and land around the house. We call it the farm, although it's not a true agricultural or livestock farm. My aunt does have rescue miniature horses, alpacas, donkeys, and back in the day there were ducks. The animals are on one part of the property where area has been cleared out for them to graze, get fat, and be happy. The rest of the farm is untouched woodlands. In the early 2000s, she decided to install 12-foot fencing around the property, although it only enclosed about 80 acres of the land she owns. She explained to me that she could not stand the sounds of the coyotes howling right outside her window at night, and that she had had some creepy encounters while living there. She didn't go into the details of these at the time, since I was a young child. She lives alone, so I understand why she wanted to feel a semblance of security in those deep woods. We're originally from the bayou of Louisiana, so being in this type of environment was new to all of us. Anyway, despite being initially unfamiliar with the land, I eventually learned to navigate the area very well as a child. I had a few favorite spots and one was up a small foothill in the deepest part of the woods. I would go up so often that eventually a small path was established in the brush, and I would bring my cousins with me to show them my little oasis. In 2008, when I was about 10 years old, I took a summer trip to my aunt's, and I brought my best friend Alex with me. She and I often took trips here together during our childhood, and this was not her first time accompanying me to the farm. I remember that we were in the woods at my favorite spot, sitting together and listening to Katy Perry while playing Doodle Jump on our iPad touches. This makes me laugh to remember, but we were just trying to enjoy some nature while getting our fill of new tech, I guess. We were there for a while enjoying ourselves and talking about random kid stuff, when there was this shift in the air almost like a suffocating stillness and silence that settled upon the woods. 
I paused the music and looked to Alex, who was already staring at me with a concerned and worried expression on her face. We stayed still and silent for a minute, tilting our heads to listen to the woods and search out any of the familiar sounds that normally crescendoed day and night across the farm. There were no birds, no summer bugs, and the trees almost seemed to stand frozen in place. As if the light winds that normally rustled their leaves had left us completely. It was a vulnerable, terrible feeling, and I knew Alex felt it too. Then began the sound of footsteps, coming from even deeper in the woods. It took a moment for me to determine what the sound was, but the distinct rhythm of weight being picked up and put down on leaves and brush was impossible not to notice. It was bipedal and heavy, and it was coming up toward us from a steep slope down the side of the mountain. I remember thinking that it was impossible for a human to move so easily through that part of the woods, since it was very thick with growth, fallen branches, trees, and rocks, even making it hard for an agile small child to navigate, let alone a large adult. It felt as if the woods lay still in wait, while these footsteps made their way swiftly up the steep incline toward us. Do you hear that? I asked Alex in a whisper. She nodded. Sounds like footsteps, I continued. She nodded again, looking like she was about to burst into tears. I took her hand and began running down the makeshift path with her, trying not to fall or let her lag behind me at all. We didn't stop until we reached the house. I don't think we told anybody that day, because we were just too shaken up to even comprehend what might have been out there. The next day, I asked Alex if she would go back out to the spot with me. She was very hesitant at first, but eventually agreed and said we could go look for signs of another human. We made our way back, nervous but determined to discover what had invaded our little sanctuary. When we reached the spot, I looked down toward the direction we'd heard the footsteps. I think I even slid down a bit to investigate passable indentations in the brush and leaves. I didn't go too far, because I was about to lose my nerve, and I hadn't noticed much anyway, so I quickly climbed back up to where Alex waited nervously for me. We decided that it must have been some sort of animal or deer, despite every logical explanation indicating otherwise. I knew what deer sounded like, and that was not a deer. But I wanted to forget and have fun again. We took our iPods out and began the same ritual of relaxing and playing games while chatting about nonsense. It seemed that things were back in their natural order again, so we quickly forgot about the terrifying experience and let our naive childlike wonder take over. After a little while, the stillness returned, and it happened so quickly it felt as if the forest took a gasp and never exhaled. This time, the footsteps started almost immediately. They were louder and coming from a different direction. The best way I can explain their location is that it was in a similar spot to the day before, but somewhat more to the right, where the forest was very dark and the incline to reach us was less steep. I didn't wait too long to run, but it was enough to realize that the sound was faster, closer, and definitely not a deer or a bear. I didn't look into the woods too closely, because I just wanted to get out of there, and I was too scared to see whatever it was. I knew it was close enough that it would be upon us any moment if we didn't flee. So without a word, Alex and I took off and ran as fast as humanly possible out of the woods. It's not a really super exciting story, but it was my very first creepy experience in the woods. I've since had more because I'm an avid backpacker and I love the outdoors. But the experiences on her land have always been the most bizarre and inexplicable. If anyone has any ideas as to what we might have witnessed that day, or what was after us, let me know. I think about it every time I'm in the woods. It still sends chills up my spine to remember.
I go hunting in southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is my second home, and I've spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. I caught all the fish in the area, hunted every legal game, and spotted the rest. So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, just remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in, in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or lack thereof. Two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so at least two hours until sunlight. I pulled my stuff out of the truck and walked into the woods. I have my shotgun, a revolver, a knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee, and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second-growth forest and down a rather steep hill. Across the bottoms, and then a lung-burning steep climb up to another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I often do it. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck, and get to climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed that there was more noise than usual. Something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about a quarter of the way up the hill, listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping that if I stay really still, that whatever I'm hearing will lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and lay it over my knees to wait. Except, I don't hear anything now. Whatever it was must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning. I still stayed a bit, sipping some coffee to make sure, but I gave up after about 15 minutes or so of dead silence from the forest floor. I probably didn't even make four steps before the second moving thing started again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way I am, and I flip the light off again, and sidestep behind a tree. Sure enough, I don't hear anything again. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated and I start moving again. And my new friend does too. This is when I started to get freaked out, because I worked my way up the hill stopping to turn around and look every so often. When I stopped, the sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps, like something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times. By now, I am sweating bullets and freezing cold because I am sweating bullets in the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so that I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time. The last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and, in theory, keep it from moving. And I didn't hear anything after that. I got up into my stand and I smoked like five cigarettes in a row. It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind a camo. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and I went back early. And I wasn't moving slowly heading back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright. I haven't told my family about it because they wouldn't believe me, but the sound was so freaky. And when it decided to happen, it felt very human. Which is likely, because poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I'm going, and for how long. Just in case my new friend shows up again.
At the time that this happened, I was 20 years old. I'm a female, and I had just moved alone to a small town in upstate New York. I had grown up in another, slightly larger town, about 60 miles away. I just wanted a new start. I love camping, and I often go camping in the Adirondacks, but at the time I hadn't yet made friends to go camping with, so I wasn't going to go into the real woods alone. Down the road from me, I had been walking and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right of the house where I thought people wouldn't mind if I walked up the trail that the power lines make. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the US they keep the power lines clear in case maintenance is necessary. So I wander up there, noticing how it's actually pretty deep in the woods, and I can get far enough from the house that I saw on the road that they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in or anything. I had an idea. I could go camping up here. It's secluded enough to give the real woods experience, but close enough to the road and with a direct path that I wouldn't be in real danger of wildlife or anything. Okay, sweet. So I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I accessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turned left onto what seemed to be a deer trail. Deer are everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this really nice, flat, grassy clearing. I built my fire off to the side after making sure to clear the dead woods. I'm feeling really smart and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, as I had always had at least one camping companion, but eh, whatever. Next day, I decided to wander farther down the path to see where it led. I walked for about a half an hour, and I could see some fields on the right but they were in the distance, and there was a fence between the fields and the path. So again, I figure people can't be mad at me for being where I am. Then I come across another path, heading to the right. I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly, and there's an old van on the left of the path. Well, that's strange, but it's about 1 p.m., somewhere near noon anyway. Broad daylight, birds are chirping, so I feel no danger. I go up to the van, which had obviously been there a very long time. It was 70s style and made me think of the Scooby-Doo van, and it was overgrown with weeds. There were streaks of brownish red going down the side, from the bottom of the doors. I looked in and saw what appeared to be old bedding in the back, but it was all shredded. The curtains on the windows were shredded, and the clothing was all strewn about, and it looked like it was from the 70s or early 80s. I still felt no danger signs. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continued along the path for a short time, until I finished rounding the slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks. Finally, finally, my reptile sense, or whatever you want to call it, wakes up and starts screaming at me full volume. Up ahead, there's a creepy doll hanging from the trees, by its neck, with a rope. Not just stuck into the trees. Just to the left of that, there's an old garage overgrown with weeds. To the right of it, though, there's this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-sized man. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects, just kind of welded together. Some were up and down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through, not that I tried. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Farther behind it, there's a run-down house. Creeped out is all hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner. I was a chunky girl, and I had smoked for six years at that point, and I did not run. But I ran that day. I don't even remember the run. I just remember coming upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put my things into the tent, ripping it out of the ground as I continued running. I left my cooler, my food, anything that fell out behind. I never went back for it either. I dropped the tent stakes somewhere along the way, 
and I had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down the hill, I'm still surprised I didn't break my neck, jumped in my car, and sped home. I locked all my doors, and then paced my house for hours, going, what the hell, what the hell? It's been 11 years since that incident, and even telling it now makes me a little shaky. I now live almost 1,400 miles away, but I still make sure my doors are locked. The crazy thing is, this wasn't even deep in the woods. Maybe in the 70s it was, though. Who knows? As it stands now, though, there are people living within a very short distance of this place. And no, I didn't call the cops. I can't really articulate why. My best analysis, looking back, is that I didn't want that creep to come find me. I probably should have called, yes. I'm hoping that it was just an old crime scene, not some sick person who still keeps people in cages in the woods. This happened in 2018, in December, just before Christmas. Two of my friends and I, we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine who was 15, were camping in the woods. It was on the property of one of the friends that had come along. We were there for five days and pretty much did it all by ourselves, except for water. That we would hike back to the house to grab for the day since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region was relatively dry, with no water filters or anything like that. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we would hear boar around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the second to last, we were just having a chat after dinner, like we would often do, and we hear a scream. It was pretty odd. It didn't sound human, but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either. I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. I've heard a lot of their screams, but this one was just different. The scream sounded like it had a buildup, not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies off, but like it started low, got really intense, and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again, and again, and again. Now, suddenly, it's coming from almost all sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were really scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds just to make a sound. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right to where the campfire couldn't shed light, just outside of what we could see. I remember that we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day. So we gathered all the strength and courage that we could and we went there. The bait was gone, but the traps were unarmed. And that was a stupid idea anyway. Rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, the sounds just stopped with no clear reason. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. And anytime somebody asks me for a scary story, I share this one. Also, where I live in Portugal, we don't have any cougars or anything like that that typically screams. Maybe there's no explanation. I don't know. But all I know is that it terrified me, and I still think about it to this day. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, 
so we had kind of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going up this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go on forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anybody around, but the sun was about to set, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking, one in front of the other, dressed completely in white, in perfectly clean clothing. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, never acknowledged my mom or I whatsoever, and then walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. What's weird is that neither of them had lights. They were barefoot. They had no belongings with them, and they weren't even dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as I was. She could never see them. I was on edge the rest of the night, and I had a lot of trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he just looked at her and said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Somewhere around 2013 or 2014, I was leading my sister, who was then about 15 or 16, to a forest that I would sometimes go to with a friend. The way it was set up is there was this giant ditch or valley that had a bunch of water in the bottom. So if you fell, you could easily get injured or drown from the size of it. The ditch went in a straight line in front of the forest and there was this little concrete dam type thing that you could walk on to get across to the forest. It's nighttime and I've never been there at night my sister wanted a place to smoke cigarettes, so we walked there with one of her other friends who was like 17 or 18. As we got up to the dam, we all see this 5 to 7 foot tall person type thing. And as soon as it sees us, it starts jumping towards us, about 4 feet in the air. Its movement was a little clumsy if I can remember right. When it started jumping, we all ran as quickly as we could and went back home. It was shaped like a human, but its legs looked like a goat. It almost looked like it was wearing a light gray jacket, but maybe it was fur. There was very little light, so it was hard to see well. We never told anybody about it because we were all underage. Told our parents that we were going to church, didn't tell them we were going to wander around. So we didn't want to get in trouble. I don't think there was some Olympic jumper out there doing weird stuff in the forest either. The forest has signs all around it saying to stay out, so I don't think people would really do that. One time after my sister turned 18, I texted her about it. She said that she remembers the thing being all black, so either one of us might be right. I'm not really sure what we saw. I know that there have been Goatman sightings out in that area for decades, so... Maybe that was it. If you have any ideas, let me know. This story happened to my cousin who was visiting our grandmother on the Navajo Nation reservation. 
He was what you would call an urban Navajo, born and raised in Phoenix and rarely visited the res. He was raised in the church and was aware of certain Navajo taboos and folklore, but didn't heed or abide by any. He and his older brother used to stay at our grandmother's during the summer to help out with chores and the livestock. They call it sheep camp. However, sheep camp was a summer lodge or cabin in the mountains where you took the sheep during the summer months to graze. Being from the city, I guess they just liked the term sheep camp when in reality, it was just our grandmother's permanent residence. Like most rural residents on the reservation, old automobiles and appliances that no longer worked piled up in the front yard due to a lack of transportation or waste management options. There was an obsolete refrigerator from the 80s on the far left side of my grandma's porch and a broken down muscle car from decades earlier. The car was more of a skeleton, a forgotten remnant, that rested about 30 feet far off to the left in perfect eyeline sight from the porch. The model of the car I cannot remember, but the windows had all been busted out and the upholstery was weathered and cracked. The desert sand had reclaimed most of it. The tires were shredded and half buried. If you grew up on the res, this served as a derelict jungle gym or playground. My mother and I had decided to visit my grandma one afternoon when I was 12 years old, the same age as my cousin. We greeted everyone upon our arrival and our grandma fed us. My cousin asked if I wanted to take a walk to the canyon and told me that he had something to tell me. He seemed urgent about it. As soon as we were out of earshot of any of the adults or his older brother, he told me that something had happened earlier that day at about 5.30 in the morning. Although it was summer, in the Arizona temperate desert, it is easily many degrees colder at night and early in the mornings. He told me that he was awoken by the urge to relieve himself. The sky was dark blue before dawn. He was half asleep and it was too cold to run all the way to the outhouse. There was no indoor plumbing. So he continued to say that he darted to the left to pee behind the old refrigerator and off the porch. His eyes were half closed and his mind was still a bit hazy from just waking up. Then, he hears the distinct sound of something jagged and sharp scratching in long successions on metal, accompanied by the heightened whimpering of a sheepdog. His eyes opened wide, and he tried to scan the horizon to locate the origins of the hurt sheepdog. Initially, he thought he saw the dog trapped in the car, but there were no windows or any glass obstructing the dog's escape from the wreckage. He witnessed the dog clawing and scratching to fight its way out of the window frame of the driver's side. Its front paws were clawing at the outer shell of the driver's door, making the sound of nails on a chalkboard. He finished urinating and dazedly took one step off the porch to help the dog out of the car. Suddenly, he freezes in his tracks. A cold, wicked laugh ripped through the early dawn air. His eyes immediately fixate on where the laugh originated from, also inside the car. He rubs his eyes and focuses his gaze on the dog, and his eyes follow along the dog's torso. Then he sees that something has its arms and claws wrapped around the waist of the dog, preventing it from escaping. At this point, the sun had inched and crept over the mesa and turned the sky from a pale blue to a pale yellow. The pale yellow light revealed that the driver's side of the car was completely covered in smeared blood. He jolts back inside and bolts the door behind him. He doesn't tell anybody because he was paralyzed with fear. Fear that if he talked about it, nothing would stop it from busting through the door and killing him, his brother, and our grandma. I inquired about what it looked like or if he even saw what had been holding the dog against its will. He said it looked like a werewolf, but a sickly one with mange. He noted that it was hairy, but you could see almost dry, cracked, gray skin underneath. He said before he ran, he slouched down to see what was holding the dog inside the car, and whatever it was, grinned. Its wicked smile was filled with sharp, jagged teeth beaming from side to side. 
In all honesty, I thought he was lying to me to try to scare me, thinking I was some dumb, uncivilized rezzer who would believe a werewolf tale. We spent some time in the canyon playing on boulders and throwing rocks into the small stream. I had all forgotten what he shared with me until we made it back to my grandma's house. That's when he asked if I wanted to see the scene of the crime, so to speak. I was skeptical at the time, until we walked up to the car in question. I couldn't believe it. There were tufts of bloody, multicolored dog fur caught in the window frame, and bloody paw prints and smears on the outside of the driver's door. There were long scratch marks from the dog everywhere, not sharp enough to cut through the metal, but enough to make a slight indent. As if the nails were scratching down with so much pressure that the protein from the nails, or whatever they're made of, buckled and gave way, filed down on the metal. I stood there in amazement and fear. All we did was throw dirt on the blood markings, and I haven't spoken of it until right now. Side note, the dog is okay. We spent all late afternoon looking for her. We later found her under an abandoned manufactured home on the property. She was afraid to come out for nearly two weeks, so my cousin said he always brought her food and water for the remainder of summer break. She's okay now, though, fortunately. I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years, and I still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike, with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think that we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large animal, a mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little bit morbid and I like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we had traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a huge boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner Michael slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said that the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed very anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail, 
with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't even look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell reception that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so that he wouldn't have to carry anything, and we made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up, and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we had been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace. But when I checked my watch and saw that we had gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right. But I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we had already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve on the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half a mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no turns. There were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail, and well-maintained, too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phones still didn't have any cell service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, we had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off of his bad foot that we had simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made any sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we had gone too far. We knew that we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, Backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. 
The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have been back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I had just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing that we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine in the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we had hiked nine total miles. At nine and a half miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me, though, because I expected that we would have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along the side of the road for a few more miles. There was simply no way that this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot toward the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion like your legs just won't cooperate and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life that I have ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile in the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking, Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crushes for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my great-grandmother used to collect dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to because of how creepy it was. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. Fast forward to the story at hand. My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room chatting late at night, around 1 a.m. or so. For context, this is a cookie cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There's a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there was the railing overlooking the doorway area, and in front of the railing is a couch. There's also a television sitting on the ground on the wall opposite the couch. During our conversation, we got on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom and leaned it up on the shelf above the fireplace. I made sure that when I put the doll up there, it was leaning securely so as not to slip off. Some things that are important to note. The television was on, but just in the no signal screen. And because we were preparing to move, there were boxes and trash bags piled up in front of the fireplace, at least three to five feet out. We were all sitting on the couch at this time. 
in the middle of a story that my younger stepbrother was telling about an experience he'd had in the basement of a childhood home. The doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a good few feet away from the boxes, meaning that it had to fly a good six to eight feet from the fireplace. At the exact time that the doll made contact with the ground, the television shut itself off and then turned back on. We have never had any electrical issues in that house or with that TV. I know people are going to say that it's possible the doll just fell, but the doll didn't fall. It flew forward off the shelf, even though it had been leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall seven feet to eight feet out. They fall down. So, I don't know but I think we might have a haunted doll on our hands. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to sit down with my grandma and listen to all of her stories happy stories, sad stories, and everything in between. As a kid, my grandma was the best storyteller ever, and she would always be open with me. My favorites were her scary stories, and every one of these stories that she would tell me were true. My family has experienced a lot with the paranormal in the past, and this story is just one of many that makes me believe and respect the supernatural and what's beyond. During one summer, my aunt and uncle in Alabama were planning to make the trip to Michigan and spend some time with us and our other family members up here for a few days. They were planning on driving and wouldn't get in until very late in the night. They were planning on staying with my grandma and grandpa. My grandma was such a sweet and genuine lady who felt that it was her duty to take care of everybody in the family and make sure they were safe at all times and were doing okay. She would normally stay up very late watching her TV shows, so waiting for my aunt and uncle to arrive wasn't a big deal for her. As the night went on, my grandma heard my aunt and uncle at her side door, talking and using their key to get into the house. All of my aunts and uncles and my mom have the key to my grandparents' home, because no matter what you need, my grandparents' home is always open to family. So my grandma went ahead and pretended to be asleep, and let my aunt and uncle get settled in and then surprise them afterwards. But as my aunt and uncle approached the living room to go upstairs to their guest room, something inside my grandma's head told her not to open her eyes. Not because she would ruin the surprise, but because there was something there that she shouldn't see. After a couple of minutes, my grandma got up from the couch and that's when she heard my aunt and uncle's footsteps and my aunt's laughter upstairs so she just decided to go to bed. In the morning, my grandma gets up and begins to prepare breakfast. While she's doing that, she hears and then sees my aunt and uncle arriving through the side door with their luggage. Confused, my grandma asked them if they had stepped out after coming by the house last night. My uncle answered, no. And he told her that they just ended up getting a room at a local hotel since it was late and they didn't want to disturb my grandparents. She then remembered that when she was pretending to be asleep to surprise them, something told her not to open her eyes. My grandma knew then what it could have been and was happy that something inside her told her not to look. Until this day, we still bring up this story and wonder what it could have been that made it seem like my aunt and uncle had arrived that night and were in the house. My grandma has passed, but her stories are always so comforting to bring up and talk about because we know she's still here, watching over and taking care of us. I'm a 39-year-old woman and I had a really strange dream last night. In my dream, when I turned my back, my 10-year-old self was looking at me. I was quite shocked to see her, and I asked, what are you doing here? She didn't say anything and left the room. 
I regretted my reaction and thought, oh, now she would think she wasn't wanted. I had to fix it. I left the room in the hopes of finding her, and there she was, doing her homework in my grandmother's small room. When she noticed me, she smiled at me, and I felt love for her. I just remember thinking, oh, she's alone and trying so much, as always. And then I woke up. When I told the dream to my mother, she told me that I always did my homework in that room when I visited my grandmother's. Somehow, I had no recollection of it until that dream. I know dreams are dreams, but this one just felt like it had a deeper meaning, and I wanted to share. Back in 2004 or 2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time. As I crested this mountain road, I see a van off to the side, doors open, lights on. It's well after midnight and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen Ragtop, down to first gear, looking for a person or people that might be hurt. Not a soul is around, and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all the lights are on, and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, man, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I've got to call the cops. So I proceeded to go toward where I knew I had cell service. I was maybe going 30 miles an hour tops. I knew this situation was dicey, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away. The brush thinned on the roadside, so you had a better view of what was in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking that I don't want to pace a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I honestly couldn't tell it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my ragtop, top down, of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into first and took off. In another mile or so, I would have cell service to call the cops. The dude was obviously hurt, and his grab from my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up and locked the doors. An officer took my statement, and he looked over my car with a flashlight. The guy from the woods had left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van, but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said that they would call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call saying the van was located and they asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently the van was stolen and the cops surmised that this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. This experience has stuck with me, and to this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. So this happened when I was 18. I lived with my parents in a sleepy suburb outside of DC. It's a big three-story house with a left side deck, and the basement outside door is beneath the deck. Going underneath the deck is a granite rock staircase out to our backyard, which is a steep 30-degree slope down a peppy little creek. Now that that's out of the way, it's the summer of my senior year. My parents are out of town for a week 
I leave the Marine Corps in a few months, so naturally I throw a rager. The party was pretty rad. A metal band showed up at some point. Many a gallon of swill was ingested, and it went on late into the night. At around three, there were a few of us left, just hanging out and shooting the shit. Eventually, everyone falls asleep, except for me and my two friends, Heather and Amber. So we go out on the deck, which overlooks the hill and my neighbor's yard, separated from ours by a wooden fence roughly three feet high. They have a rock garden that's tiered with about two feet drop downs for about 20 total feet with a nice pagoda in the middle. They also have a weeping angel style three foot tall statue overlooking the hill a few feet away from the fence. Anyway, we're out there getting lung cancer, smoking, and we keep hearing these footsteps coming up the rock path. It's pitch black, so we can't see who's coming up. And I didn't want to turn on the floodlights because I'm worried I'll wake the neighbors. I whisper down, drive safe, thinking it's someone leaving the party. The footsteps abruptly stop, and I jokingly call out, good night to you too. Around a minute or so passes, and we start getting weirded out, wondering what the fuck that person is doing there, just standing. Amber yells out, Are you okay? No response. So I go inside and grab a flashlight quickly, and shine in below the deck to see what the matter is. There's nobody there. I ask Heather and Amber if they heard them walk off, and they assured me that they hadn't. This is when Heather notices the statue. I said it was pointed down the hill. Well, it's now turned noticeably toward us. Not facing us, but it's clearly been moved. We get real quiet, light up another cigarette, and start talking about how strange all of this is. Now, I spent eight years in the core, and I've seen plenty of funny, creepy, and weird shit since then. But I've never seen anything like I did that night. As we're looking at the statue, it fucking gets turned facing us even more. We all see it, and we start freaking out. Not quietly, I say, what the? And right as I do, we hear loud footsteps on the rock stairs again. Heavy, fast, moving steps. I quickly shine my light down there. For the second time, there's nothing. I shine it over to the statue, and I swear it's been moved another 90 degrees. We then hear squishing, crunching footsteps coming from by the statue. We had a little garden area, maybe eight feet or so, in between the stairs and the neighbor's fence. That's where the footstep sounds are coming from. At this point, we're all scared, but being a guy, and Heather and Amber both being attractive, I exclaim that I'm going to go investigate, to try to calm them down. They say they'll follow right behind me, not wanting to be alone. So we go out the front door and slowly creep our way down the steps. Before we round the corner of the house, we hear the footsteps again, beating feet away from us down the hill. Mind you, there's nowhere to go down there, just fifty or so acres of woods and the creek our house being on the ass end of the cul-de-sac. We get to the spot where we heard the crunching and I shine my light down the hill. Nothing but the trees and their shadows. I shine my light to the fence and the statue is now facing us completely. I start to walk over to the fence, shining my light down so I don't trip. And Heather says, wait, look. I look down and see several massive boot prints. Think shack-sized shoes. They go toward the statue and stop. One of the prints was made around the fucking fence post, like something had stepped through it. Listen, my balls are only so big, so I say run, and we take off back inside and rush upstairs and into my bed, thoroughly freaked out. We stayed there for about 30 minutes, trying to think of how any of that was possible. Nothing came to mind then, and nothing does now. After about another 10 minutes or so, I realized that I didn't lock the door. 
so I go back downstairs into the front door. As I lock it and turn around, I hear a fairly loud bang on the deck, like someone or something hit one of the support columns. I promptly decide fuck the neighbors and turn on all of the floodlights and run back upstairs. We stayed up until the sun began peeking through the trees, talking about what the fuck just happened. It was seriously terrifying. That's the end of that night. The statue was back to its normal place when we went to look in the morning sun, and the footprints were gone. I never had anything else happen in that house. My parents still live there and have never mentioned anything. But to this day, it remains one of the creepiest paranormal events I've ever witnessed. I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits around to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman who always talks way too loud was literally whispering by the end of it and was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it also. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, whom I'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the very first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean the house, ugly house, don't like, scary house mama, don't like. My mom said this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she just chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now, this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and had caused a lot of damage. A lot of that damage wasn't fixed. So my young, broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed that it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed the only fire damage left was in the kitchen since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was absolutely adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. Both my parents have told me that it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with Boss. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back toward the pond, then back to my mom, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and dragged me out of the water himself. 
Thanks, Pupper. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I had gotten into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and the play pens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again, in the yard. She runs up to check on us, Victor is still sleeping. Every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals that I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a little and then race off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. And then he led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began to question me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look only small children can give, that the children had brought me here. Shatting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen get me from upstairs and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they are now. I looked her dead serious in the eye and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs. I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with that serious expression and my mouth closed. She said this same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was a flat impossibility. She says there's no way that I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs past her and two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers are. As I said, it's 30 years later and she's still shaken by it. I have no idea what happened that day. I have thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided that I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I highly doubt that they were children.
The last time that I truly experienced paranormal activity, I was probably eight years old. I am now 25 and unsure of what I'm hearing and seeing. So I guess I'm just looking for opinions. The house that I live in has been in my husband's family for a few years. It's pretty modern, nothing 1800 style or anything. Just a few weeks ago, my husband told me that he started hearing what were clear footsteps late at night in our kitchen and our bedroom. Typically, I'm asleep pretty early, as our two-year-old, let's call her Lucy, shares the bedroom with us for now to save a little bit of space and money. So given that, I was unaware of what was happening. At first, I thought he was joking. A few weeks go by, and out of nowhere, Lucy gets out of bed and stares at the closed bedroom door. She starts to smile and laugh. Then she begins waving, and she says, Mommy, look, it's Daddy. My husband was nowhere in sight. Strange? Yes, but I wanted so badly to believe that maybe she was just playing around. A few hours go by and everybody is asleep except for my husband and I. I go to the bathroom for a moment, and as I'm sitting in there, this powerful gust of cigarette smell came out of nowhere. Nobody in the house smokes. I quickly finished up and proceeded to the bedroom to tell my husband to come and smell it. And by the time I had walked in, and the 10 seconds it took him to get to the kitchen and bathroom, the smell was completely gone, like it was never there. My husband said all he could smell was my hair conditioner. At that point, I think that he thought I was crazy. We went back to the room, and I kept the door cracked and sat down at my computer. As I was looking through the door, I saw and heard our electric trash can open and close when it was completely shut down. We hear footsteps walking away, but there's nobody there. I don't really know how else to describe all the other vibes that I've gotten from this place recently. Are we just going crazy? I think I've started to doubt my own sanity. I'm not really sure what we're going to end up doing. I mean, if it is a ghost, as long as it's not harmful, I guess I don't really see an issue. But the one thing that really got me was that putrid smell. How strong it was. But then how the second I called my husband in, it just disappeared. Without a trace. I just don't know. Okay, I'm an old guy. I'm 60 years old, and this probably happened in 1968 or 69. My parents bought an 1860 Victorian home. It was rather large. We had eight kids, so we needed a big place. My bedroom was upstairs, adjacent to my parents' bedroom, which I hated. The house had a central attic and there was a rear attic too that was part of an addition built before 1900. The only entrance to the attic was a trap door, in my bedroom. My bed was over to the farthest distance to the door in the ceiling, not a pull-down door, more of a heavy wooden rectangular lid that had to be pushed over and sideways to clear the portal. Every night, I would just lay in bed and look at that hatch in the ceiling, and I would start to see it move a little. No noise, just staring at it too long seems to make me see it moving. Like a single light on a ceiling will appear in a dark room. If you look at it for too long, it starts to look like it's moving. So I just thought it was me. I was only in that room for a year or so. I was also a bed rocker. It's a sleep disorder where kids end up asleep on all fours and they rock with head and pillow butt up forwards and backwards. I would rock so hard that the bed would move across the room. I'm sure it freaked my parents out. I did this until I was like 10 years old. 
This was in the 60s. No doctors consulted, no Fs given. One early morning, the light from the sun started illuminating the room. I remember I had woken up and was in that rocking position, and I must have fallen back into my sleep rock trance. Suddenly, something hit my butt, like a medium force slap. I was immediately awake, now lying flat with the sheet over my head. There was a glass panned door in my room and my parents' door just down the hall was squeaky. Plus the oak floors make a lot of noise if anybody's in the hallway. But I hadn't heard a single sound. No doors, no floorboards. I laid under my covers for a good hour or two, breathing heavily. I asked around the house to see if maybe my siblings had been messing with me. They said that they didn't. And my parents had no idea what I was talking about. Really freaked me out. Might have cured my sleeping disorder, who knows. And it motivated me to take a bedroom far away from that hatch in the ceiling. After I did, nothing ever happened again. This is the one strange experience that I've had. I'm not saying that it was a ghost, but whatever it was, it was frightening. I live in a small town in Canada, and my house was built in 2007. Before that, it was farmland. My great-grandmother and her kids immigrated here from Ecuador in the 70s. Throughout my family's bloodline, every woman in the family is believed to have had some kind of sixth sense. My great-grandmother's sister was a powerful medium. My grandmother's older sister is also a medium and reads palms. My mother does tarot readings and informs me on her past experiences with ghosts when she lived in Toronto with my grandmother and great-grandmother. Ever since I was a baby, I've been seeing ghosts everywhere. My grandma told me that I would point to the corner and talk to it like somebody was there. I'm 16 now, and I've been living in this house for the past 15 years. Paranormal experiences have happened to me here for as long as I can remember, so it's just a normal thing now. My mom doesn't encourage me thinking about those things, though. She tells me it's all in my head. A month ago, my dad's parents came up from Texas to renovate our basement. On their last day, my grandpa told me that he thought our basement was haunted because of all the voices he was hearing near the cold room. I told my mom about this, and she lowered her voice and told me that she had lied to me. She had said that it was all in my head, but she'd been telling me that to protect me. It wasn't all in my head, and that I had been seeing ghosts. She used to keep me in her room as a child and pray to God to keep the spirits away from me, because she saw them too. So far, I've noticed one ghost or entity or something that keeps reappearing in different places. I first saw her when I was eight or nine. My cousin and I saw her in my closet. She had pale skin, long blue-black hair, and wore a deep blue dress. The most notable feature is that her nails were painted a shiny metallic blue that glistened in the dark. She held out her hand to us and we ran away. The second time was when I was 11. At the time, I had a loft bed that was up near my ceiling. My bedroom is on the second floor. I was lying in bed after coming home from school and I saw that lady slowly walk by my window. Her nails were still painted that shiny blue. It was the most notable ghost I've ever seen. Ghost in quotations, because I'm not really sure if that's what she is. Apart from that, my younger brother and I, Lex, both saw a glass cup on our table slowly slide over to the other side of it. I always see figures in my room and hear music in the shower drain. My entire family hears people talking in our bedrooms. My brother and I have started to wake up with long scratches all over us. The house was blessed by a priest when it was made, but I don't think it worked. 
or maybe it wore off. I'm getting scared, and I don't know what to do. Update. We had a priest from our local church come to bless our house again, but I don't think it was effective. A few weeks ago, I had the house to myself with my brothers while my parents and grandparents were out. Lex and I were watching TV in the living room when we saw our youngest brother, Michael, age 10, sprint out of the washroom and into the dining room, which isn't visible from where we were. We didn't think anything of it until Michael came out of his bedroom on the second floor to get snacks. We were absolutely terrified and retreated upstairs. Maybe I'm just doomed to live in a house with ghosts. If you like haunted houses, you would love my dad's home. It's a two-story brick home, built by a family back in the 1840s. It was owned by the same family until my dad bought it. There's a rumor that it has a tunnel entrance on the property because of the Underground Railroad. I lived there by myself for several years during college. Dad lived with his girlfriend. Paranormal stuff happened on the daily, so much so that it was just routine. Footsteps throughout the house and going up and down the stairs during the day was typical, but mostly at night and in the early morning. If it was at night, I would usually just turn up the TV. Several times, I was woken up by a man who shouted, Hey! When I'd look around, a man's silhouette could be seen leaning casually against the doorway of my room. I got the feeling that this ghost didn't like me, but I didn't really give a damn and I would just roll back over and go to sleep. Often, I would also wake up to the feeling of my bed shifting, as though somebody had sat down. Once I felt something rub my back, not in a malicious kind of way, more like a motherly way. I'll also experience very strong and sudden aromas. They'll come out of nowhere and last just for a few seconds. Usually it's cigar smoke, my dad and I don't smoke, old ladies perfume, or freshly baked bread. Items would always go missing and then magically reappear in other areas of the house. You never, ever feel alone. You always see somebody just out of the corner of your eye. I had to keep the blinds closed because I kept seeing somebody walk across our front or back porch, but nobody would ever be there. I always got the feeling that if you glanced at the top of the stairway, you would see somebody standing there. Very often I would hear feminine humming. It definitely had tune and inflection. It wasn't our central heating or air conditioning or anything mechanical like that. After a particularly active paranormal night, the next morning there was a random dirty, rusty, handmade nail, about three inches long, laying on its side outside of my bedroom. The only time I felt genuinely scared was when I was playing a video game at about 4 p.m. I heard the front door open and my dad whistled his distinctive whistle. I heard footsteps and keys being placed on the counter. Without looking up from the game, I said, Hey dad, I didn't know you were coming here today. I would have ordered pizza or something. He didn't answer me, and I thought maybe he just didn't hear me. So I paused my game and went into the kitchen. It was totally empty. No keys on the counter, his shoes weren't by the door. The door was locked and his car was not in the driveway. I thought, wow, kind of rude for him to leave so soon. So I called him and said, where'd you go in such a hurry? Dad sounded confused. I haven't left work. I'll be here late tonight. My dad works about an hour and a half away. There's probably more things that I just can't remember right now. My friends have all hated that house and they would never come over. Whenever family comes over, they get weirded out by the vibes, which is strange because most of them don't believe in these things. I grew up in Southern Pennsylvania 
not far from Gettysburg. When I was eight years old, my parents decided to build a house on vacant property, surrounded by fields, and it was beautiful. I lived with both of my parents and my two older brothers, who were 15 and 17 at the time. Though I grew up in the area, we only stayed in this house for four years. My first night there was not what I expected it to be. I was laying in my bed and had just closed my eyes. Then I heard a voice that sounded like a soft whisper about six inches from my face say, help, help, over and over, just repeating the same word until I finally fell asleep. I tried my best to forget about it, because I thought there was no way the house could be haunted. It was brand new. Certainly I was just tired. About a month goes by, and I'm sitting on my bed, doing what I used to love doing most, which was read. I glanced up and looked at my doorway, because I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. At that moment, I had officially seen a full-body apparition of what appeared to be a soldier from the 1800s, but he didn't see me. He was just walking by my room very slowly. I still remember every detail of his appearance 20 years later. He was covered in blood and looked like he'd been shot or stabbed. This lasted for about five seconds. Still being creeped out, my curiosity got the best of me and I walked out of the room and searched all over the house, but I found nothing unusual. About a week or two goes by, and I'm in my bed, trying to fall asleep yet again, only to be disturbed before I even had the chance to close my eyes. This voice was very deep and masculine. I couldn't understand a word it was saying because it was speaking in a different language. It sounded annoyed and angry, it happened every night at the exact same time for two weeks, before it suddenly and inexplicably stopped. After that, I had a night terror. I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I had woken up in the middle of the night, and I could see what looked like a tarantula crawling on me in bed. I swear it was there. I definitely saw it. I was panicking. My dad came in the room to check on me and found that everything was okay. No spider. Before I could fall asleep though, I heard what sounded like two men laughing right next to my bed. At this point, I was getting used to all the messed up things that were happening. One summer, I stayed up late every night so I could watch Hannah Montana at midnight. One night, when the clock struck midnight, I heard my back door downstairs open. Then I would hear a woman say my name as if she was calling for me or looking for me. I'd hear the door shut, followed by footsteps, and then there would be silence. This happened every night for almost two months. It never failed. It didn't even bother me at this point. I knew it wasn't my mother because she worked 12 hour night shifts at the hospital almost every night. There were no other females around, but one night it too stopped altogether. I was up at midnight and nobody had called my name. I went to sleep and everything felt peaceful for once. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my bedroom door. I looked at the clock on my cable box. It was 3 a.m. I assumed that it was one of my brothers and I told them to go away, but then the doorknob started turning but it wouldn't open because the door was locked. I have always slept with my bedroom door open, always, and I definitely wasn't the one who locked it. The knocking and doorknob rattling went on for what felt like forever, and then it stopped. A few minutes later, I hear what sounds like scratching at the door. I think to myself, what the heck, is it my cat? But then the knocking, scratching, and turning of the handle start happening at the exact same time. No way in hell my cat could do all three at once, let alone the knocking and turning of the doorknob. It would happen for about 30 seconds, and then it would stop. It happened at least five times. Sometimes the knocking would be so hard it sounded like pounding, 
and my whole door was shaking. Whatever was on the other side of that door really wanted to come in. It got so bad that it woke my dad up. He heard all of the commotion, and as soon as he opened his bedroom door, it all stopped, instantly. He called out to me, but I was too afraid to say anything. He went back into his room and closed the door, but the same scenario repeated itself three more times. My dad made me sleep in his room. We never spoke about it, ever. Things seemed to be fine for a while. Then whatever was in my house struck again. My brother had gotten up to go to the bathroom. He turned the hallway light on, noticed that my bedroom door was closed as it was across the hall from the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the hallway light is off and my bedroom door was wide open. He looked inside my room and saw me still sleeping. Everyone else in the house was sleeping. He woke my dad and brother and told them what had happened. They searched the house for a possible intruder, but found nothing. More months go by and we are all awoken by our smoke detector going off in the middle of the night. We all go downstairs in a panic just to find out that the stove was on, full blast, big flames on top of the stove, in the middle of the night. What the hell? One day, it was just my father and I. My mom was at work, as usual. My oldest brother was at work, and my other brother was at baseball practice. I'm downstairs, but I hear what sounds like somebody running upstairs. Forgetting that both of my brothers aren't home, I go up the stairs and see somebody run into my brother's room and slam the door. It was loud. I thought for sure it was my brother, and I wanted to go in there and see what he was up to and why he would be running around like that. I opened the door and nobody was there. I watched the door close right in front of me. I felt sick to my stomach just standing there, realizing that the only other person that was home was my father and he was in the shower. I continued to see weird things all the time. One day, in the middle of the day, I saw my German Shepherd run upstairs full blast as if she was chasing something, but I never saw what she was chasing. Whatever it was went under the bed and she was viciously growling at it. At first I thought it was my cat until I saw him sitting on top of the bed it appeared that he had been sleeping until we burst in and woke him up. One night, my cousin was spending the night. We were walking through the living room when she saw the reflection of another person on the glass of our big bookcase. Another time, we were in my backyard, and she told me that she saw somebody looking at us through the window. I guess this happened on a few occasions, but it wasn't anybody we knew. My brothers almost never had friends over, so that was not a possibility. I remember one day I was walking down the basement stairs. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw what looked like another apparition, except the apparition looked exactly like my older brother, but it also didn't look human. It was almost white and blue and his eyes were pure black, like something trying to be him. When he saw me, his eyes got really big and he looked terrified and ran away and went into the crawl space. I ran upstairs to find out that my brother wasn't even home. I never went back down there after that. A few months later, I was with the same brother and we were in the living room watching George Lopez late at night. I'm into the show, but he muted the TV. He looked at me and said, did you hear that? I told him no, I hadn't heard anything. We sat still for a minute, and then I did hear it. Together, we both heard footsteps coming up the basement stairs. My brother grabbed a baseball bat, and we went to the basement to investigate, but to no avail. The rest of our family was sleeping upstairs. The next night, my mom was up late at night sitting at the dining room table, doing whatever it was she was doing. Around 3 a.m., the shelf in the dining room flew off the wall and put a hole in the wall that was adjacent to it. We looked at the nails in the wall that had held the shelf in place, and they were still perfectly straight. We moved out of that house when I was 12. I still experience paranormal things, 
but nothing that comes close to what I dealt with in that house. I believe there were a lot of spirits there, and I'd love to know about what happened there previously to cause so much activity. We were a regular church-going family, so I'm sure if there was anything demonic there, that probably pissed it off even more. But I don't know. What do you think it could have been? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? All of the above? What's your story? Back in the 90s, my parents would often move from house to house. Before I was born and they were pregnant with my sister, they moved into a new house complete with a lake in the backyard. It was pretty old, but still comfy. My parents thought it was all fine until some strange things began to happen. For starters, they said that when taking showers, the radio would often switch to random static noises. The lights would flicker and hair dryers would just shut off suddenly. All right, no big deal. Just an old house. Nothing strange at all. Of course, my parents started speculating some strange things were happening after living in it for a few months. One night, they had some friends over. This picture of a little boy was hanging on the wall, overlooking the living room. My parents joked around and talked about how it was evil or something. Just as they did that, all of the lights turned off as if on cue. One night, both of them were sitting in bed, trying to fall asleep. My mom told me that while sleeping, this weird blowing noise blew right in her ear. She said something like, stop doing that, thinking that it was my dad. He said, I'm not doing anything. They both felt this weird blowing noise in their ear, like right next to their ears. I would honestly be terrified too, then, finally, after having crazy and terrifying experiences, the last thing that happened was their breaking point. When getting home with groceries, the magnets on the fridge were strangely arranged differently than they had been before. Not only that, but while getting all of the bags out of the car, my mom swore that she saw a shadow flash by in the living room. My dad looked over and said that he saw it too. They both called the police thinking it was an intruder, but when the police arrived, they couldn't find anything. They ended up living there only six months. That was the last straw. When they moved out, there were some rumors going around that supposedly somebody had died in that lake behind their yard. When they came back to see the house a little while later, it had been condemned. I first want to talk about the recent experience I had at my house while I was trying to astral project. I was laying down, doing the techniques, when I suddenly hear somebody breathing right next to me and my dog. At first I thought it was my dog, since sometimes he moves around in his sleep. And I think he has nightmares. While I'm hearing the breathing, I look at my dog, but I can hear him breathing and it's a different pattern than the one that was right next to me. My next experience haunts me to this day. I was in bed when my dad and I hear the gate button being pressed. It connects to an iPad. We ran downstairs to investigate since we suspected that it might be the police. We open the app to see that it's a black screen. Peculiar, but it was because of the Wi-Fi. For some extra context, the gate camera will snap a photo of the person who pressed the button to be let in. It took two photos. My dad and I went to the windows to see any lights, but there were none. There was nobody in the photo. The next experiences somewhat relate to each other. This happened when I was walking home from school. I was strolling down my road when I hear someone yell, hey. I turned to see if it was my neighbor, since we have a few houses on the small patch of road. No one was there. I walked next door to see if anybody was home there, but nobody was. The second thing that happened was I was walking in the forest on my property. I was walking on this little trail. 
when I hear snap. Not like a twig. It sounded like a firm finger snap. We have tenants down in the yard, but how they could snap so close to me when no one was there is beyond me. It had to have been somebody standing right next to me. It wasn't an echo or anything like that, but nobody was there. The last experience has given me a wider sense of the paranormal. I was dragging the lawnmower when I hear an old woman's voice say, Hey! I turn to see nobody there, so I keep dragging it. Then I hear, Stop! It was so loud that I dropped everything and had to look. Nobody was there. I want to be honest. We do have a tenant downstairs, but why would she be yelling at me? I kept dragging the mower, and then I heard mumbling, and then the voice disappeared. What's even creepier is that my neighbor's grandmother lived in this house. When she died, I think he just decided it was better off cutting the property in half, sell one side, my house, and then make his house on the other. So, maybe it was her thinking that I was him or not being happy I was in half of her house. In any case, it's definitely been interesting. I bought my first house nine months ago. It's a huge accomplishment for me. On the evening after I closed on the house, I had a little champagne toast in the new place. I invited my boyfriend, my sister, we'll call her Jenna, her four-year-old daughter, we'll call her Mary, my best friend, Aunt T, and my son and brother who live with me. It only lasted an hour or two. I gave everyone the tour, my best friend and Jenna wanted to stop in every room and talk about my plans for it. I ordered pizza. Like I said, we had a small champagne toast. My niece, Mary, had a great time running through the house. She and my sister have a 700 square foot apartment, so my place seemed huge to her. Mary loved my room. I have a closet in my room with a built-in pedestal kind of thing, so we sat her on it and joked that it could be her room. All in all, it was a good time. Everyone who didn't live there headed out at about the same time, starting with Jenna and Mary. It was a school night after all. Not even five minutes after Jenna and Mary left, my sister calls me, still driving home. She sounds shaken, and I was worried for a second that her car had broken down or she got into an accident, but no. Jenna said that she had asked Mary if she'd had a good time and if she liked Aunt Dee, that's me, and my new place. Mary said, yeah, I had fun with Aunt Dee, Aunt T, and the little girl. My sister said she actually pumped the brakes on the car because her instinct was to stop the car in its tracks. The thing is, there were no other children in the house that night, just Mary. Jenna's not trying to scare Mary, but she wants to know more. So very gently, she asks, oh, what little girl? Mary says, the one that was standing behind Aunt Dee all night. My sister presses her a little more and asks Mary what the little girl looks like. Mary says she has long black hair and she had on a pretty blue dress. My sister asked if the little girl had spoken to her. Mary said no, she was really shy, but they had fun chasing each other through the house and the little girl was sitting in her house, AKA my closet, when we opened the door. Mary hesitated to walk into the closet at first and I didn't know why. Now I know. So apparently I have a little ghost girl in my house. She likes my closet and me. My house was built in 1900, so it does have a long history, but I haven't looked into it yet. I haven't heard or seen a thing in this house since I moved in, but I did not sleep well for the first few nights.
Many years ago in the 1980s, my grandfather had a heart attack and needed a quadruple bypass surgery. His surgery took place at a now defunct hospital near downtown Los Angeles. The layout of the hospital grounds is as such. The underground parking garage is floors C to L. There was no level A or B. The first and second floors were underground. The third floor was the actual ground level where visitors entered. Floors four through eight were the hospital proper and looked nearly identical. And the ninth floor was a penthouse floor that served as a long-term waiting room for the family members of patients who have undergone major surgery. Two of the three guest elevators go from parking level L to the eighth floor. The third elevator has the same range, plus it goes to the ninth floor. The ninth floor is where the story takes place. My cousins and I would play in the penthouse with my parents or aunts and uncles keeping watch over us. None of us kids were allowed to visit my grandfather for some reason, so the adults took turns visiting him. It took my grandfather a month to recover from surgery, making the penthouse a home away from home for my cousins and I, until the day that he was discharged from the hospital. There were a number of incidents that took place that I can't explain. It seemed like the adults would choose at random when to visit my grandfather, so when they did, my eight-year-old self felt that it was my responsibility to press the elevator button for them. I did this for them several times, but one time I didn't get the chance to. As I was about to press the button, the elevator door opened right in front of me, but nobody emerged from the elevator. I peered inside without stepping in, but there was nobody there. My aunts and uncles, or parents, I forgot which combination of adults had gone, proceeded to enter the elevator and go down to my grandfather's floor without further incident. This also occurred when we were about to head to the second floor cafeteria for a snack, or were leaving the hospital for the day, with the same results. Someone, or something, clearly wanted to take away my perceived responsibility and sent the elevator to our floor before I could. One incident was very compelling. The very elevator that we needed to take to the penthouse was out of service. We were advised by the front desk to take one of the remaining elevators to the eighth floor and then take the stairs one flight up to the ninth floor. If we wanted to go to lunch, we should go down the same stairs to the eighth floor and take the elevator to the cafeteria. Except for the cardiovascular detour, our day went on without incident until we were about to head home in the evening when visiting hours ended. We had gathered our things and headed for the stairs, when I noticed the door had closed shut, as though someone had just walked through. I ran through the door and stood at the top of the stairs, looking at the handrails through the center of the stairwell and listening for footsteps. Nothing. I did not hear any footsteps or any doors open or close, one of my cousins joined me and looked down the stairwell with me, while one of the adults asked me why I had run into the stairwell like that. I tried to explain that I thought I had seen somebody enter the stairwell. Before I could be interrogated further, the rest of my family entered the stairwell and we made our way to the elevators just one floor down. I'm not sure what this entity or thing was, but it was definitely a strange experience. A couple of years ago, I worked at a hospital as security. Part of the security duties for the second shift was to lock all the doors downstairs in the basement of the hospital. The types of things we had down there ranged from offices to supply rooms, bathrooms, and the morgue. We would also have to check the refrigeration temperature inside the morgue just to make sure that it was running properly. So one night, I go down to the basement, which is basically a large rectangle, locked all of the doors, and just as I was going to make a right to take the stairs up, I noticed somebody walk out of the corner in what looked like blue scrubs and take about five steps into one of the doors that I had locked. 
They didn't open the door, they just walked straight through it. As security, I couldn't just brush this off, because we recently had people steal from the supply room. So I had to check it out, especially since it was after hours. As I walked up to the door, I immediately got goosebumps, because this specific door was one, an automatic locking door that can only be accessed by ID clearance. Two, I didn't see the individual pull out an ID, which you would have to do to get in. You pull out your ID, scan, wait for the green light to pop up, and then open the door. I didn't see any of that. I literally just saw somebody take about five steps into and through the door as though it was wide open, but it wasn't. This door automatically locks and closes itself. So I think to myself, well, if somehow someone accessed the door after hours, they aren't allowed. So this might be the same person that's stealing things. If a nurse or someone needs to go to the supply room, they call security and security escorts them because of these incidents of theft. So I pull out my ID, scan it and open the door. I walked in and of course I saw nobody. Then I opened all the closet doors just to confirm that nobody was hiding. And then I immediately got out of there because I was 100% sure I had just seen a ghost. Later that night, I got a call from the ER department to escort a nurse down to the supply room. I escorted her down to the basement into the supply room and told her what I'd seen. She then shuffled through some boxes in the supply room and pulled out the same exact light blue scrubs that I had seen the ghost wearing, except they weren't scrubs. They were the blue gowns that patients wear inside the hospital. So what I really saw that night was a patient's ghost walking around in the basement. After this experience, I definitely believe in ghosts and the afterlife. Till this day, I kick myself for not checking the cameras that night. A friend of mine worked in a hospital. She called me up one day to talk about strange things that were happening. She worked night security, and during this time, an older part of the hospital was being renovated. She would notice things, like the sound of someone walking behind her, equipment being moved around, the doors opening and closing, doors to patient rooms would jerk open, she was getting scared and asked me to come with her one night. I got permission to walk with her. I saw the doors open and close, and I even heard someone talking in one of the patient rooms. This side of the hospital was closed off. She, I, and one other security guard were the only people there that night. I took a ton of photos and videos. On one of the videos, you can hear footsteps. And, on one video, you could see a door creak open a bit, all on its own. All of that was alright, but this scared the hell out of me. During one of the videos, I could plainly see a figure of a woman walk out from a room. She stood next to the nurse's desk. It was very quick. I was moving my phone from side to side. I didn't see her with my naked eyes, so... I didn't know to pause. She had a bluish tint to her. She had a jacket, a skirt, and kind of a beehive hairdo, and glasses. My friend showed the picture to some of the nurses. A few of the older nurses said it looked like a girl who used to work there, and also died at the hospital. One nurse jumped up. Oh my gosh, that looks just like Maggie. She said that Maggie worked in the hospital in the early 70s and died there from cancer. I wish I still had the pictures and the videos, but my phone was stolen before I could upload them. But my phone was stolen before I could get all the footage off. Either way, it was a pretty terrifying experience, but kind of cool too.
Everything that will be written here is true. It could be misinterpreted, but I'll explain everything as it is. I am 21. When the events that I will tell you here happened, I was around 15 or 16. I was fascinated by abandoned buildings at that time, and the first one that I found that was close to my house was an abandoned hospital. This hospital was firstly built in the early 1900s as a sanatorium, then was bought in the late 1980s by the regional hospital to become a palliative care center. My first visit was the one that started all of the curiosity that I had about this place. In the beginning of the summer, I came to this three-floor hospital. Our first goal was to take pictures of this beautifully decayed place. Everything was fine, until we arrived on the third floor. My friend suddenly started to panic, and, being a bit aggressive, yelled, Let me go out! Let me go out! I first thought that he was doing a joke, but he looked really scared of something. Since I didn't want to leave, I accompanied my friend outside, and then came back inside, alone. I wanted to take pictures of the empty corridors of the third floor. The weird thing is that when I asked him about this a few minutes later, he didn't remember being aggressive or scared. All he knew was that we went outside together and I went back in. I didn't have any particular feeling about the place during the visit. I was just excited because it was my first time in an abandoned building. My second visit was with a different friend. I didn't tell her anything that happened during the last visit. Like the last time, things started to become weird when we arrived on the third floor. I started to feel a little bad, like something was preventing me from breathing correctly. My friend told me a few minutes later that she was having the same weird feeling. We felt scared and didn't want to continue with this oppressive sensation. So we left. The third time, I went to the hospital with a camcorder. I probably did the worst thing ever. Before our second visit together, we watched some paranormal videos on YouTube, and we wanted to get some answers about the third floor. During the whole visit, we asked some questions to the supposed entities that lived in the hospital. We got what we interpreted as an answer in the basement. Since our last visit, things were moved and destroyed, probably by vandals. I asked, did you move anything here? On the video, I could clearly hear, it's not us. The other voice that I recorded was in the church part of the sanatorium. It happened just at the moment we were leaving, a voice whispering, it's the death. The last thing we did this day was to go to one room of the third floor and ask multiple questions and wait for answers while recording everything with a voice recorder, trying to get EVPs. After a few minutes, we saw a shadow moving really fast, and we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps running on broken glass just behind us in the dead end corridor. I immediately ran to the direction of the noise. My friend and I looked everywhere in the hospital, but nobody was there. We ran out and left the area, promising that we would not try to get in contact with those entities again. The following night, I had sleep paralysis, and I don't often experience that. There was a black silhouette staring at me in front of my bed. This might have been a coincidence, but it was quite weird that it happened just after this scary episode. After all those experiences, I returned to the hospital alone after that, a few times actually. Sometimes I didn't have any bad feeling in any part of the hospital and was able to capture every picture that I wanted. Some other times, I had the feeling that I was not welcomed, was oppressed, and didn't have the courage to take the pictures that I had initially planned. As I told you, I was 15 or 16 when all of this happened. 
Now the building is sold and under security. If I had the same experience today, my judgment about the events would probably be different. My theory is the following. The voices we heard on the recordings were probably interpreted because we wanted them to be there. My friend's behavior in the third floor could have just been a strong case of panic. The bad feeling that I had on this floor might be because of the memories of my friend's reaction. My friend having the same feeling that I did is a little weirder. I first thought about something in the air like asbestos, dust, or cracked paint, maybe even mold. But this theory doesn't work, as it was not happening every time I went there. The noises of the person running on cracked glass is still impossible for me to explain. Where did this person or animal go if it was one? All the rooms were opened. The noise was behind us in a dead-end corridor. We saw nobody running, and the noise only lasted a few seconds. What was that shadow behind us then? It wasn't ours. The sleep paralysis that I had after that, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. But maybe it was more. What do you think? Do you think that we encountered something that day? So, my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here, and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos. We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is. Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, Come in! Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again, Come on in! She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there, as she was putting her clothes back on, and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me, that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it. So that was it. She quickly opened it, and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. 
For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom, when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there, just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her co-workers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think. This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I have been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet, and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays, and as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work, so I turned to ask him, but when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down, and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned, and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out. Leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door, I went more slowly this time. And yes, holy crap, he was still there. Now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About ten minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she's walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, oh, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very, I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost, or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while. This is another story from my friend, the church custodian, and from the church that we both attend. My friend David and I were at his graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, 
So we decided to take him to the church that night when we knew that nobody else would be there. We get to the church around 9 p.m., unlock the doors, and go in. All the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we all hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear the footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person. At this point, our friend had decided that he'd gotten enough proof to believe our stories and was ready to leave. We're standing in the parking lot, facing the door, arguing over who's going to have to go back in and turn all the lights off, when all of a sudden there are three very distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery is on the second floor, and on the side of the building that we were facing. That made the decision about turning the lights out a little bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, who's the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated having to go into the nursery while she was alone due to the feelings she got in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up. So my church is haunted but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, and the baptistry, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel into an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell you occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had the key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person, was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I would be interested in joining them. I was. I arrived a few minutes later and went inside. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these were very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder, and he sits it in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path we had just taken over and over. On our second go-round is when we noticed something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek which is when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continued on this path maybe three to four more times. Each time, the broom had been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it's been long enough, so we go to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording, 
when we finally realized how stupid of an idea it was, because there was no way to tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that was coming from just a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, and then one more tap even closer. Finally, we hear a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway altogether. And two, there's a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us. And that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway is a wet paper towel. This is one of my many experiences at St. Thomas Church. This one was about eight years ago, probably not that scary compared to other things that I've experienced, but it was the first one that popped into my head. I went to a graveyard that had a church with four of my friends. One of my friends knew about it as he had come once before. The rest of us had never been. Now, my intention was to go there to see if I could genuinely talk to any spirits because of past experiences. Two of my friends, however, were the usual let's have a laugh and mock the dead type, while the other two were shitting themselves, as you do. We walked around for about 15 minutes and I was asking questions like, is anyone here that wants to talk? But it was hard with my two friends acting like idiots. So I just thought, okay, this is silly. I'll just stop. Now, just to be clear, two of the cars we took were right next to each other, about half a meter apart, with the big gates to the right of the cars, which is where you enter straight into the graveyard. We walked back to the cars, and I leaned against one car, and one friend next to me, on my left, and the other three leaned against the other car. Now we're all facing each other, just talking, when suddenly from the right of us, we hear this voice, almost like a child's voice, say, help me. I am not kidding. My friends and I all looked right in the same direction at the same time. All of our heads just turned, and we all went silent, giving each other that look like, what's going on? I said quietly to all of them, you heard that, right? Their faces said it all. Then about 30 seconds later, we heard it again. Help me. But it was a little bit fainter. My friends started to panic, and I was a little scared, but more curious. They opened their car doors so fast it wasn't funny. I don't blame them. I hopped in the back of my mate's car, the one that I was leaning on, and her car wouldn't start straight away. I looked out the window and my two mates in the other car had already sped off. I was trying to calm my friends down, who I was in the car with, but after about a minute the car started and my friend who was driving sped off screaming, I'm never coming back here again, while my friend in the passenger seat agreed. When we were off the road that leads to the graveyard, she slowed down and I pulled my phone out to see if I could find anything about this graveyard as I had never been before. I found out that there were two young twin brothers who used to play around there at the church and attend with their family. One day they were playing and tried to play a prank. Something went wrong and they both caught fire and burned to death. I swear that voice we heard sounded exactly like a young boy's voice. It creeped me out. I told my friends and they agreed. They also said that they would never go back there and I can't blame them. Personally, I've been back four times now, 
and something has happened every time. A few friends and I decided to book a small getaway up north for a week or so. We settled on a lovely converted church in the middle of nowhere, next to a small river near the sea. After a couple hours of driving to the place, we finally arrived and were faced with a small converted old church. It was beautiful, and we were sure we were going to have a great time. We opened the door and started to settle in. There was a log stove in the corner, and with it being September in Scotland, it was kind of chilly. I made sure that it was lit consistently. We cracked open some drinks and put on some music. Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast to be exact, but we never thought of the connection to the church. So we had our drinks and a great night. I had fallen asleep on the sofa, and I woke up through the night, but had this strange feeling of somebody watching me. I shrugged it off, thinking that it was just because of the strange surroundings, and that I was probably just uncomfortable in a new place. The next morning I woke up and decided to do all the dishes. While I was washing up, my friend came through and sat on the sofa. I had a dinner plate and a side plate in my hands, and turned around to put them on the counter. As I turned away, I saw the plates slide along the counter and nearly fall off. As you would expect, I grabbed them, but as I did, I felt some kind of energy push back at me. It was the weirdest feeling, kind of like being electrocuted but without the pain. I dropped the plates and stepped back in panic as my friend said, Are you okay? I just said, Yeah, I'm fine, because I didn't want to seem silly. What I realized, though, after it happened, was that I was wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Most of the things that happened seemed to happen in connection with that band or something similar. My other friend came through then and remarked how cold it was in the room, which was strange because, as I mentioned before, I had the log burner stove going all the time. Again, I said nothing. A few days passed, and on the last night, my friend was tidying up as we were all in bed. We heard footsteps upstairs, but we thought it was just him, until we realized that he was washing dishes and hadn't been upstairs all night. It was a crazy week, and some other things happened, but those were the most serious. I work at a prison, and a large part of my job is to walk around the prison. I go from building to building, assisting the counselors with various things. My office is a cell on the living quarters of the inmates, so I'm used to seeing and hearing all kinds of crap every day. I went into the academic building, where the inmates can attend classes, to report to my supervisor's office and turn in some paperwork. Imagine a small school building that's only one floor, and basically is just a straight hallway with classrooms staggered on either side, along with some offices. Halfway down the hall is a security bubble where they check passes and supervise the area. I walk by and I have a quick banter session with the COs on duty and a coworker, we'll call her Mary, that informed me that she was going to work in my office because her computer wasn't working. I head down to the other end of the school to the room that I needed. It's on the complete opposite end from the entrance of the building. I enter the office, closing the door behind me. It has a shatterproof window inset into it, and a similar window next to it. I say hello to the four women that work there, and sit at the table that's just a few feet away from the doorway, facing the door, and I begin to sort some papers. If you work in a prison, you'll learn to never be comfortable with your back to a door. I begin thinking about my interaction with Mary, when all of a sudden I feel weird and I have this sudden urge to look out the window in front of me. 
It was like I knew something bad was going to happen. I look anyway, and I see this woman. She looks kind of faded and gray. I couldn't tell what she was wearing because I looked away so fast, but she had this untamed, dark, frizzy, curly hair and very light skin. She was looking at me through the window. After looking away, I had goosebumps and I felt cold sweat, but I forced myself to casually look back and I saw nothing. The correction center is all male now, but has also been a women's facility and a mentally ill children's facility in the past. I have seen things before, but not in years, and not with this strong of a terrifying feeling. I'm used to being on guard all day for safety reasons, but this really threw me for a loop. I have a lot of stories, but this story happened when I was standing up, not in bed, and with a friend who also experienced this with me. So I wasn't asleep, and I have a witness. This happened in Pennsylvania, in the Allegheny National Forest in 2009 to 2010. I don't remember which. It was when the National Rainbow Gathering was there. I was hitchhiking the East Coast at the time and made my way there. I ran into a buddy I had met in Florida a few months before, and she was there with a friend, so they kind of adopted me and I camped with them. Anna and I decided to go camp alongside the main trail to get away from all the thousands of hippies. The main trail goes up from a camp, the parking lot, to the main circle in the heart of the gathering, and it's a couple mile trek. So we were out there alone besides the main trail traffic. It was dusk, and we were having a heavy talk about spirituality and whatnot, when we decided to go down to the main circle and get some food. We were standing up, and I began to stomp out the little twig fire that we had, when Anna said, Do you hear that? I stopped and listened. It sounded like somebody walking in the forest toward us. At this same moment, some people on the main trail had stopped and were smoking cigarettes and talking amongst themselves, oblivious to us. Anna and I listened to these footsteps quickly moving into view, but we could see nothing. We could also see that they weren't coming from the other people. The footsteps kept going and there was just nothing there. My mind was misfiring, trying to figure it out we could actually see the footfalls of twigs snapping and leaves moving. Whatever it was went right up to these people on the trail and seemed to slow its pace, like it was checking them out. They were completely oblivious to this, talking to each other in a circle. Then it just came right up to me and to Anna and slowed down like it was checking us out. I wasn't really scared, I was just super confused, frozen to the spot. The entire time Anna was fumbling with a keychain she had with a million things attached to it. And she finally found this little flashlight. She shone it and said, hey. Whatever this was, it was feet away from me. And then it bounded off up the hill very fast. If I had wanted to run after it, I couldn't have. It was so fast. The steps became like machine gun steps. Anna and I took off down the hill in a total panic. To me, it almost sounded like a child speed walking away when they get caught, if that makes sense. The steps were short, but fast, almost robotic or like an insect. Anna refused to speak about this after. She was so freaked out. I had to go back up alone and pack up the camp and move it. We're not really sure what it was. Maybe an elf or a fairy or some kind of forest spirit. But it definitely rattled us.
I am located in the twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. There is generally a culture of supernatural entities and folklore that is present in everyone that lives in the country. I've always encountered ghosts periodically in my life, but two days ago I saw something that really disturbed me. I was by myself in my kitchen window at around 2.30 a.m. I live in a three-story apartment building, and I live on the third floor. Located just outside my window, about 150 meters away, is a church that is also three stories, with the bottom level being the church, and the other parascending levels seem like a house. I was looking out of my window, onto the windows of the church, when I saw the silhouette of what seemed to be a man on the top level of the church. I began to peer at this thing, and upon staring at it, it moved from facing west and slowly turned south, staring directly at me. Then, suddenly, it backed up and seemed to materialize into the wall behind it, like it melded into it. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I saw. I have no thoughts on what it might be. I'm also getting nightmares frequently these days. I don't know if they're connected or not. I come from a remote island called Rendova, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another one called Tetepare. The story of Tetepare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like the villagers fled the island to come to neighboring islands such as my own, here we are a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it is known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. If you are looking for cool remote places to travel, I highly recommend it. The interesting part of Tetapare for me was, why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in those days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals that are easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness and people were dropping like flies left and right. So, the villagers fled to get away from the sickness. However, the island is known to be very big. So, realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the island. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight, a war canoe from my island Rendova arrived on Tetepare to fight. However, upon arrival they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetepare people were gone. To leave so hastily, and to not even properly bury your dead, is a really weird thing. Because it was back in those days, the first thought was that a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against better judgment. In due time, they also fled, because the spirit that had decimated the population of the Tetepare people apparently attacked the newly set upon villagers there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologes the tourists come to visit at. Now in the present day, we go to Tetepare to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious because it is believed that the island is still extremely wild, and because of the lack of humans, that spirits run amuck there. I have some weird stories about going hunting there, but in any case, Tetepare is a completely mysterious island. These events took place in British Columbia in the summer of 2018. 
June and July to be precise. The events that I'm going to describe took place in two different locations. The first occurrence was by Gold River, near the Mawachat First Nation. The second was by Cathedral Grove. My buddy and I were spending the summer on the island. We were staying in Royston, where we both work. We decided to go spend a weekend in the wilderness. We planned to go rock climbing all day by Gold River, and in the evening, find a quiet spot to stargaze. The first part of the day was uneventful, beautiful, and sunny. We decided to camp by Gold River Boat Launch. For those unfamiliar, it's at a dead end. The only way to go farther is to take a ferry. There's nothing around except trees, valleys, the sea, and an abandoned little parking lot, which nature has slowly taken over. The only civilization nearby is right across our improvised camping spot, the First Nation of Mawachat. We went to bed at about 2 a.m. It was a perfect night. Not a sound, not a cloud, and a lot of stars. It was beautiful. Now here comes the interesting part. Not long after we went into our sleeping bag in the tent, we heard the distinct noise of monkeys. Literally, it sounded like chimpanzees, like we were at the zoo. We both heard it, and it was loud and distinct. It gave us goosebumps. We knew it was impossible because there's no such thing around there. We tried to rationalize it. Initially, we thought it could have been birds we weren't used to, or some small animals, maybe. The sound repeated itself about three times, and then nothing. Everything returned to its quiet state. We've talked to a few locals who'd been staying on the island for a long time about the incident, and we couldn't get a straight answer. About a month later, we went to Cathedral Grove and spent an afternoon there with friends. By the end of the evening, around 7 p.m., we heard the same weird chimpanzee sounds. It seemed like the sound was following us. It went on a few times again and then went quiet. We got kind of creeped out and we left. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced something similar, but it was certainly interesting. Just to give you an idea of who I am, I am a 13-year-old, able-minded girl. I've never been suspected of any sort of mental illness, and I have no medical problems other than asthma and tinnitus. I was born in Arizona. I currently live on a very small Caribbean island that I will not be sharing the name of for privacy reasons. I am a science-based individual. Last night at about 10 p.m., it got really windy all of a sudden, which was odd considering that it hadn't been stormy at all. When I looked out at the ocean, it was flat, smooth as silk. I decided to ignore what my gut was telling me, and my father and I went outside. What I saw will stick with me for the rest of my life, however much longer that will be, which, due to what I've seen, I don't think will be much longer. We saw three red lights in the sky, at the top of the mountain. Of course, because of how stubborn my father is, he told me that it was probably some kind of military craft, Dutch marines or something. But once we went back inside and told my mother, she believed a portion to each of our stories. My father, who believed it was just the military doing some sort of training, and me, who believed it was a UFO, of the words true nature that is, simply an unidentified flying object. Whether it was from another country or another world, I wasn't sure. And my mother, well, she believes that it was some kind of government spy or experiment sort of thing. I found my mother's estimate more likely than my father's, until about 30 minutes ago. I saw someone, well, something. I'm not sure what it is or was. It was on top of one of the flat points on the mountain. Subsequent to us seeing the lights up on the mountain, I asked my friend if she saw the lights too. She said that she did. 
We're planning on hiking the trail that goes around the island to check it out. We're thinking about waiting until something more major happens until we investigate the situation, in the off chance that my father is correct. Update number one, May 26th of 2020. Today I was hiking for one of my school clubs, and I saw some blood on the trail. Maybe goat blood? I'm not sure what the blood was from, but I have a feeling that it's related to that thing I saw in the sky. Update number two, May 27th, 2020. I just found out that three goats that are on a Caribbean goat farm sort of thing are missing. I think that something is eating them. Update number three, May 31st, 2020. I spoke to an archaeologist here because I wanted another adult's opinion. He told me that there is a certain legend on certain islands that every 177 years, red lights will appear in the sky or mountain, and things emerge from the mountain and will eat and drink and do all that they need to do to survive. He said if they're real, they're more like demons or spirits and won't go away until they're stopped but they can only be stopped and seen and interacted with by certain groups of people of their choice. It seems that they have chosen teenagers to fight them off. I hope this doesn't end bad for us. I can only hope. Update number four, June 1st, 2020. Today at around eight, I was sitting in my room doing homework and I heard a tapping sort of sound, like something was on my roof. All of a sudden, I heard a screeching sound, and the tapping was over. I was too scared to go outside and look. Final update, June 2nd, 2020. Today I went hiking for my school group, and two of my friends walked up past the part of the trail where we were supposed to stop at. When we were all walking back down, one told me that she saw a dark-skinned woman, like a native or Hispanic woman but on the darker side, hiding in the bushes. She said that she didn't recognize this woman, which they would have if they were a local. Our airport and the ferries are all shut down, so nobody can get on the island. And my other friend told me that when he walked up, he heard a voice speaking almost in a whisper, and what he thought sounded like a native language to the Caribbean. I found a pile and shrine and altar sort of thing slightly off the trail, and we all agreed not to tell anybody just for the sake of convenience. We're keeping in close contact on WhatsApp and Snapchat. If anybody knows what's going on or has any suggestions or ideas, please let me know. My girlfriend and I went camping this summer on Mears Island. We didn't know too much about the island, aside from the fact that it has some of the best old-growth forests in British Columbia, and that there's the campground and hostel and a small village there. When we got there, we went exploring and felt fine checking out the abandoned cars and rotting docks, as well as going inland along the waterways. We decided to go check out the lake around dusk, since we were told that there was a boardwalk and a boat available for use. As we walked there in high spirits, we listened to the birds. It was a quick walk, only 15 to 20 minutes from the campsite. Once we hit the lake, the atmosphere changed, however. All animal noises ceased. It was complete silence. It was very eerie. At the time, nobody vocalized anything, but my girlfriend and I later discussed the experience and both agreed that we felt uneasy and in danger. We were with a third who I didn't ask the feelings of. I didn't feel comfortable going out on the boat, so I stayed on the dock. My girlfriend and the third person with us went out for a few minutes but felt too creeped out and paddled back quickly. Nighttime had fallen and we decided that it was time to head back to camp since I know silence generally equals predators. We quickly walked back 
and once we passed the threshold of where we had originally stopped hearing all the noises, animals and birds could be heard in the distance. It was a quiet walk back as we were intent to listen for anything behind us. I know it doesn't sound very scary or eventful. I figured it was probably a black bear or a cougar, but I've encountered those before, and I've never felt threatened by one, particularly not in advance. Cougars could definitely be the reason, though. They said that the big cats stay farther away than that. I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that today, I learned that the island is a Bigfoot sighting hotspot, and has a good deal of First Nations lore about wild men and Sasquatch, and the thought creeped me out. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience of not really encountering anything, but feeling like you're on the verge? So, I'm doing this challenge this year where I'm hiking at a new location every week. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood, and so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail, deep in the woods. It's Tuesday, around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming. First, a white furry animal to my left, then a large black shadow, about knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he just said, Oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, and he sees a person ahead. But there's no one there. At least I didn't see it. We brush it off. Whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us. And when he looks again, he can't see the person either. We move on. And then, all of a sudden, the air around us starts to feel super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight and there's pressure in the air. We both started hearing voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming that it was a campsite because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees and literally no one is there, no campsite either. We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers and kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we had stepped through a dark curtain or portal of some sort, because when we passed that little river and creek, everything felt lighter. The weight was lifted off our chests, and we had to stop and breathe and kind of reassess what had just happened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but it was definitely odd. I live in upstate New York, and my town has a wooded area that's known to be haunted. We have something in there that all the locals call the werewolf. No one knows what it really is, and bigger animals like wolves and bears don't really live in the area. We just have deer and other smaller animals. But a few of my friends and I have experienced it before, and all our experiences have been practically identical. I don't think it's flesh and blood, but it's huge and darker than dark. As in, when it's pitch black outside, you can still see its outline. My last experience with it was two years ago. It was during the summer, and a friend and I decided to take a walk through the woods. We didn't leave early enough, though, and by the time the sun had set, we still had about a half a mile walk out of the area. The closer we got to the tree line, noises started picking up. First it was twigs breaking behind us. Then it sounded like a huge branch had been ripped off a tree and thrown. My friend and I stopped and turned around, and we saw what looked to be a massive black shadow move behind a tree. My friend screamed and took off, 
so of course I followed. After running down the little embankment to the tree line, we stopped to catch our breath, and I turned on my phone flashlight so we could see properly. My friend opened her mouth to say something, but then twigs started snapping around us again. She grabbed my arm, and we both stopped breathing practically, probably out of fear. The snapping twig sounds kept getting closer and closer, so I shined the light into the trees. I saw, dead on, a black mass or shadow move to the right out of the beam of light. And then we heard a low, guttural growl just a few feet behind us. We both screamed and started sprinting, finally getting out of the woods. We ran to her car and jumped in, slamming the doors shut, gasping for air. We looked behind us to see if anything had followed, but we didn't see anything, thankfully. That's it, really. But all the stories I know of people who have experienced the werewolf all say practically the same thing. It's a massive shadow that stalks you. You can hear and see it trailing you. It growls, and it chases you to the tree line where it then seemingly backs off. Could it be a wolf or a bear? Sure, I guess but I've lived here my entire life. And in almost three decades, my town has never once sighted a wolf or bear in the area. So, who knows? Not too long ago, maybe four years, I was walking with my family on this trail. We did this often just as a family activity, and this time we decided to walk along a new trail. After we walked for a bit, my father saw some rubble in the distance and said we should go check it out. We walked up to it, and it appeared to be stone buildings, very decayed and barely intact. Just half of one of each walls was standing, Enough to tell what the building could have been, but nowhere near an intact structure. But then off in the distance a little bit, I noticed a staircase. The same type of stone, but somehow completely different. This staircase looked as though it hadn't aged at all. Completely disregarding this, I stepped on them and I walked up to the top. I looked around and saw nothing else. I told my father to come up but he said that I should come down. And then I remember feeling this weird feeling. I was filled with dread mingled with a feeling of being lost. I came down and we walked a little bit more before leaving. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned this to my friends and they insisted that we go to check it out. I brought them to the ruins, but they were gone. I know I went to the exact spot but it was like they never existed. I am a 20-year-old male, and my buddies and I enjoy late-night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region. We live in southwestern Ontario. Late last week, we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge, this area has a deeply rooted history with the Underground Railroad, indigenous people, as well as the War of 1812. If I'm not mistaken, it's because of its proximity to Lake Erie. At least that's what I've heard. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m. And immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling after walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened until we reached two bent trees in an X over the path. One of my buddies pointed out the fact that it was, quote, bad juju to go underneath and we should just call it a night. We all felt watched, so we thought it was probably a good idea. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter we all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. 
There's no way that anybody could have been out there at that hour. There's no homes in close enough proximity for someone to just be out and about. We all ran, and I was honestly terrified. My friends and I are all relatively big guys, and we're pretty comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running. There was also this faint, unpleasant odor, kind of like rotting eggs as we left the forest, and it wasn't present when we initially entered. I don't know if that's related, but we just noticed it. Either way, weird night. I am half Japanese, female, living in Japan and working as a translator interpreter. A few years ago, I got hired for an awesome project as an interpreter for a producer and an award-winning director for a movie that was to be filmed in Okinawa. The movie didn't come through because there weren't enough sponsors though. Anyway, we got flown to Okinawa and I was excited on so many accounts Plus, it was my first time to Okinawa. Everything was amazing. The friendly and warm Okinawan people, the food, the weather, and the beautiful beaches, until we reached the resort hotel. Three key team members, including myself, were on the same floor. Our rooms were side by side. I remember as I walked up to my room door, I felt like something was off. I knocked firmly three times on the door, something I was always told to do by my father who has traveled around the world for work. As I opened the door to the room, about six feet away, I see an apparition of a lady standing there looking at me. I thought, well shit, but I had no choice, I'm here for work. She looked like a Japanese lady in her 20s or 30s, with long dark hair. It was kinda neat. She was wearing a long, light-colored, bluish-white dress, with some sort of a faint floral print, as though it had faded with time. She also looked darkish overall, energy-wise, like there was a slight dark gray mist surrounding her or emanating from her. I stood at the entrance and spoke politely in Japanese. Hello, excuse me. I am not here to disturb your peace or your space. I am here just for three days for work, and I will leave after that. Thank you for understanding. I bowed deeply before entering. It seemed as though she understood me and mostly left me alone, although she barely leaves the spot she was standing in and just watches me whenever I am in the room. Each time I have to enter or leave the room, or have to go to the kitchenette or the toilet and bath areas, I would have to walk by her. My best friend was in between jobs then, and whenever I was back in the hotel room, she would spend the entire time on the phone with me so that I was less afraid, since being on the phone means I'm distracted from the lady who was always looking at me. I could feel her watching me, even as I showered so I had to have my best friend on speakerphone while I did so. The kitchenette area near where she usually stands is also colder than the rest of the room, even though the air conditioning isn't there. I was really grateful that it was quite a spacious room, enough for four people. There were two beds and two futons for the tatami area, so this gives me some space between me and the staring lady. I slept with the lights and TV on, but at around 2 to 3 a.m., I would just wake up in shock, and that's because she had come close to me to watch me sleep. It happened every night that I was there. I got the feeling that she was just curious about somebody who could see her, but nonetheless, it was quite a nerve-wracking experience. Before I left, I bowed to her again and thanked her for sharing her space. I don't think I will forget that work trip anytime soon.
Just a little info on where I lived in Japan. I lived on a small island south of mainland Japan called Okinawa. My dad is in the military, and the entire island is haunted, mainly the military bases, including the housing. I'm only going to mention the strange encounters that I personally had, but my entire family has stories from our time there. One night around two to three in the morning, I had randomly woken up on the couch. My brother and I often fell asleep in the living room on weekends. It was pitch black, my phone had died, I couldn't find the remote, and I was terrified. I sat in the darkness for a bit, waiting for my phone to charge. I heard this loud thud, like something plastic had been dropped from the ceiling, but I could never identify the source. Another thing that happened was one of the most terrifying things. My parents and brother were going out. My parents were shopping and my brother was visiting friends, meaning that I would be home alone. Before they left, I would hear the chairs at the table move around. We had faux wood floors. I went downstairs to check it out, but everything was the same, so I brushed it off like it was nothing. Then I was sitting on the couch, and I had this really strange feeling that something just wasn't right. I looked into the doorway to our kitchen. You can see the laundry room and the recycling bins from there. And a figure moved from the laundry room to the doorway three times. I was scared out of my mind. I started crying and I called my friend because my parents weren't answering. Then, about ten feet in front of me, I see a figure with no legs glide across the room and disappear. Finally. I still can't explain how this one happened. I was in my room and my bed was pushed against the wall. I had a window on this wall and I had a shelf two to three feet above my headboard. On this shelf, I had a lot of knickknacks like figurines and stuff, but I also had this cross stitch that my mom did when she was little, sitting on the shelf, being held up by two Funko Pop figurines. Thursday morning at around 3 to 4 a.m., I heard this loud bang that woke me up. It was loud enough to wake up my mom as well. She came into my room and asked what the noise was from, and I shrugged my shoulders and went back to sleep. That morning, I found out that it was the cross stitch from my shelf. It had slammed against my wall at the end of my bed. It didn't fall because the Funko figurines were still standing and it would have hit my head. I was in the armed forces in my younger years and my first duty location was in Okinawa, Japan. I was stationed in Kadena and was living in the dorms, barracks for army personnel. Anyway, we all had our own rooms at the time, but each room was linked to another through a shared bathroom. You could lock your room from your bathroom door for added security. My bathroom mate was a tall black dude. For the sake of the story, we'll call him B. I was asleep one night and I awoke with a feeling of somebody watching me. I look near the foot of my bed and I see this tall, dark figure. I was super groggy, possibly hungover, but I just remember saying, B, get the F out of my room, you weirdo, and I proceeded to fall right back asleep. I awoke the next morning and I go through my routine for work, when I realized that my bathroom door was still locked, from my side. Weird. I brushed it off and I went to B's shop during the day to look for him and ask him about the night prior. I talked to his shop lead and was told that B was temporary duty for about two weeks and has been gone for a couple of days now. Essentially, he was on a business trip. I have never felt the same in my room since that night and I only told a few people this story. Okinawa is extremely haunted since there was so much history during World War II and before. As a bonus, I told B about it when he got back, and he laughed at me, 
saying that perhaps I was the weirdo. I also don't remember any strange feelings when that figure was at my bed, except for the feeling of being watched, which is what woke me up in the first place. I had other stories that happened to me while I was there, but suffice it to say that Okinawa is definitely haunted. Cryptozoology is the study of unknown animals, along with plants, that have not yet been accepted by science to exist or be real. In some cases, cryptozoologists research accounts involving large carnivorous plants, consuming animals, and even human beings. What would you do if you encountered a tree starving for human blood, spawned not from nature, but by a supernatural force? In Japan, legends warn of such a vampiric plant, called the Juboko. Japanese folklore labeled demons, monsters, spirits, and other malevolent forces as yokai. A few of these supernatural entities resulted in a human, animal, or even a household transforming after experiencing some traumatic or violent event. Not surprising to discover legends about plants manifesting into yokai that feed upon humans, like the jiboko. In myth, this creature was once a tree within a battlefield, whose roots absorbed vast amounts of blood soaked in from the soil, from dead warriors, giving birth to a monster. Jiboko appears as any other ordinary tree in the forest, waiting for an unsuspecting victim. Only the few observant may be warned to the unusual jagged branches or the several bones poking through the roots. Many fail to notice these features and fall victim to the tree once close enough. The branches would grab the prey and hoist them up the center of the tree. The victim would have their veins and arteries stabbed by the branches as the juboko sucks out all the blood. The corpse would either remain hanging or lowered to the ground for animals and other scavengers to feed upon until bones were littered around the roots. Often, Juboko thirsts for human blood, but will consume large animals when people but will consume large animals when people are not available. Many Japanese legends of yokai will refer to ways of defeating them. Juboko may be a demon but it still has the same vulnerabilities of a plant. Some stories told of chopping the tree down while fighting off its branches or setting fire to it until ashes remained. Just to note though, myths do mention a juboko branch can heal wounds and cure ailments. My friend came to me with this story yesterday. She works at a nursing home, often at night. Just the other night, someone called 911 from inside the home. The staff did not know that this occurred until the EMT arrived. They relayed the information that an elderly woman had called. She said that she was scared because nobody was around and she couldn't find the staff, also adding that she felt lost and scared which they assumed to be a sign of her dementia. After investigating all of the cameras around the facility, not a single soul was awake at this time of night. It was around 2 a.m. They tracked the phone call. When they did, they traced it to a phone which was off the hook in a room of a woman who had passed away around a week earlier and had a close personal connection with my friend. She spooked to say the least and it's awfully sad that the soul is apparently stuck in some sort of limbo.
I worked as an EMT for one of the busiest cities when it comes to 911. It was a beautiful summer day and everyone was at the beach enjoying the sun. Tones drop and we get to our rig to see that we're responding to a potential infant drowning. We get to the scene and find PD performing CPR. We take over and start doing everything we can. I get this weird feeling to look up mid-compression and I see the little girl that I'm performing CPR on standing there three feet away from me. She doesn't say anything, but I get a feeling, a calmness, one that tells me everything is going to be okay. We get pulses back for a minute, then lose them. By that time, the fire engine shows up and we load and go. Fire driving the rig, my partner, a fire medic, and I in the back doing everything we can to save this girl. We get to Children's Hospital and all three of us are too invested at this point to just offload and go, so we stay and fight the battle with the ER team. It was the moment I chose to leave EMS. We lost her. My heart sank. How could I get a fleeting feeling of hope and then lose her? I took it personally to deliver the news to her parents. I broke down and cried with them, holding them and telling them I was sorry. I get back to the rig after what seems like an eternity, and in the back, in the airway seat, I see the little girl, just sitting and smiling. I don't know, I got that calmness all over again, like she was telling me it was okay. Fast forward about a year. I will admit that I have had paranormal activity happen around me in my personal life, like seeing the same ghost since I was 10, seeing backpacks fly off of countertops, water glasses full being thrown to the ground when there's no breeze. But this whole past year, whenever I'm stressed or I need calmness, she comes and shows up and calms me. I still deal with the fact that I couldn't save her. She was my hardest no-save, but I think I gained a guardian angel in her no matter how crazy that might sound. So this happened when I was about 14 years old. My house is not haunted and never was, but I'm sure that in the first years after we moved in, when I was about nine years old, there was a harmless spirit that still lingered around at the time. I was in our second bathroom washing my hands, and after I finished and wiped them with a cloth, I looked in the mirror. I had no expression on my face. I was just looking at myself in the mirror, but my reflection tilted its head to the right and gave me a big smile while looking directly into my eyes. I am completely sure that I did not smile or tilt my head when I saw that. My expression must have changed to pure horror, but the face in the mirror didn't. I ran out of the bathroom, but I noticed that my reflection just sort of stayed there. It didn't run along with me. This has never happened to me before or after, but it still has me thinking why this happened and how it's even possible. Maybe I don't want to know. So my mom has this full stand mirror that my grandpa made for her when she was a teen. She's had it basically forever and is super attached to it. I, on the other hand, am terrified of it and hate being anywhere near it. I often have unexplained experiences involving this mirror, like seeing things in it, dark, heavy feelings in the room that just sort of sit in the mirror. Well, recently, I had a baby, and he's nine months old now, crawling, learning, all that stuff the babies do. My mom lets me come over to take naps in her room while she watches my little one, which helps a lot. Except that her mirror is in her room. The first time I took her up on the offer, I had a dream about a little girl ghost that kept showing herself to me, and then running away. 
I awoke all groggy and weird, and very drained. I couldn't really explain why I was dreaming about her, if she was real or just my imagination. Eventually, I just said whatever and left it at that. The second time, not much happened other than the fact that I just could not wake up. My body felt like a ton of bricks, and my limbs wouldn't follow any directions that my brain sent their way. I got up at some point, but only because I could hear my son downstairs crying. The last time was craziest of all. No dreams, I slept only an hour and a half, and everything that happened was just crazy to me. The ghostly activity actually started before I went to nap. I had taken my son upstairs to nap in his playpen, which is placed right in front of that mirror, and when I laid him down and stood up to leave, I heard whispering, but I couldn't make out any of the words. I shrugged it off and then went back downstairs. As I was chilling on the couch, I started to hear this whispering again. I tried ignoring it, because honestly I didn't feel threatened in any way, and I just kept playing around on my phone. After a while of that, I started hearing someone walking around upstairs. Not my son, as he can't walk yet anyway, and he was in a playpen, so it couldn't have been him. No one else was home. Obviously, I was a little shaken up, but I was still going to ignore it. But then I noticed this toy dinosaur thing lighting up. It has a big red button on top of its head that lights up when it's pressed. Manually pressed. Normally, it goes off for a little while after it gets pressed, but this was way after my son was playing with it, and it was like it was just being pressed over and over. The preset sayings would never come all the way through. They just kept going on like their first three words or so. I thought that was creepy, and I started to get uneasy. A little bit after that, I decided to go upstairs and take a nap as well. When I get into the room, I get that familiar feeling of uneasiness that the mirror always gives me. I side-glanced at it and then just tried to ignore it. My little one was asleep and safe, so I wasn't worried about him. I crawled into bed and was on my phone for a couple more minutes when I started hearing the wordless whispers again. I ignored them and tried to fall asleep, but it felt like I was trapped between being awake and being asleep. During that time, I heard all sorts of creaking sounds, walking, things like that. At one point, it sounded like somebody was rubbing their hand really fast across the blanket or sheets. Eventually, I somehow fell asleep, and like I said, I was only asleep for about an hour and a half. But an hour into my nap, my brother got home, he's 11, and he came upstairs because he heard my baby. He was very quiet, barely making any noise, but when he said something to my little one in a whisper, I woke up startled. After reassuring me that it was just him and not some ghost person stalking me, he took my baby downstairs to let me rest a little longer. I set my alarm for 30 minutes, fell back asleep, but instead of my alarm waking me up, I awoke six minutes early, and as I was opening my eyes, all I could see all over the walls were words. They were written very messily, and I couldn't make out anything at all. But it was all I could see for what felt like a very long time, but it could only have been a minute or so. When I turned my phone on to check the time, the words went away. But I was definitely on edge, and I was shaking. I tried to take a moment to calm down, but in the vanity mirror, which was looking toward that other mirror, something shifted and flew across it. I jumped up and got the hell out of there. When I told my mom, she just laughed, and my husband made fun of me for always getting into these crazy ghost situations. But I just came over to have a good time and relax, not be spooked by some crazy ghost. Anyway, I wanted to note that for the majority of the experience, I was alone with my son. It all started happening once my mom left to go do some Uber Eats deliveries. And when I woke up the second time, my brother and son were downstairs playing. I don't know if I'm just crazy, or if there's really something going on with that mirror.
For context, I've been doing gymnastics for nine years, and we had some weird shit happen at our old gym. We moved to a new facility in December of 2017, but the creepy stuff didn't end there. Here is one of those stories. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to two of my coaches, who I believe and trust with my life, literally. They wouldn't lie about these things. Gabby and Maya are the only two people who stay in the gym after hours on our practice nights. This particular night was a Thursday. Before this, we had seen handprints all over the mirrors and things like that. The gym we moved into post-handprints was a high school gymnasium, and to exit there are two sets of glass doors with a shoe mat in the space between. They walk a few feet down the hallways of the old school to leave. Maya was in the front, and Gabby was behind her. Maya saw a man reflected in the glass. If you think, how could she see that? It's pitch black outside by the time they leave, so reflections really show up in the glass. She says he was white and tall, with shaggy dark hair down to his ears. He starts to run toward them. Maya thought maybe he wanted to ask them a question, so she turned around. Gabby ran into her, since Maya is taller and she couldn't see the reflection, but she heard footsteps coming quickly close to them. There was no one there, though. The man was gone, but both of them knew that there had definitely been someone there. So when I was 10 or 11, I can't remember, I went camping near Port Arthur. During these days, my family and I would go all throughout Port Arthur. I didn't find anything that spooky, just a lot of interesting history, until going on one of the ghost tours. When going into the dissection room, I saw a vision of a person. First, it was just phasing out of the wall and then it was standing at the base of the table. What was weird was that the tour guide was describing a sighting, which was presumed to be a surgeon, and it matched my vision exactly. However, I didn't feel that it was a surgeon. He didn't look like he was wearing prison clothes either, and Port Arthur is a prison. My dad had an experience too. To preface, my dad didn't tell me about this until we got home and even then quite reluctantly, because he said he didn't want to scare us kids. So when we were all asleep, my dad went out to go to the bathroom, but walking through the tent, he saw a full body apparition of what he called a guard in a bright red uniform, carrying a lantern. The guard walked through the tent, walking through the tent walls. He could see the glow of the lantern through the walls as well. I have other experiences, but I feel like they probably seem mundane and random. These experiences did really spike after coming back from Port Arthur, though. But perhaps it was just my child's imagination. All things considered, though, Port Arthur Prison is pretty weird. For my 30th birthday, my partner and I at the time were staying at a hotel in Maui that my mother had paid for as a birthday present. I thought it was fine, a little dated feeling. The bed looked out into the living room, which had a dark, void vibe at night, but I really didn't think anything of it at the time. Until my partner started talking about getting bad vibes on the second night. I told him to just brush it off. After the third night, I mentioned a weird dream that I had had, where I was in the hotel bed and I saw two silver strings pulling my feet off the surface of the bed. It felt lucid, because I rarely dream about the room that I'm actually in, unless I'm in partial sleep paralysis, which is rare. And this didn't feel like sleep paralysis, just a normal dream. My partner apparently had a dream about his body being lifted off the bed on the same night, 
and this freaked me out. I never have paranormal experiences, and I rarely get spooked, but by the fourth night, my partner said, I literally cannot spend another night here. Something is way off about this place. I asked him what was going on besides the weird dreams, and he said that he couldn't pinpoint it, but he was just unwilling to spend another night there. He had never gotten any sort of vibes like this in the past from any other place we'd been. So I had to tell our Airbnb host that we needed to leave early. We ended up not getting any refunds, and we sprung for a brand new hotel for the rest of the trip. I couldn't find anything on Google about the first hotel, and nothing else happened. It was just super bizarre, and my only paranormal adjacent experience. I still wish, though, that I could find out more information about the history of that hotel. I'm a prison officer, not a storyteller. So this could either be really long and boring, or full of information that's irrelevant. I don't know. But it's my story, and I wanted to tell it anyway. We start our nights at approximately 8pm, and we're locked in until the following morning at 6am. It's essentially a skeleton crew, and several hundred prisoners secured behind their doors. This past week has had the most activity that I've ever experienced. A lot of the people who work with me have had really spooky happenings as well. I'm not really a believer, per se, but a lot of spooky and unexplained things have happened at night. So many that I have no choice but to begin to believe when it's all added up together. At night, we usually patrol two linked wings, as there's no need to have staff patrolling each when the prisoners are asleep. There's a wing that I believe is haunted. On the third floor landing, when cutting in between the two wings, there's a sudden feeling of being watched by something from around the corner. It freaks me out so much that I refuse to cut through there now, as I just feel cold and watched. I go the longer way around to access this particular landing if I have to answer a call bell. It's the same on the ones landing on the same wing. As soon as you come down the stairs and turn to carry on the patrol, there's just this horrible, oppressive feeling of being followed, and it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I've had emergency cell bells, which are used by prisoners to alert staff to an emergency, go off in cells that are not occupied. Random doors slam when all of the doors are locked for obvious reasons. And I've thought that I've seen movement on CCTV cameras when I'm on my own. I've also heard things. However, anyone who's either been in a prison or worked in one will know that they're very noisy, even at night. I've never said anything about this to colleagues, because being a prison officer dealing with hardened criminals and being spooked by nothing is a surefire way to get the mick taken out of you. Fast forward to this week. Luckily, I was not on this wing, and was a member of staff that walks around supporting patrol staff. I spooked a patrol on a random wing as they didn't hear me, and I made a joke about whether or not they thought I was a ghost. We got talking about ghosts and stuff, and naturally the subject of that wing came up. My face must have said it all, because they said, don't tell me the threes as you cut through and the ones as you come off the stairs. Now it's spooky that somebody else has felt the same, but it's also a little bit relieving that it's not just me. I carried on with my rounds and chatted to people and got talking about my good jump scare on our chat. It turns out that a lot of people who work in prisons believe in ghosts after they've worked a couple of night shifts. One of the patrols told me that they almost called me to sit with them, as they had heard a loud bang, as though it was a cell door slamming shut. They went to investigate, but nothing. They had just sat back down, and it went again. This obviously spooked them. We began talking about how it's weird the ghosts have been mentioned. And then, that happens. 
He then had his own story about the wing that I think is haunted, where one of the metal security gates slammed shut behind him on the threes landing as he was cutting through one night. Now, having worked on this wing, the gate doesn't move on its own as it's very heavy, let alone slam behind anyone of its own accord. We have a laugh about being blokes and scared of shadows, and I crack on with seeing the next person. To access them, I have to go through a wooden door and a metal gate. It's pitch black and I don't have my torch, so I open the wooden door and then metal gate, and I step in to look for the light switch so I can see to lock the door and gate behind me. As I'm doing this, the wooden door slams shut directly behind me with a huge force. I jumped. It wasn't a windy night, and we were indoors anyway, so there was no breeze. Let me tell you, I have never shut some doors and gates so fast in my whole life. I got out of there fast. I spend my rounds talking about the ghosts and seeing what everyone else's stories are. And there are some really interesting stories. But everyone I talk to talks about this haunted wing, either on the threes where they feel like they're being watched or the ones as they come off the stairs. By this point, I had spoken to six staff in total and all of them independently had the same types of stories. That's way too much of a coincidence for me. I finally go into the haunted wing and I'm talking to the patrol who has all the lights on for what I can now only assume are obvious reasons that they have felt it too. And I swear I see somebody moving on the cameras in the ones walking toward the office just before they go out of camera shot. There was nothing there and nothing on the playback. I can't tell you what's happening, but something is definitely going on and it is very creepy. I work in a Victorian prison in England. For privacy reasons, I obviously won't say where. But there's always been a prison in this area since maybe the 13th century. But the current and most recent build was from the 1850s. The prison that I work in has seen some executions in its time and saw some of the last hangings in the UK, making it a very eerie place to work. The wing that I work on holds the old execution cells on the bottom landing, and the prisoners who were executed used to drop from the landing above and down onto the landing below, where they would be taken off and put into small, tunnely unmarked graves out back. You can still see where they've bricked up the tunnels in the outbuilding. So one evening, I was counting the wing after I'd locked everyone away. I went down to the bottom landing to count and I watched a dark, shadowy figure dart around the corner of this landing. Immediately I said, Come on, mate, I called bang up half hour ago, get moving. Suddenly I realized that there was no sound from whatever this thing was that had darted off. But also that I had already locked everyone away and I made sure every door was secure. I even checked the CCTV and there was nobody else on that landing other than myself. A few other officers have also seen whatever this is, but it can never be seen on the cameras. The thing that terrifies me is knowing that people have died down there. What was this guy running from? A good friend of mine told me this story years ago. He is the stereotypical old big bad trucker. I've seen some weird stuff while driving with him in South Texas along the border. He never batted an eye. But while telling me this story, he had goosebumps and a concerned expression, which from this guy is about the equivalent of a trembling lip. I'll tell this story in the first person as he told it to me. 
Years ago, in the late 90s, I was on my way from the house in Central Texas, heading to Laredo to pick up a load. It was early morning, around four or five. I had just come off a string of days at home, so I know I wasn't tired. I'm on one of those two-lane winding roads in the absolute middle of nowhere, when I see something on the side of the road, at the edge of my high beams. At first I thought it was just roadkill, as is usually the case. But as I get closer, I see that it is roadkill, and there's somebody crouching over the deer carcass. I remember thinking, either this guy's taking the antlers as a trophy, or he's just sick. As I got closer, I could then see that this guy was eating the deer. He's pulling chunks of meat from the stomach and bringing them up to his face. At this point, he stops mid-motion and looks up at me. Not at my truck, at me. He, or it, stands up. And that's when I see that it is huge, brown, and covered in hair. At this point, I just remember thinking, oh crap. This thing is standing on the tiny shoulder, looking at me. By this point, maybe three seconds have passed, and I'm about to the point in the road that he's standing at. I didn't even think of stopping. In fact, I'm starting to lay on it and get out of there. As I'm passing it, it's looking at me, again, not at the truck. It's looking through the driver's side windshield, at me. Whatever this thing was obviously had the intelligence to know that there was a driver and to know where I was sitting. As I started to pass him, I could see his head above the hood of an old needle nose Pete. If you don't know, that's an old truck design where the hood goes straight out from the windshield, known for being tall and difficult to see around. This thing is a freaking giant. I remember seeing what looked like human intelligence in its eyes, but it was not human. Still scares the crap out of me. This took place about eight to 10 years ago and has never happened again. To begin, let me set the scene. This happened in a hallway, which is more like a cube. Perspective is from the top of the stairs looking at the hallway. The stairs down are at the back end and stairs up to the left. My mother's office is directly to the right. There's a small sliver of wall where we have a plaque and then my sister's room. A bit to the left of that, there's my room. The left wall has the closet and an inlet which has the bathroom door directly across from my mother's office. For some reason, we were all talking. My mother was in her office. My sister was at the door to her room. I was in the doorway to the bathroom. Remember that plaque I mentioned? Out of nowhere, it flew off of its J-shaped hook and landed right next to me. We all saw it happen. There are no vents around it and it's way too heavy to be moved by a breeze. It didn't break, and we were all just like, well, that just happened. My mom put it back on the hook, and we just went on with our day. We still cannot explain this. I live in the States. I also happen to live in an area that is surrounded by cemeteries. There's a large cemetery, we'll call it Cemetery A, across the street. A large Cemetery B, a street over to my right. And another, C, a street behind our house. I believe that they are all separate. Cemetery A is across the street from Cemetery B, along a big street. Cemetery A is a place that locals frequent to walk around, as it's huge and has many entrances. They can walk around it without worrying about cars or street lights or stopping. I sometimes walk around and sometimes my sister joins me. About five years ago, my sister and I decided to go for a walk 
around eight or maybe nine. It was already dark out and the street lights were on. We were walking on the side of the street where Cemetery B is in order to get to Cemetery A. As we were walking up to the crosswalk, alone, we noticed that this dark figure was walking toward us. We didn't think much of it because, like I said, locals frequent that area. It's normal. What startled us was the dark figure walking into the wall surrounding Cemetery B and disappearing into it. Now this is a tall wall made of bricks and is easily five feet tall with a metal fence on top of it full of bushes that is also about five feet tall, so 10 feet in total. We didn't see the figure struggling to climb over the wall, just walking right into it before vanishing. At that point, my sister and I stop, and I ask, Did you see that? She did. We turned around and went straight back home. Living there, it often smelled like decaying meat. I called this smell death. If you've ever come across a rotting animal, you smelled it. I heard that the smell means a spirit is around. I got used to saying, In the name of God, you are not welcomed here. Please go away. I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts, or if the phrase would even work, but better safe than sorry, right? It's been a while since I have experienced any paranormal activity in my life. This happened a day and a half ago, and because I hadn't had any experiences recently, it scared the crap out of me. I was watching my dad's dog, Charlie, for a week while he was in the hospital. Nothing bad, just a knee replacement. I was staying in his new apartment, which was an old Victorian house converted into three apartment units. My dad lives on the third floor, or attic, which used to be the servants' quarters. It's a really nice, newly remodeled home with lots of character. The bedroom and bathroom are separate from the rest of the apartment, with a set of about five stairs leading down to it. The week started off great. I dropped my dad off at the hospital and said goodbye to my fiancé and headed over to the apartment. I figured it would be a great week of relaxing. I work from home now, so I would be able to work from the apartment and take care of Charlie. Charlie is a big golden doodle mix, about 12 years old now. He's a gentle giant who loves taking naps on his heated bed. The first few days I could hear creaking, scratching, and banging at night, but chalked that up to old house noises. Charlie didn't seem to be too bothered, so it didn't set off any alarms. My fiancé came over on the third day to help me clean up the apartment. My dad is recently divorced, so he doesn't have a great grasp of personal hygiene or cleanliness. We set to work and started moving furniture to vacuum, mop, and sanitize the kitchen and bathroom. Halfway through the cleaning, Charlie started to get unsettled. He had been fine up until this point, but he was now anxiously pacing the hallway in front of the stairs to the bedroom. I tried to get him to go for a pee, or at least to show me what he wanted, but he wouldn't budge from the stairs. My fiancé was starting to get frustrated with Charlie, because he was crying and barking at nothing. He went to move Charlie, and as soon as he touched his collar, Charlie ran howling into the room. At this point, my fiancé was done. He ran into the bedroom after him and chased him out. He shut the door, and we went back to cleaning. We assumed there may be a rat or something in the bedroom, so we bought a trap. My fiancé had to head back to work the next morning, and it was a long commute, so he went home around 9 p.m. I was still in the kitchen, prepping some microwave meals for my dad, for after he got back. Charlie still hadn't given up on the bedroom, and was scratching at the door. I took him for a walk so he would settle, and when we got back, he gave up and went to sleep. I decided to just head to bed too, because I was exhausted. I was on the pull-out couch in the living room, so I set up some TV to watch while I fell asleep. I woke up around 2.30 in the morning, 
desperately needing the bathroom. I was a bit hesitant to go into the bedroom after Charlie's reaction to it. I didn't need a rat running over my foot while I was peeing. I uneasily relieved myself and went back to the living room. When I got back, the TV was off. I had left it on, and it had been on when I went to the bathroom. I went to turn it back on, and I could see the outline of someone in the TV screen. They moved behind a wall as I watched, and I freaked out and ran to the bedroom to call 911. I thought for sure someone had broken in. Charlie was barking loudly at this point, and I had let him into the room with me to protect him. The police got there within a few minutes, but honestly it felt like forever. I explained everything to them, and they searched everywhere. There was no forced entry, no footprints, nothing stolen or broken, and no evidence of anything. They left an officer parked outside the apartment complex for an hour after the incident. I was able to sleep a bit after they left, but only with Charlie on the bed with me, and the TV on. The next night was the last night I was able to stay there. I woke up around 1.30 in the morning to scratching at the bedroom door. It sounded like Charlie had trapped himself inside. I went over to the door and flung it open, expecting Charlie to run out. There was nothing behind the door. He wasn't in the bedroom, and the scratching had been occurring only a second before I opened that door. I checked the bathroom. Nothing. I turned around and saw him anxiously sitting, watching me from outside the bedroom door. I walked toward him, and just as I did, the door swung shut slowly from the inside. It was black in the room, and I was terrified. I ran for the door and opened it so quickly I almost ran into Charlie. I grabbed my things fast and got Charlie all packed up and threw everything in the car. I had forgotten his leash, so I went back into the apartment. I could have sworn that as I was leaving, I could see a person in the TV screen again. I said to myself, screw my landlord's rule about no dogs. There was no way we were staying there anymore. My fiance thinks I am overreacting and isn't too happy about having a 120 pound dog in our home, but I couldn't do it. I talked with my dad the next day and he said he has never had any experiences in that apartment but that Charlie has never really liked the bedroom or the hallway leading to the bedroom, which is where I saw the person. I told him that I would never stay there again. Charlie is very happy here with us until my dad gets out of inpatient rehab for his knee, and my fiancé can suck it up for another three days. I'll still have to go over to walk Charlie, but I'll never go back inside. A few years ago, my mom went on a solo road trip. She doesn't usually like to travel alone, but I was in college and she wanted to visit some family a few states over. The trip went well, up until the last night on her drive back home. She had booked a room in a and b that looked really nice online, but everything went off the rails when she actually arrived, which I witnessed since I was on the phone, FaceTiming her, being informed with texts and photos and so on, for almost her entire night. When she pulled up to the house, it was totally dark. There were no lights on inside, and it seemed almost deserted. When she called the B&B &B to say that she had arrived, she was told to take a key from under the doormat and unlock the door herself, as the innkeeper had been caught away in an emergency, and she would be the only one there for the night. She was already a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but went inside anyway, since she had already paid the fee and didn't have anywhere else to stay. The interior was old-timey looking, with velvet drapes, thick dusty carpets, shelves full of photos and trinkets, and, weirdest of all, many decorative plates with babies and children painted on them all over the walls. My mom locked the door behind her, and went upstairs quite quickly, since she was feeling scared. Upstairs was worse, though, with the continued vintage furnishings 
and the unfortunate addition of about 15 ceramic dolls in each room, arranged on the beds and propped up on the tables and shelves. At this point, my mom was really freaked out, but kept trying to convince herself that there wasn't actually anything scary about the inn, or the dolls, or anything else there. So she picked a room and started trying to go to bed. She did find herself turning the dolls around in her room so that they faced the wall, even though she's usually a stark disbeliever in anything paranormal. That's when everything got really strange. She started hearing sounds all over the house, very human-like sounds. It started with creaking, then footsteps, and then whispering. My mom was overtaken with fear in a way that she had never experienced before. She found herself frozen in place, where she quite literally couldn't move, whilst hearing more and more activity. The sounds eventually escalated to screaming, crashing, and banging sounds from all over the house. After a few minutes, my mom managed to shake herself from her paralysis and realized that she needed to get out as fast as she could. She was so terrified that she actually tried climbing out of the window on the second story, but the roof below was too steep and she had to climb back inside. Then she took a fireplace poker, since she said she didn't know if the noise was from some robbers or something, gathered up her stuff and ran into the hallway and down the stairs. She was quite shocked to see that everything was exactly as it had been when she came in. Except for one thing. A single one of the baby plates had fallen from the wall and shattered on the floor. There were no people in the house. The door wasn't bashed in. All the furniture was in the same dusty spots as before. She booked it for the door, threw it open, dropped the house key somewhere in the front yard, and drove away. She had never been more afraid in her entire life and had never been less sure in her opinion that ghosts were fake. She drove around the town for a while and ended up in a Motel 6, where she probably slept for 45 minutes, and then came home. Unfortunately for her, though, that isn't where the story ends. She had been looking forward to arriving home so that she could finally be done with the whole frightening occurrence, maybe get some sleep, and watch some reality TV that had been recorded while she was gone. What she didn't account for was the ghostly hitchhiker that seemed to have followed her back. That first night home, she fell asleep on the couch with the TV on. Around 2 a.m., the TV turned off on its own, and she woke up suddenly to hear loud footsteps running through the living room. She lives totally alone in a standalone house, Weird things continued to happen for about two to three months, including a constant problem with the TV turning on and off, changing volume, or changing the channel by itself. She would hear voices, screams, and footsteps throughout the house, and would often wake up to have items in the kitchen or living room moved around, with no explanation, and in odd ways. The most notable was when the toaster was mysteriously moved to the top of the fridge one night. Fortunately, my mom really dedicated herself to 100% ignoring the ghost and trying to avoid feeding negative or scared energy into it, and after a few months it all went away. She felt like she knew for sure, though, that it was a ghost and that it latched onto her that night at the inn. She certainly isn't much of a skeptic anymore. My boyfriend at the time and I were hiking up in the Rockies. We came across what looked like a small silo. The door on it had a padlock, but it was unlocked. It was like it had been busted off. We were curious what was inside, because it was weird. I mean, it was weird that we came upon anything at all, let alone that. We weren't on a trail, and we were way up there. My boyfriend opened it, and inside was what looked like a torture chamber. 
like full-on chair with restraints and chains coming from the ceiling. There was a trap door on the floor, and there was no way we were opening that. We hiked right back to our car and left. I still feel creepy about it. I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. The nearest town from the guard station was about an hour and a half away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power wasn't working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods there just always had an eerie feeling to them unlike the southwest ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so at first I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling, like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, always on Tuesday nights, and I just had a bad feeling. At the time, I didn't have my shotgun in the vehicle, so I was unarmed. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes, about three and a half to four feet in the air. To say that I was freaked out is an understatement. I started yelling at it to get out of there, but the eyes only crouched down and inched closer. At this point, I could tell it was a very large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area, and the creature leapt back a bit, but it didn't make a sound. I tossed four or five more pieces, and the creature still inched forward. At this point, I was fumbling with the keys because of course the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and I grabbed my shotgun. Technically, you're not supposed to have guns in government housing, but who lives in Hills Have Eyes backcountry and doesn't carry? I mean, come on. I went outside and the creature was a bit closer. I still couldn't get a good look at it. My headlamp wasn't that good. I loaded my shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, the rocking bench, and the compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch but I never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was strange not to have found any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before, and I've never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. My mom passed away in early November of 2005. I had gotten married at the end of May of that year, and she waited until after to tell the family that she was sick. It was actually the end of June before she did. She didn't want to take away the joy of the baby of the family getting married. It was way too fast, and none of us were ready to let her go. She always said that she wanted to go at home, no hospital or hospice. She said it for years, especially after my dad passed when I was 16. He passed at home, surrounded by all of us up until the end, and that was what she wanted too, in the house he built with his bare hands, and the house they had raised the family in. So that's what we did. Her six children moved back home and stayed with her for the final two months. We took shifts to see our husband, wives, work, 
during that time. But at any given point, there were four of us there 24 hours a day, making sure that she was surrounded by love and never alone. Now, I didn't take her death well. I mean, I did everything that needed to be done and kept myself together. But we were close, and this was so fast, I just didn't want to believe it. I can't tell you the number of times I caught myself calling her to then just stare at the phone mid-dial and realize that nobody would pick up. A month after she passed, I was alone at my own home watching TV. It was only about 7 p.m., so dark at that time of the year in New England. When movement caught my eye from the left, about 12 feet from me, my mom walked through my kitchen, stirring something in a bowl. She paused in the doorway, gave a little wave with her fingers from the hand wrapped around the bowl as her head tilted with a smile and she moved past the doorway. I was frozen to where I was sitting, so I called out, Mom? And I heard her laugh, her healthy laugh from before she got sick and couldn't smile anymore, let alone laugh. I went to the kitchen, but there was nothing. But I swear on my life that it was real. She was there. The thing is, my mom was a great baker. She passed a lot of her recipes on to me, and while not as often as I would have liked, we baked together. It was the time that made both of us happy. We just laughed and chatted and gossiped and drank tea while we waited for some delicious concoction to come out of the oven. To this day, whenever I make her cheesecake, cookies, cream puffs, or meringues, I'm happy. I dance around the kitchen as I stir the bowl, and I think of her and the time that she visited me. She has only visited me in my dreams since, always to warn me or help me with a problem that I'm having. I like to think that she was able to muster the energy to come see me in person, just this once, so that I knew she was okay that I didn't have to be sad, and that she would always be there. My biological dad lives in a creepy old farmhouse that he renovated. I was helping him build out the office late one night. He went to the bathroom and I just kept plunking away. I was on the floor and set my hammer down. And that's when I felt something, a presence. I looked to where I thought somebody would be, but nothing was there. I reached back down for my hammer, and now it's out of arm's reach, maybe five feet farther away than where I had set it down. I hadn't moved at all. He comes back after he's finished and I tell him what just happened. He laughed and said, Oh, the little girl must be playing with you. Um, the little girl what? He then tells me that every now and then he hears a little girl laughing and he's even seen her. She's always wearing the same pair of overalls and she just kind of wanders around upstairs. I'm not one to believe in paranormal experiences, but I have no other explanation than to believe that a little girl ghost just wanted to play. My girlfriend and I were driving back to her parents' house when I was probably 17 or 18. We went down this one road, and all of a sudden she screamed for me to swerve. I figured that she had seen a deer. When I turned my head, I saw a woman, dressed in white, pushing a white bassinet. She was also holding a little boy's hand, and he was wearing white too. At first I was just really freaked out that we had almost hit this family. But when I looked in my rearview mirror, they weren't there. I worked in a restaurant 
and all the bakery people who stayed late for night shift would talk about the ghost of a little girl. I didn't know when all of this started, and first I didn't believe it. It was in the middle of the day, but we were slow, so I was doing prep work by myself in the kitchen. I was at the prep table, kind of zoning out, listening to the distant music, when I felt somebody right next to me. It was a sudden presence. Then, I swear by all things holy, I heard in a little girl's voice the most innocent, Hi Josh, how are you? I even felt her breath. It was so, so real and vivid, but when I turned around, there was nobody there. I started telling people about it and found out that lots of coworkers heard the same voice. From everybody's stories, the ghost girl is really nice, but still, it sent chills down my spine and made my future night shifts there all the more eerie. I work from home, but I work at night. So this is my, I have no clue how it happened, night shift story of sorts. I suppose it's not entirely scary, but I still have no explanation. So this was about 10 years ago. My wife and I moved into our brand new condo in July of 05. We were new to the area and we didn't know anybody besides my dad. Fast forward to April of 07. We had some weird things, such as the TV turning on in the middle of the night and a few glasses shattering on their own happen. It was strange, but we tried to explain it away as new construction, wiring, perhaps the glasses were weakened by the mood, stuff like that. We joke about it, and in a week, I'm due to drive back to Chicago to do my oral defense for my master's degree. I take showers daily, as does my wife. I don't remember the actual dates, but let's say it's a Monday. My wife and I take our showers, no worries. Tuesday, I take a shower and get out. Our bathroom has a full wall mirror over the dual sinks. In the steam, at the very, very top is written Chicago. I'm like, uh, that's odd. So I call to my wife and I ask her, why did you write that? She's just waking up and comes in and is super confused. And she starts to get mad at me because she didn't write it. I quickly write in the steam below it without thinking, as does she. The writing doesn't match either of us. Plus, it's written at the top of the mirror. We have 10-foot ceilings. Both of us would have had to get up on the counter and stand on it in order to reach that. I run through the condo. Everything is locked. We had no people over in between the two daily showers, and we hadn't had anybody over in weeks. We still didn't know many people there. My wife is not a prankster. She has never pranked me in the two decades I've known her, and I sure as hell didn't write it. The kicker is, the next night I had an incredibly realistic dream of my grandma, who passed in 05. She was on my bed and rested her hand on my leg, and she said, Don't worry, that bastard is gone. Nothing weird happened after that. I can explain away almost everything, except that writing, but I completely believed that my grandma chased him off, whoever the ghost was. I work nights in the locked unit of our nursing home. This is where the worse off people in the facility are. Dementia, behavioral problems, mental illness, things that are pretty serious. So pretty much I'm locked alone in a long dark hallway and I check in on everybody throughout the night. It's a very large three story building and this wing is an isolated half of the top floor. 
Nobody likes working back there, especially at night, because the patients are harder to take care of, and let's be real, it does get spooky back there. Being locked, it has this claustrophobic feel that creeps you out anyway. So when something happens, it's enough to really scare the crap out of you. And things do happen. Once, I heard a man shout, Hey, come over here, from the dead end of a hallway. There were no men on that hall, and all the patients were asleep. There were no TVs on, no radios, no logical explanation. I found out, when I told somebody the story, that there was a patient who had died right before I started that would come to the door and call for help, just like that. They even described the voice the patient had, and it matched what I had heard. Another time, I had a patient die that was always very rude and telling people what to do, kind of bossing other patients around. He would tell people to speak louder or shut up, things like that. My husband, who works in a separate unit of the same building, and I were talking in the hall outside of her old room. Our conversation was suddenly interrupted by a loud shush that sounded exactly like when she would hush up other residents. It sounded like she was right next to us, but she had passed on and nobody was in the hall except for us. All the patients were fast asleep. I also had a patient moved into a shared room. The woman that she moved in with wasn't always friendly to her. She would swing on her if she took food from others' plates by accident, things like that. Not long after moving into the shared room, she passed away in there. Suddenly, her less than friendly roommate was terrified to sleep in that room. She lived in there alone before, hadn't seen the death, and was probably too far gone dementia-wise to even remember that she had had a roommate. But still, she was terrified of that room at night. She would absolutely refuse to go to bed, which used to be hard to get her out of. And if you did get her to lay down, she would scream, Don't turn off the lights! Don't you dare turn off the lights! She would spend most of the night trying to get out of the room and stay out. And this was all kind of crazy because she was somebody who liked to be in bed. She liked to be left alone in her room most of the time. One night, she made it all the way out into the hallway, walking without her wheelchair. She was almost falling over, but she was determined to get out of that room, struggling the whole way and putting up a fight when I tried to turn her around to go back into the room to sit down. She was out of breath and there was pure fear in her eyes like I've never seen. I took her to watch television, and she slept in a recliner in the TV room with me, no problems. This lasted for about a month after her roommate died, and it didn't stop until she moved rooms. The general theory is that her departed roommate had returned to get revenge. People do see their family and loved ones when they're about to die all the time. When they start seeing and talking to family, and talking to things that aren't there, that's how you know that it's about to happen. Call bells do go off in empty rooms, even the kind that you have to physically pull down to sound and push back up to turn off. And it happens even in locked rooms. But this scares me the most. There's something back there that bothers my residents at night I have a Greek woman who's a patient and doesn't speak English at the far end of my hall. She'll be talking up a storm, but it'll be loud enough to hear all the way down the hall. When I go down to check on her, she stops talking and pretends to be asleep. As soon as I walk away, she'll start back up. This will continue for a while, then she'll stop talking and go to sleep. A few minutes later, the woman in the next room will start talking to something. When she stops, the woman across the hall will start talking to something. They aren't just mumbling either, it's a full conversation. They talk, then they pause to listen, and then they talk again. It's like listening to somebody who's on the phone. And the thing is, no two are ever doing it at the same time. They're all in separate rooms with various levels of dementia 
so it's not like they discussed it or know what's going on in the other rooms. It's literally like someone or something is going down the hall, room to room, waking people up to talk until they fall asleep, and then going to the next. They will all always talk about the man. That man was in my room. That man is standing in the corner behind you. That man told me to. Again, all saying the same thing, without really knowing that the others are seeing the same. This happens on a very regular basis, and it never stops being creepy. And I always wonder what he says to them. I used to work the night shift at a 24-hour breakfast joint. Every night, I would hear one of the toilets in the women's restroom flush periodically when nobody was there. They weren't automatic, either. You had to actually physically flush them. Another time, there was a rack of silverware on top of the chemical cage, pushed all the way back to the wall. I walked past it, and it was like it got shoved away from the wall over the raised edge of the chemical cage and onto my head. I had to go to the hospital for a concussion. The security footage of that incident really creeped out the DM. And I don't really blame them. I was by myself in the engine room of a submarine on the mid-watch, just a newly reported sailor trying to find equipment so I could display my knowledge to one of the watch standers. There are a number of bays in engine room lower level, with narrow passages that pass through the center. I came down one of the ladders, and I swore I saw somebody walk across the ship about 15 feet in front of me. I could hear his footsteps as he walked around a corner and out of sight. Three problems. Number one, he was wearing utilities, an older light blue blouse, and dark navy slacks. Nobody had utilities anymore. They had been phased out three years earlier. Two, there was only one other person awake in the engine room that late at night, and he was standing at the top of the ladder behind me, waiting for me to come back up with an answer to his question. And three, he wasn't actually there. I wrote it off as sleep deprivation, but I'll admit, it shook me for a while. Fast forward to four months later. I had gone out to sea with another submarine of the same type. While I was there, I met a sailor who had previously served on my ship. After a few weeks of standing watch with him, he told me of a story of a sailor who had unalived himself while on watch when he served on my ship almost a decade earlier in engine room lower level, in his utilities. I wish I could have gotten a picture of the look on my face, but I'm sure that it was the definition of disbelief. To this day, that is the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam, he soon was stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there, and when they came through, the base shut down, and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all the buildings that you attached to your person with a carabiner, so that if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and couldn't see and froze to death. He said for about five months, every time they locked down for weather, they would hear horrendous screaming outside, not just the wind, human screaming. Everyone was accounted for, 
so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. They wrote it off as an animal. However, every time this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and toolboxes knocked over. Even one time, a several thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its workbench crane thing and smashed about 30 feet away. The hangars and engine rooms had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear, even in a whiteout. No animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. Then one day, it just stopped. This was not something that they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine, which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breathe fire down the base commander's neck. This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers, and specialists. They came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I do not believe in the paranormal, nor did my father. This is the only spooky type story he has from 22 years in the service. No one knows what happened. It was strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this. That said, I spoke to my mom, and she told me a couple of other things. After one of these occasions, the U-2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were special built for this airframe and this particular crew's mission. These systems were complex and archaic. Very few people knew how to operate this machinery, and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and flipping switches from off to on. Another time, three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was the wind because it came in short, irregular bursts, and wind almost never produces those sounds. At least there it didn't. They theorized it might have been a polar bear, but if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly, Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when all of this was going on. They were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled setting. My mom used to live in a small town in the Cascade Mountains. She worked as a forest ranger. She told me about a very scary thing that happened to her. The oldest male ranger kept hitting on her and trying to get her to come home with him. I know that doesn't sound very out of the ordinary, but wait. He kept trying and kept trying, but she would never go with him. And finally, he just gave up. Also, she left the town after a while, so he wasn't her problem anymore. But many years later, after she'd left the town, she found out that he had been convicted of manslaughter and had killed a young female ranger right before she got hired. She's pretty sure that had she gone home with him, she would have been his next kill. I used to be a supervisor for a janitorial company, and a couple of times a week, I had to go to a middle school and clean their hallway floors and gymnasium with a Zamboni-type vehicle, which mopped and scrubbed the floor. When I was there, I had the whole school to myself. I used to get finished quickly and go to the library and read while eating my dinner. Well, one morning after being there, I got a call from school security. They wanted me to come in. When I get there, I see a police car too. Understandably nervous, I go in. They ask me a few questions like, did you notice anything out of the ordinary or strange while you were here last night? No, 
I said. I hadn't. I usually had headphones in anyway. Security then shows me camera footage of someone breaking into one of the classrooms while I was riding the Zamboni not far away. I was there for another two hours, completely unaware of this. Nothing was stolen, but the worst part was they didn't have footage of the person leaving. They didn't go out the way they'd come in, and police had to sweep the entire school. Never did find out what happened with that one. But the fact that I was in there, completely alone, with someone who clearly had bad intentions, totally unaware, yeah, that freaked me out. The last two days have gotten crazy. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night. I know, it sounds like a bad movie, but bear with me. And it's happened about a few times a month since, sometimes more often. Something taps at the window. There is nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping on the glass. My siblings and I are just used to it by now. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. He says that whatever it was just kept saying, hello, to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks because it's bipedal. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying in the bed that's next to the window, blinds closed, and I about jump out of my skin because someone is loudly banging against the glass. I ignored it. I just assumed it was one of my siblings sneaking up on me. I then found out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened and they hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record it. It kept yelling, Hello, come out! Hello, come out! Exactly how my brother had described. It was so loud we could hear it clearly from the kitchen and the dining room and really the whole house. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I live in Northeast Ohio. If anyone has any information on what this is or has a similar experience, please let me know. About 20 years ago, in my early 20s, I was going through a really rough time. One late evening in the dark, I was smoking a cigarette on the side of the house I lived in. All of a sudden, I see hands coming over the fence, as though they were going to pull themselves up and jump over. I just assumed it was my cousin, who also lived at the house, who might have been sneaking into the house. I asked, why are you jumping the fence? Then. I see a body being pulled up over the fence. It was in the form of my cousin, but it was not her. This thing was translucent and very scary. It jumped over the fence, landed in a crouched position, and immediately flew close to the ground very fast. It literally went through me, knocked me to the ground, and then flew away. It was as though the wind had been knocked out of me. My cigarette went flying out of my hand. I immediately run into the house and see my cousin in bed, asleep. I shook her awake and said, Why did you scare me like that? She asked what I was talking about and that she was asleep and had been the entire night and had never left the house. 
I later asked my mom why this happened, and she said that sometimes when people are having a hard time, those close to them linger over them in an out-of-body experience to protect them. However, I don't think that's the case. This thing felt 100% evil. Has anyone else experienced this? I haven't had any negative occurrences since. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while, until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house, but the short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. These stories are about my experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief of a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, now it is surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a very gorgeous jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats. That's the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim that it's cleaned up now, but we still have dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And I once saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard, so. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage. However, we shared the mailbox and the address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side, going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. The first experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room, in my dream, and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room people that I didn't recognize, and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized that they were looking at a woman lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people surrounding her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up, and that was all I remembered. 
my second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed, and I was tucking in myself. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and, if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep and instantly went into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel that my body is asleep, but my mind is awake, and I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and I see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the other me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and was now on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes now. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me as I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, and feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of that night, and I have struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Experience 3 Remember the cattle herd I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars just to watch the scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school and he hands me the binoculars and says, look at the cow pasture, tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually hosted about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away. So that night, my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, no tails, no legs, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed and then snacked on them over time. We had coyotes come through all the time, and they avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us really creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are the three experiences I remember the best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. Back in about 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home, supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, and other things on the table in my shoe or next to my shoes. One morning I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled the phone back toward me, 
but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone, pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand, and it just disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out, and even to this day I get chills thinking about it. The hand was obviously thin enough to be able to slide in and out from under the couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled. And the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick, and yellowish. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone, or why it wanted it but it really creeps me out. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area of a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse. Even to this day it does, and I'm in my late 20s now. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, would stay in the guest room. So I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that someone was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. Instead, I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to muster the strength to call for my sister. He continued to stare until she turned the light on. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open, but thankfully her dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and the side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming home for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway, and just staring as he did before. The boy, not the husband. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You would feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything in me told me not to. So I would face the wall until I had almost fallen asleep and felt somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. She also started seeing this boy standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment midnight Walmart trip we bought some groceries and food for all of the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming 
as a handprint formed on her wrist right in front of us. She dropped the groceries, and we just left them there until morning. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. She worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away. I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's another story. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend and come after lunch to help clean the place. She agreed and just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out, text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. And John was passed out in bed. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running, the screams, and directly in front of me I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, faded into my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard from him again. She says that it's been peaceful since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time, and I'm guessing that's where he is, and he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope he is at peace, and that whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. I can't get this experience out of my head, no matter how many years have passed. This happened way back in the late 2000s. I was in the eighth grade and we were on a senior trip. I stayed in a hotel with two other girls. One of them was my friend and another girl who we were somewhat friendly with. The first night in the room, during my shower, I felt like someone was behind me, like standing really close to my back under the shower spray. I turned around quickly, but nobody was there. So I continued showering, but the feeling just got worse. When I finished my shower, I pulled the curtain open, and when I looked at the gigantic wall mirror, I saw a grotesque face right behind my shoulder. It was gone within seconds. I think I stood there frozen for like a whole minute before I practically ran out screaming. The next day, while we were getting ready to go out, the girl we were roomed with said that somebody was in our room last night. She heard the toilet flush, the sink go off, but then nothing. No one entered the room and nobody left, and nobody else was there but the three of us. We know because we checked every nook and cranny after she told us this. The second night, when we got back to our hotel room, I suddenly felt super sleepy. Like I literally fell to the floor once I stepped inside and fell asleep which was odd because I wasn't sleepy at all until we walked into the room. The other two couldn't move me since I had an extra 50 pounds on them, so they just covered me up with the blanket, put a pillow under my head, and left me there. Then my friend said that sometime during the night, I had gotten up, used the bathroom, and crawled into bed, but I don't remember doing that. In fact, when I woke up on the third day, I was still on the floor. I currently go to school at a private school, and it's split into two buildings. One is an old train station, and the second building was a paper press building or something like that. My school buildings are very old. They were made in the late 1800s to early 1900s. The owner of the paper press building had a brother, and a few years before the school opened in 2012, he had gone into the elevator, and the elevator had fallen, and he died. 
When the other building was still a train station, two people had died from the train. One was a side and the other was an accident. This is my first year at this school and I'm currently in the ninth grade. I always have to go into school around an hour earlier than school starts because of my mom's work. There's only one teacher there when I arrive at school and every single morning, I always hear a tapping on the window. At first I thought it was a tree, but then I realized there aren't any trees around the windows. One night I was at my friend's house who lives about a mile from our school and at two to three in the morning, we decided to go for a walk. We went to the school because we had nowhere else to go. We were just sitting at the table behind the school and all of a sudden, every window that we could see had a banging sound coming from it. This was enough for us to run home and to not look back. In the paper press building, sometimes if I'm there in the morning, I'll hear an elevator moving, then the door opening, and then footsteps coming from upstairs coming down. Upstairs used to be a bowling alley, and I was there with my teacher catching up on work, and we both heard bowling ball bangs and rolling around. There's nothing up there now anymore, besides really nice floors. I think it's safe to say that my school is definitely haunted. On Saturday, I got a call from a few friends about going to the mall. It was a really stressful week at work, so I thought some retail therapy would definitely help. We shopped for the typical stuff like makeup, lingerie, and shoes before we decided on hitting the food hall for a spot of lunch. I gave the girls my order and told them I would come and find them as I needed to use the restroom. The restrooms at the end of a large and wide corridor were your typical mall type with lots of stalls. I sat down and I could see from the gap on the floor between the wall of the stall and the floor that there was a lot of movement going on and somebody's shadow. I wasn't sure if it was somebody getting changed or not, so I didn't pay a lot of attention at first. But there were times when it felt like the shadow was coming from above me at some points. You know, as if the light above were being obstructed by something. After maybe the third time, I decided to look up and see what I could see. What I saw was a phone and a part of a guy's arm leaning over. Someone was taking photos of me. I instantly shouted, what the fuck you pervert? And in a moment of sheer shock and disbelief, my rage turned to fear as I got up and leapt out of the stall and was greeted by an empty bathroom. Not a single person was in sight and from the quick glance of the mirrors opposite, there was only one stall shut, the one next to mine. I ran for the restroom exit, but it was locked. Luckily, it had a twist lock that I could turn, and as I did, I heard a stall open from behind me. I got out immediately and turned as I exited, and I noticed a sign on the door saying, closed for maintenance. That sign was not there when I went in, Somebody followed me into that restroom, put a maintenance sign up, and locked me in with them. I screamed some more, shouting to get everybody's attention, anyone's attention, as I ran down the corridor toward the food hall. Obviously, I did catch the attention of a few people. A group of three guys stopped me and could clearly see the panic in my eyes. They quizzed me, I explained, and two ran toward the ladies' room and one to find security. Security arrived within seconds. After a while, a rather large crowd had gathered due to the commotion, and although I was in the comfort of my friends, security, and now the police, I had never felt more alone. Neither security, the police, or any of the guys found anyone. There were a few staff-only and fire exit doors down the corridor, so plenty of escape routes for whoever this guy was to go through. I gave my statement down at the station later that day once my parents showed up. The police said that they had security tapes from the CCTV cameras that pointed down the corridor and would keep us updated with any news. Hopefully, 
they find him. I was reminded of this recently, but it happened over 10 years ago. I was living in my first apartment, alone. It was a third floor studio with vaulted ceilings in a huge complex that promoted itself as a community with socials planned and picnics and playgrounds amongst the buildings. Staff would drive around on golf carts waving hello. It felt like a safe place. So one day I called up maintenance because my AC wasn't working. A man comes up to look at it. He's short, but kind of wiry looking maybe in his late forties and leathery, like he's spent most of his life in the sun. He's in overalls, has a bushy mustache, all smiles. He's inside my apartment with a screwdriver looking at the AC, and we're just making chit-chat. All seems innocent enough, until he stands upright, says it's fixed, and takes a step toward me. He's looking at me in the eyes while he flips his screwdriver, suddenly not so friendly anymore. Then he says, you know what I think? I think you're pretty naive to be living in an apartment all by yourself. Here you've let a strange man into your apartment. You even let me close the door. Anything could happen. I could feel the smile melting off my face, but I tried not to let on that I was afraid. I kind of laughed and said, <laughs> yeah, that's what my boyfriend said when I told him I was calling you guys. He insisted he come over. He'll be here any second, and here you guys have already finished. <laughs> You'll probably run into him on the stairwell. After that, he left abruptly, and I locked the deadbolt after him. I'd lied about my boyfriend coming over, but immediately called him to make it almost the truth. At the time, I thought I was overreacting, and I didn't mention it to anybody. Looking back ten years later, I realized just how sinister what he was saying really was. This happened about nine or ten years ago, but it's something that I've never figured out, and maybe something I'll never figure out, but it has stuck with me all this time. Let me preface this by saying that I do get sleep paralysis. I've had more instances of sleep paralysis than I can count, but I'll say an average of four times a year for the past 30 years. Some years it's more often, some years it's less, but by the time this experience occurred, I was well versed enough to be able to identify when it was happening and to be able to pull myself out of it. Generally, when I get sleep paralysis, I can hear everything around me, but I can't move or make a noise. I've never seen the old hag, and only once have I seen the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He had red eyes when I saw him. And yes, he was pushing down my chest. Not cool. Not fun. I never want that to happen again, but I also knew that he wasn't real as it was happening. So about 1% of the time I've had a visual hallucination. Usually it's just that I can't move or speak, but I can hear everything around me, and somehow I can see the room even though my eyes are closed. But this? It doesn't fit the mold of sleep paralysis, at least not in any way I've ever experienced it. That's why it bothered me so much then and why it still bothers me now. My son was young at the time, five or six. My then husband, now ex, and I drove to visit my grandmother for Christmas. She lives about a hundred miles away from me. She has two extra bedrooms, but other family members scooped up the extra rooms before we could. So my husband and I rented a hotel room a few miles from her house. It was something like a Best Western or Holiday Inn. If I had to guess, I would say at the time it was less than 10 years old. We checked into our hotel room quickly, dropped off our stuff, and went straight to my grandmother's house. We had Christmas dinner with the family. I don't think I had any alcohol at all. If I did, it might have been one glass of wine. 
It was a long drive down to her house, two hours at least, and then an eventful evening, so we were beat. We left Grandma's house at about 9 p.m. and headed back to the hotel room. We drove around for an extra 20 minutes, trying to get our cranky son to sleep, which made me even more exhausted. The exhaustion is the thing that had me thinking maybe this was sleep paralysis, because that usually does trigger it for me. But again, what happened next is like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. The layout of the room is this. The hotel room door opened up to a little hallway and directly to the left was the bathroom with a tiny closet next to it. Moving just past the hallway, the wall on the left turned 90 degrees and the beds were to the left. To the right, you could follow the wall straight to the corner. There was a dresser along that wall, and in the corner was an armchair. From that corner, follow that wall, and there was a window facing the parking lot. In the next corner, there was another armchair, maybe three feet from the head of one of the queen beds. That was where my husband and I slept. My husband slept on the side near the armchair, and I slept on the inside, so I could be closer to our son in the other bed. My son fell asleep in the car. I tucked him in and very quickly got changed and got in bed. My husband got in bed only moments later and I shut the lights off. Before I fell asleep, I observed that the light from the parking lot peeked in over the top and around the sides of the window curtain. It was brighter than I would have imagined with the curtain drawn, but I was too exhausted for it to bother me. So I passed out pretty quickly. Sometime in the middle of the night, I hear the click of a door handle turning. It was the lever kind. I was alarmed, but my body was still heavy with sleep. I'm also facing the direction of the door. I watch as the orange light from the hotel hallway slides across the wall opposite of me and then slowly disappears as the door closes again, quietly. I felt like I was passing in and out of sleep so the sight of this almost had a strobing effect. A young man wearing medium blue baggy jeans and no shirt walked past the ends of our beds. At this point, I'm more alert, but I'm laying in bed trying to figure out if this is real or not. It was so vivid. But I also had this feeling that I was still passing in and out of consciousness. From the moment I heard the click of the door handle, I was scared out of my mind, but still so tired. I wanted to get up. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't tell what was holding me in bed, whether it was fear or exhaustion. At this point, the man is behind me. I can feel him looking at me, but I'm absolutely terrified to turn over. If I turn over, will it spook him? Will he attack my family? Right now, I can tell he's not moving, just looking. I finally feel alert enough and I realize my eyes are closed. What? But I can feel him in the room. I saw him even though I had no way to. It was the scariest thing I've ever done because I knew I might be facing an attacker in my hotel room, but I forced my eyes open and turned over. Nothing. There's no one in the room. My heart is racing. I mean, Jesus, that was so real. I look at my husband and he's fast asleep with his back turned to me, snoring gently. My son is asleep. Everything is how it was when I fell asleep. I'm still on my back, looking at the armchair in the corner at the end of the beds with the soft white light of the parking lot falling onto the chair as I calm down enough to fall back asleep. I can't tell you how much time passed, but it was dark. And then, all of a sudden, I see the armchair in the corner at the foot of the bed again. But this time, the man that had entered the room earlier was sitting in it. With the light shining from the window, I can see him a little bit better. It's a soft light, but I can tell his hair is buzzed short and it's a dark brown. He looks young, maybe 18 to 25. He's either white with a tan or perhaps Hispanic. I can't see his facial features too well, but he could be a model. 
I don't know celebrities well enough to be able to compare him to somebody, but he had strong cheekbones, sort of a perfect straight nose, and a strong jaw. Like I said, it was too dark to see the details, but this is what I gathered from his silhouette. He was just sitting there, calmly staring at me. He didn't feel threatening or menacing, but I was still scared out of my mind, because there's a guy in my room in the middle of the night staring at me. This time, the line between asleep and awake is even blurrier in my head. Am I asleep? Are my eyes even open? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. I can feel my husband asleep next to me, so I decide the best move is to try to discreetly wake him. He's still snoring with his back turned to me, but my hand is on the bed next to his back, so I decided to slowly move my hand closer and poke him. I poked him a few times, but he's passed out and not reacting at all. I was so pissed. I mean, he was dead to the world. Finally, I decided, F this. I'm not dealing with this alone anymore. So I turned toward my husband slightly, and I lift myself onto my elbow. This is where I'm sure I'm awake, but everything before that was blurry. I was about to grab his arm and shake the hell out of him when I noticed the man in the corner, in the chair, is no longer there. Now I feel crazy. I mean, what's going on? Where is this guy? Is he real or not? I was so tired, frustrated, confused, and scared. This man felt real. The details were so vivid. But as I'm trying to sift through what was real and what wasn't, I realize I can only see or feel this guy when I'm asleep. I pray to myself that this is the end of it, and I finally convinced myself that it was just my brain creating an elaborate lucid dream and that I was safe. I was convinced it should stop now, because it's just a stupid dream, and now that I know it, I have the power. I rolled toward my husband, facing his back. I closed my eyes and started to drift off to sleep. I swear it was only a few minutes later, and this time I couldn't see anything, but I felt the guy looking at me. This time, though, while sitting in the chair that's three feet away from my husband's head, not the other one. I opened my eyes. No one was there. For the rest of the night, I probably woke up every hour or so. Every time I fell asleep, I could feel this man's presence in the room. He never tried to hurt us. He just watched us. All night. When I finally saw daylight through the curtains, I got up and woke my husband up and I told him we had to leave. I tried not to alarm him or my son. I just got them up and dressed and said we were out. I think we were out of there by 7.30 in the morning. This whole thing had such a surreal quality to it, because with the exception of a few distinct moments, it was hard to tell when my eyes were open and when they were closed, when I was fully conscious, and when I was maybe semi-conscious. There were parts that I could write off as a dream if they weren't so damn vivid. And the whole night, this lingering feeling of being watched, even when I couldn't see him, was so unnerving. Every time I recount this incident to myself or someone else, I'm no closer to understanding what happened. But I refuse to go back to that hotel. I've always been able to see, hear, feel, and communicate with spirits, but this particular one, during my Christmas travels, specifically spooked me. It's rare that I see people while I'm driving, but this thing looked blue. I don't know, like he had a blue light to him, and it was a man that was approximately 5'10", and I'd say around 150 to 170 pounds. I saw him on the side of the road going southbound on I-95 in Brevard County, Florida. He had on these loose, very worn out Levi's and work boots. He was wearing a trucker cap and a loose t-shirt 
that I think may have been like a deep burnt sienna or a light brown. It was hard to tell because of that blue glow. He had brown hair and brown eyes and a brown goatee. Does anyone happen to know of anything that happened in the area with a man who matches this description? I just want to know who this is. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, and to be honest, I'm still very skeptical. But I'll share my experience anyway, because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip, and me, being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic, and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. That was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking that we were the only ones on this road and that we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was and that was unsettling to her. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms inside the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then, my mother heard what sounded like footsteps, and she saw what looked like an outline of a hat through the window. There was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us were together and terrified. 
We thought that this man was going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed that was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep and then were awakened by an owl hooting. My mom could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. The owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long too. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep. Every noise jarred us awake. It would be like, what's that? Did you hear that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of that hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out by this point, but we also weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were common. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning at that point. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but we left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A couple of days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man that we had seen was a mountain man who was a handyman who had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. Had we known this, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He was the one that had told the band director that we left a day early. We can laugh about it now. It was a memorable night. That owl still freaks me out, though. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun, until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered from my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone, as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, Something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, 
I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with my butt now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point, and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, Son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point, and I ask him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share. When I was six or seven, we moved out to a ranch in the countryside of Laredo, Texas. Not a lot of people with good income lived out here. Most houses were isolated and surrounded by woods. My mom and stepdad decided to rent this house because the rent was cheap, only $350 a month. No indoor plumbing or central air. A lot of low-income families lived out there. There was a family that lived next to us a family of six kids, all girls, and two adults. They were also low income and often didn't have much to eat. My mom would often help them out with food. In return, the kids would come over and help my mom clean the house. This one day, they came over and ate dinner with us, helped my mom clean, and the youngest girl and I that was about my age fell asleep on my bed. After a while, my mom woke us up because it was getting late and she needed her to go home. Her sisters had left her behind because they didn't want to wake her. It was a good walk to her home as there was a dirt road leading to our house to get to hers. My mom was going to send my brother to walk with her, but I butted in and said, can't I walk her? We're friends. My mom said yes, so I walked her to the gate. We departed and I started on my way home. Out of nowhere, she comes running behind me, crying, and throws herself at me and pulls me down by the shoulders. I asked her what was wrong, what had happened. She points up and says, look, look up there. She was pointing up at the top of some abandoned train cars. And to this day, I can't explain what we saw. There were three skeletons walking back and forth. 
I was like, what the heck? One was laying on its side and it had clothes on too, like a tank top and shorts. The other two were standing up, just walking back and forth behind that one, stopping and waving high. We looked at each other and ran to my house. I quickly told my mom what we saw. My mom and two brothers plus us went back to look and they were still there, just waving high at us. We threw rocks at them, but it didn't even phase them. It just went through them. Either that or we were bad at aiming. After a while, we went home and never saw them again. Till this day, I can't seem to understand or be able to explain how those skeletons were moving. Some will probably say that we were hallucinating, but how can five people see the same thing? Some have said it was Halloween props, but it was the 90s and I'd never seen any Halloween props that moved that well during that time. The technology just wasn't there. Plus, Halloween props like that would have cost a lot of money, and that family couldn't even afford to eat. We were in a dirt poor area of the country. There's no way anybody had animatronic skeletons. When I was pregnant, my kid's father and I stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the mid 1800s, which to me was super interesting. Until my kid's father, let's call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy for the middle of the day. And when I looked, he was right. It gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room at night and could see through the kitchen, and it was as if the stairs became a dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they believed in ghosts, and the husband was an abusive drunk, so they had a lot of problems going on. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly were having some serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because the shadows scared him. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times, I saw genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye. Even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long spindly legs would run around, but whenever you would look at them straight on, they would disappear. A few times I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye. I would go to look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person and sometimes nothing being there. But other times, you expect it to disappear, but that time it would in fact be a person standing there. It was so weird. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room, you'd want to look over your shoulder into the doorway, as if somebody was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out, considering I slept right near the doorway, and often would get a feeling of somebody coming toward me. One day, Brian and I were the only two in the entire house. Facing one another about two feet away, face to face, talking loudly as we usually do, we hear directly in the middle of us a woman's voice say, Shh. I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and asked, No, didn't you? Then we laughed it off because clearly we were talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. They told us they assumed the black voids that ran on the floors were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved as though they were being pushed aside, but he had chalked it up to just being tired. There was no breeze. 
The wife told me that when they first moved in there, her son would see a man in a hat, but she had always assumed that it was just his imagination. I mean, how could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? I'll never get it. The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everybody, as it was right where it felt like somebody was walking by the door frame. It felt like the person was coming right at you into the living room. One night, I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in and, to my horror, all three dogs were in the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house, and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations I had with one of the roommates renting a back bedroom was about Brian and I hearing that shh. She explained that she hears the exact same thing in the hallway if she and her son are getting a little loud. She was just sure it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway, but I'm not so sure. We bought a house intending to use it as our second home, but after just a few months, we decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Long story short, we're pretty sure it's haunted. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are both aware of the claims and have made an informed decision to purchase it anyway. They probably think I'm nuts. The home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. We've gotten an air quality test done in the home, and both my husband and I have both received physical examinations. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We bought our winter home last year. Originally, we're from Canada, but we've spent the majority of the last couple of years between the United States and, more recently, Costa Rica. My first experience there was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom, when you enter the room, if you go to the left, you'll go toward the bathroom. If you go to the right, you'll end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon, while I was showering, I watched my husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. That's when I saw my husband enter the room again with the same glass of lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked him if he had re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said no. He'd only ever come into the bedroom once, and that he'd been there the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed that he saw me leave the kitchen and walk toward the mudroom. He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty. I had been out for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car scraping on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block, and every time he parks the car, you can hear this distinct dragging sound of metal on the driveway. Whenever I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard this sound, unlocked the door, and he isn't home. We've both heard whistling sounds that we can't explain, that stop once we acknowledge it. I guess it could just be the vents, but for the last three weeks, our thermostat hasn't been working, and we still hear it. There have been other trivial occurrences. Once I woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. We also have one of those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those keep going off on their own too and opening up. I understand that with modern upgrades, there are going to be some malfunctions. So I put those experiences under the questionable category, but there have still been quite a lot of them. We've spent the past week packing our things. 
We're one of those people that just don't store anything in the garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that we have in there is the water softener tank, and that's it. So one night, the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police, and of course, the neighborhood security also comes by, just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of that house three days before closing. We couldn't bear another day there. The neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I told her that I had no idea what she was talking about because we don't even live there. I know this sounds insane, but we have lived in so many houses and we've never experienced anything like this. Even though our house was built in 2019, it was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that was built somewhere in the 60s, I think. So who knows what we might have inherited from that. This happened sometime near the end of seventh grade. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were all visiting our grandparents' house in Washington State. They lived in a pretty remote area with only a handful of other houses around and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind that it's also kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures out there. My aunt and I went out while it was still dark outside, just walking the path in the forest and trying to figure out what was making this loud sound. It wasn't necessarily a weird one. It sounded like a normal forest noise. I said frogs, she said crickets. I was right. Anyway, we pass this pond area and we make our way to a clearing. I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but the clearing was a bit small with an apple tree in the middle. That's where my brother and cousin and I would hang out whenever we were outside. Whenever we reached the clearing, I immediately started to get a bad feeling. I figured, you know, it's dark. I'm typically terrified of the dark and I'm tired. It's just me. Nothing is really going to happen. The path was a bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn back. Right before we did though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in one of the trees, just staring at us. Now I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in the forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It just like gave me this weird vibe. My aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind, the path was pretty short and it only takes about 10 minutes or so to get to the clearing and a 10 minute walk back. But when we got closer to the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back to the house to see what's wrong. And she says, we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been out for at most a half an hour. And when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us that they had been out searching for us, worried sick. We check the time and they were right. Another interesting thing that could be connected, a few days before that, we had heard some really weird noises coming from the woods when we were out making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who have lived there longer than I've been alive, admitted that it was unlike anything they had ever heard before. It kept getting closer and closer and stopped any time somebody tried to get a video of it or capture it on recording. Eventually, I had to go inside because it was freaking me out so badly. I'm sure that everything in this story could be explained, but the time loss thing still gets to me. So I'm a skeptic and I don't really believe in anything supernatural, but today I had a weird experience I can't explain. I have a galley style kitchen, 
I was washing dishes and my phone was on the counter behind me. I was listening to some Mr. Revenant stories. I turned around from the sink to grab another container to wash and noticed that my phone had gone from the video to the comments section of the video. I looked closer and noticed that it was queued up to reply to a comment. A message was already written in, but hadn't been sent. It said, I am in danger, all lowercase. My phone automatically autocorrects I'm lowercase to I'm with an uppercase. So I was really confused. It's possible, maybe, that a water droplet from my dish gloves flung onto the phone when I reached it, but I don't think it could type a whole message. After I checked on my husband, I called my mom and texted my brother. Everyone was fine. About a half hour later, when I went back to the kitchen, I was momentarily overcome with nausea and felt sweaty, but it passed after a few minutes. I have no idea what that was. I didn't feel like I was the one in danger. Maybe just a strange, unexplainable glitch and the nausea was unrelated? Or it was a message from someone, but I can't think of who it would be. I scanned my phone for viruses and malware and I didn't find any. I don't know anyone personally who would want to hack my phone. I'm basically a hermit. I have agoraphobia and I work out of my house. I haven't received any weird texts and I don't have any apps that I didn't download myself. It's still possible, I guess, but it doesn't look like my phone was hacked and I don't have any other explanation. I'm a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district, including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts, and I've had a handful of experiences, but I've never experienced anything at that building before until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor, from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m. and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing, with the light shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open. And I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m. and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night, just in case I need to go back into a room. 
I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened, and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two, and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December, and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open, and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finish the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed, especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times. Not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door. No knobs or levers to turn. But the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own, about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in, when suddenly, the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped, and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room, certain that nobody's actually in there, but just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. I must have spent 10 minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut, and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, 
which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff, talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights. It's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come, so I did just that. I turned to look, and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure, shaped like a person, walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again. But I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building. But I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late, and there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall around the corner and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul, no people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, but unfortunately, I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights, other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes. But who really knows for sure if those are spirits? They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before. But she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bull. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts. But up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted. And maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here. So I dated somebody who owned a cadaver dog. Basically, they can find dead bodies. It was a new term to me when I met them. Anyway, they explained that they worked with rescue teams. We live in wilderness country. The dog's job was to sniff out bodies for people who might have gotten lost and died, who were buried under avalanches, things like that. After five months of dating, my now ex asked if I could house and dog sit. 
was more than happy to. Great dog. I would be dog-sitting for two weeks while they visited family. I was warned that it has happened on hikes before that the dog might pick up the scent of a corpse, and the person that I was with at the time gave me the steps I should follow if that happens. The first couple of days were pretty uneventful. Then one day the dog is dragging me down this trail, and I'm panicking, because I'm like, man, am I going to see a dead body? But the dog stops at this very stern woman, just sauntering along. He keeps looking back and forth between me and the woman. She gives me a quick, your dog isn't well trained, and keeps going. I had to drag him away. It happens with the same woman a few more times, so I call the owner to bring it up. I describe the woman, and my ex is shocked and confused. Fast forward to my last night dog sitting. I was going to bed and had this horrific nightmare of being held down in bed by the woman. I hear a bark, and I wake up. The dog is standing next to me on the bed, in its alert position, staring at the bed. I didn't get any sleep that night, and I never got an answer. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get, and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, 
hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, you can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. I was about 14 at this time, staying the night at my friend's house. My friend had only lived here for about two years or so, and had experienced many paranormal things in some of his previous homes. His family moved a lot. He never really mentioned anything out of the ordinary at this house, though. Anyway, my friend went to bed, but I stayed up playing his PS3. The volume was very low because I didn't want to wake him. His room was upstairs and you had to walk through a room and open a door to get to his bedroom. The house was old and had wooden floors, so you could hear every step if it was a silent house. At about 2 a.m. or so, I had to go to the bathroom. His bathroom was downstairs, so I went down and used it. I passed his parents' room and noticed that they were both fast asleep. I finished and went back upstairs to my game. About an hour or so later, I heard the steps start creaking, as if somebody was coming upstairs. But I never heard anybody walk to the steps from downstairs. The creaking continued, step by step, until it reached the top. Then I heard footsteps walk through the adjacent room and stop at my friend's bedroom door. I froze, scared out of my mind, because I knew everybody was asleep. And that was it. No more footsteps after that. A few minutes passed and nothing. The footsteps never walked away from the door. I obviously couldn't get to bed for a while. But eventually I did. I told my friend about it the next morning, and we asked his parents if they walked upstairs during the night. They said neither of them had even gotten out of bed the entire night. I'm thinking whatever is haunting his previous homes has followed them there, and I was unfortunately there to experience it that night. Nothing too eventful, perhaps, but in the moment it was terrifying and that experience still creeps me out to this day. My uncle was such a sweet guy that for my 18th birthday, he gifted me with a creepy but adorable porcelain clown sitting on a swing. It had two red dots on the cheeks, a red nose, a frilly costume, and white gloves. It had a pointed hat and brown curly hair. What he didn't know was that I had an extreme fear of clowns, and I still do. I accepted it anyway, because it was such a sweet gift. I hung it up on my curtain rod, kind of proud that he had even thought of me at all, 
because it was rare that he gave me presents. The first week was fine, but after that, weird things began to happen. I started to grow creeped out by this doll to the point where I wouldn't even get dressed in my own room. There were a few times where it would swing on its own. I never opened my window, so I know that it wasn't the wind, and it wouldn't have been able to swing without some sort of force. Several times I would walk out of the room and come back in to find that the head had twisted to look outside my door. For a long time, I thought it was my family members playing a joke on me because they knew that I didn't like clowns, so I just grinned and put up with it. I also locked my door from the inside with one of those bolt locks, just in case. I did this for a couple of months. One morning, it was taken too far, and it was the last straw for me. I woke up and hit something with my hand. I turned my head to come face to face with the clown doll. I looked at the curtain rod, but it definitely was not there. The only way it could have been brought down was if you lifted the rod and took the doll off by the swing ring. I know for a fact that my family didn't do it, because my bedroom door was still bolted shut. I had had enough, and I took the doll and threw it in the big bin and then put it on the verge for the bin man to come that day. I told my uncle that I had accidentally broken it when I was putting it away to paint my room. I actually regret doing that. I kind of wish I had kept it. I was creeped out by stuff like that when I was younger, but now I love haunted stuff and creepy things. I kind of wish I had it hanging in my house.